consumer and monetary affairs. Members of that panel, which is chaired by Georgia Congressman Doug Barnard, met Tuesday on their year-long investigation into allegations of employee integrity problems at the Internal Revenue Service. Witnesses at this session included two investigators employed by the subcommittee. The appointed time having arrived, the uh, subcommittee will come to order. Uh, while we are waiting um, on the uh, senior minority member of the committee to, to come, uh, I might want to state, uh, you know, the best laid plans always go askew. This, this hearing has been scheduled for many, many, many weeks, and lo and behold, it comes on the day that we are considering the, uh, the Armed Services Appropriation, Department of Defense Appropriation Bill. They've got volumes of amendments today, and these votes are going to come every 10 to 15 or 20 minutes, so what we are having to do is to probably uh, rotate the chair and we will do that so that we will not, uh, so that we'll keep the hearings going because of the uh, lengthy testimony. Uh, so uh, we, I just wanted to make that announcement uh, ahead of time. <coughs> While we are waiting on uh, Mr. Hastert, uh, uh, Mr. Coulter has a opening statement and uh, Mr. Coulter, I will, uh, I will uh, recognize you at this time for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we meet uh, as a subcommittee of government operations to study the activities of designated federal entities and, the, and to review the economy and the efficiency of these agencies. Our purpose is to judge exclusively whether these agencies are operating according to specific guidelines and statutes. The basic philosophy of this nation is the concept of creation of government by the people for the people. Those who serve in positions of the federal government are vehicles in which to achieve the goals of the whole. These individuals make a commitment to serve in the best interest of the public. Those who serve in leadership positions of federal agencies have a high degree of unquestioned responsibility to act for the good of the agency and more importantly for the nation. Human character is a very interesting and diverse thing. Unfortunately, too often one's self-interest can cloud and distort the goals and the good intentions of the group. Those of us who hold management roles can easily influence the overall conduct and operation of the organization. If these individuals allow their self-interest to dictate their actions, turmoil and corruption is a high possibility at every level. Mr. Chairman, it's my sincere hope that the testimony and evidence presented today will aid in forming recommendations and solutions in which to halt and deter immediately any future situation of misconduct within the senior ranks of the Internal Revenue Service as well as all other federal agencies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the uh, Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs Subcommittee begins three days of oversight hearings into IRS employee integrity issues and the service's ability to detect, investigate, and discipline misconduct by senior managers. Our year-long probe has examined the nature and extent of IRS employee integrity problems, the record of the IRS and disciplining senior management employees who engage in improper conduct, the adequacy of IRS national office efforts to audit employee integrity functions and manage employee integrity programs. Four, the ability of IRS Inspection Office to aggressively investigate allegations of wrongdoing against mid-level and senior management employees, the climate within IRS for encouraging the reporting of incidents of misconduct by senior management, managers, and whether appropriate checks and balances exist with respect to IRS criminal investigation activities. Under the rules of the House of Representatives and the Committee on Government Operations, Internal Revenue Service oversight has been specifically assigned to the Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs Subcommittee. During my tenure as chairman, we have conducted more than two dozen investigations and hearings into the services administration of our tax laws. Our oversight has been thorough and constructive. This subcommittee strongly supports the vital mission of the Internal Revenue Service and recognizes the inherent difficulty 
of administering a complex tax system for 230 million Americans. In recognition of the importance of the functions assigned to IRS, Congress has granted vast powers to the agency. The Internal Revenue Service has a greater impact by far on the day-to-day -day lives of our citizens than does any other federal agency. It is for this reason that, the, that those vast powers must be exercised with great care and within a system organizationally structured to prevent employee wrongdoing and to assure the IRS's national office can exercise effective control over its 63 district offices, seven regional offices, and 10 service centers. Our investigation indicates that there are serious employee integrity problems among senior managers at the, RA, at the IRS. There is inadequate internal investigation and punishment of senior level misconduct. There is a pervasive fear at all levels of IRS over retaliation for the reporting of such misconduct and a driving concern that publicly exposed wrongdoing by senior managers will tarnish the agency's public image and make its tax enforcement responsibilities more difficult. We strongly believe that these hearings will be a positive force within the IRS for reform, for reform of public integrity policies, practices, procedures, and organizational structure. Although our investigation has developed pervasive evidence of senior level misconduct problems at the service, we want to emphasize our conviction that the overwhelming majority of all IRS employees are hardworking, conscientious, and honest. We're anxious to hear from all of our witnesses and, and from the IRS itself on the issues that we will be considering this week and very likely in weeks to come. I, uh, I will now recognize Mr. Hassett for any opening statement he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you and certainly the subcommittee staff and the general accounting office <coughs> investigators for the tremendous effort which has gone into uh, the preparing for these hearings. For 18 months, the subcommittee has compiled information and heard testimony relating to alleged IRS employee misconduct at the top levels of the agency. The investigation was accomplished in a bipartisan manner with complete cooperation between the majority and the minority. The Internal Revenue Service is an enormously powerful agency of the federal government. In achieving its responsibilities, it must often become intimately involved in our personal financial lives. Some people would compare receiving mail to, uh, from the IRS to getting stopped by the police, getting a ticket. Even if you have, uh, haven't done anything wrong, it scares you to death to get that little brown envelope. Accordingly, image and integrity are all important to the IRS. And when dealing with a public which has little natural affection for it, earning the respect of the taxpayer is critically important. This is precisely why the re revelations of the IRS senior employee misconduct, which you will hear during the course of our hearings this week, are so distressing. While no agency is beyond ethical reproach, the IRS must hold itself to the highest standards of integrity if it is to be capable of fulfilling its obligation and maintaining respect to the American taxpayer. We cannot say with certainly certainty how <coughs> pervasive employee integrity abuses have become at the IRS. However, the eight cases which the subcommittee focused on during its investigation illustrate that the scope of the abuses are not limited to the office in, <coughs> in one geographical area. Perhaps more importantly, the abuses uncovered involve IRS senior management, those very individuals responsible for setting the standards for ethical behavior within the agency. In my mind, the most troubling information to come from the subcommittee investigation concerns the IRS Internal Investigation Division. The Internal Investigation Division functions as the IRS's own policeman for employee misconduct. The subcommittee found numerous examples of complete or ineffective internal investigations. This failure to respond or adequately respond to reports of wrongdoing among IRS employees raises questions as to the ability of the IRS to effectively police itself. <clears throat> I'm hopeful that the evidence of wrongdoing and misconduct compiled by the subcommittee and its GAO investigators will be the first step 
and addressing larger questions concerning the institutional function of the IRS and the problems existing in its current operation. Just last week, the IRS had a new commissioner sworn in to begin uh, a tenure over what is frequently thought to be our most powerful federal agency. Commissioner uh, Goldberg has indicated his intention to review IRS operations from top to bottom and to make those changes necessary to ensure confidence and respect by the American public. I welcome this willingness to tackle the tough problems, and uh, Commissioner Col Goldberg undoubtedly understands that Congress stands ready to assist in this process. Again, Mr. Chairman, I salute you and uh, to bring this before this committee and the Congress, and uh, we're willing to go to work here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Martinez, do you have an opening statement? Mr. No, I have no opening statement this time. Mr. Douglas, you have an opening statement? I just wanted to echo Dennis's comments and uh, commend you, Mr. Chairman, as well as the staff, because this is going to be quite a tale that will unfold in the next three days, and it took a lot of uh, perseverance, and it's unfortunate that we're going to find uh, at the highest levels of our Internal Revenue Service some very uh, un at uh, management problems as well as some threats against whistleblowers and I believe that uh, you need to be commended as well as the staff for a job that I know will be well done by the time we're through. Thank you very much. Our first witnesses this morning are the Commerce, Consumer and Monetary Affairs Subcommittee investigators who conducted our probe. Their, their testimony is lengthy but important and we will hear their report in detail. But before we do that, I have an important supplemental statement to make. Before they hear the subcommittee investigators, I am obliged to report on a very important development pertaining to our examination of IRS criminal tax fraud investigation of the Jordache Enterprises and its owners. One of the major cases of misconduct that we have been investigating involves the IRS former criminal investigator chief in Los Angeles and the circumstances surrounding his role in the initiation of the Jordache tax matter. As part of our effort to determine whether the former CID chief was improperly induced to initiate a tax fraud investigation of Jordache Incorporated and its owners, the subcommittee sought, pursuant to a Jordache tax disclosure authorization, that is a waiver of 6103, all of the IRS's administrative and investigative files on this matter which we were legitimately able to have. The subcommittee was attempting to analyze the files on the information provided the services by the informants in the case that caused the IRS to initiate the tax fraud investigation in the first place. We also wish to examine the quality of the information IRS developed during the sub subsequent six to seven months that led to the grand jury probe in the Southern District of New York and the search warrant seizure of three million documents from the Jordache offices in New York and New Jersey. Based on interviews with persons knowledgeable about the types and quantities of the documents furnished by the Marcianos to the IRS, we knew that the material were voluminous, constituting two large size packing cartons initially, and supplemented later by more, many more documents. In addition to those informant source documents, we were told by IRS witnesses that IRS special agents in Los Angeles and the New York developed other significant materials relevant to the allegations of Jordache tax fraud, including notes of meetings, work papers, invoices, analysis, and so forth. On June the 20th, 1989, this year, I was notified that the Justice Department was attempting to facilitate our subcommittee access to those documents, but that IRS was being vague concerning their whereabouts. The next day on June the 21st, the Justice Department advised me that the documents being sought by the subcommittee, and which I want to emphasize was legitimately, uh, 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 we had legitimate access to, that these documents could not be located by the IRS office. Later that day, the subcommittee was notified by the Justice Department that all of the documents being sought by the subcommittee had been destroyed by the IRS criminal investigator who had been assigned to the Jordache tax fraud matter early in its development 
and thereafter as an agent of the grand jury on the case in the Southern District of New York. This document, destruction information, was confirmed later in the day on June the 21st in a letter from the IRS. That letter also reported that according to the IRS special agent involved, he had, number one, failed to notify the U.S. Attorney's Office that he was destroying the documents, and two, turned over to the U.S. Attorney's Office some Jordache-related documents but could not identify which ones. I immediately notified our ranking Republican, Mr. Hastert, of these developments. Because the destroyed documents were a crucial component of the subcommittee's IRS misconduct probe, Mr. Hassard and I sent a letter to the Justice Department several days later requesting an immediate Justice Department investigation of the destroyed uh, documents. Now, we have been advised that the Department of Justice's public integrity section is reviewing these, the destruction matter, quote, to determine if a criminal investigation is warranted. Mr. Hassard and I, and I'm sure members of the committee, do believe that it is warranted, and we this morning urge the public integrity section of the Department of Justice to undertake this investigation immediately. <coughs> We're pleased this morning to have with us the chairman of the Government Operations Committee, uh, the Honorable John Conyers, and uh, John, we're pleased that you have been with us this morning, and if you have an opening statement, we would be, be pleased to receive it at this time. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to identify strongly with the way that uh, you and the subcommittee have undertaken uh, the investigations that's leading to the hearing this morning. Uh, there have been a number of problems around the IRS. Uh, I've had the problem of, uh, of a number of people coming to myself and uh, the junior senator from Michigan, uh, Mr. Levin, uh, urging us to inquire as to why some of the enforcement procedures were so hard, especially upon uh, smaller delinquent taxpayers. I, I mean, uh, an example comes to mind, uh, a dentist a uh, young fellow I had uh, attended school with uh, was trying to pay back his uh, acknowledged uh, tax indebtedness. Uh, they padlocked his dental office. That's a great way to get paid back. Uh, and we've had this, this kind of activity. As a matter of fact, Senator Levin held hearings on this a couple years ago across the years. And uh, I, I'm hoping that you may consider expanding the scope of your inquiry uh, as soon as I bring some, um, some information to your attention. Uh, for more than a year, this subcommittee has been examining employee integrity issues at IRS. And uh, uh, I think in recognition of the importance of these hearings, uh, the uh, full committee indicate its unwavering support in identifying <coughs> wrongdoing uh, by IRS senior managers and uh, any other kinds of uh, uh, problems uh, uh, connected with uh, the hearing. You're touching on a sensitive nerve with the American citizens, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, uh, the, the one thing that makes this country great is that we've determined voluntarily that we will pay into the government according to our means and the one, the one agency in the government that has to stand tall is the one that takes the bread, collects the bucks. Uh, and for us to have to come here today, uh, to me, represents a, a serious compromise in, in that area. And I commend you. I congratulate you. Uh, I know that your knowledge on this subject, not only from government operations, but from the banking committee of which you are a senior member, will help us all get to the bottom of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bustamante, do you have an opening statement, sir? Chairman, I have an opening statement. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, within the ranks of the federal government, the Internal Revenue Service has been regarded as a model of professionalism and efficiency. In recent years, however, this subcommittee has questioned the quality of IRS taxpayer assistance program 
and its competency in handling taxpayers' requests for accurate tax information. But today's hearing goes beyond questioning the Internal Revenue Service record of quality and competency. Indeed, we begin an investigation which questions the very credibility and integrity of senior level management within the IRS. Our tax system is based on a system of voluntary compliance. That system is built on an implicit understanding between taxpayer and tax collector that collections and penalties are levied in an impartial and just manner. After a year-long investigation, we're beginning to get another picture of the Internal Revenue Service. Instead of devoting its time to auditing the deductibility of three martini lunches, we find that key IRS enforcement agents are dining with the very clients they should be auditing. Sixteen years ago, during the Watergate affair, we learned that the professionalism of the IRS was compromised by, was compromised by an imperial presidency in Congress. In the aftermath, enacted safeguards that protect the taxpayers from the authorized disclosure of taxpayer information. It is ironic that the very reforms Congress enacted were used by the IRS to impede the investigation of this subcommittee. Today we find the IRS mired in its own form of Watergate, which like its predecessor involves greed, seduction, cover-up, the victimization of innocent citizens by intimidation and retaliation, obstruction of justice and criminal activity. Before we can hope to restore professionalism within the Internal Revenue Service, it is first necessary to restore its credibility with the American taxpayer. For that to occur, Mr. Chairman, the working culture, environment, and attitudes of top management of the IRS must completely change. If we fail to affect that change, it will be extremely difficult for this government to reestablish its faith with the average taxpayer citizens. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cox, do you have an opening statement? I'd just like to add that uh, I think it's propitious that we have a new commissioner of IRS Fred Goldberg, formerly chief counsel. I know that as a result of his meetings with this subcommittee and with me personally that he is most interested in assisting in our investigation and I'm looking forward to the proceedings of this subcommittee uh, not only to <coughs> assist in resolving the particular problems that are to be presented to us today but also uh, dealing with any systemic difficulties there might be throughout IRS. Thank you for that statement. Our first witnesses this morning um, will be Mr. Leonard Bernard. Please note that it's spelled with a B-E and not a B-A. And Mr. Richard Stanna. These gentlemen are investigators of our subcommittee, uh, and they have been the principal agents in charge of this investigation. Accompanying uh, Mr. Bernard and Mr. Stanna is Mr. Norton, St. Hansky, and Mrs. Murray. And we welcome you to the uh, panel this morning. And we will hear from first from Mr. Bernard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hastert, members of the subcommittee. Um, what I'd like to do is, is introduce the members here at the table with me, my colleagues. Speak a little, and, little bit and, directly and, in your microphone. And explain, and explain what, what we've done. My name is Len Bernard, and to my left is Rich Stanner. We are subcommittee investigators. And over the last year, we've spent our full time and effort uh, looking into the matters that you brought to our attention. To my right is Leo Norton, and to my far left is uh, Robin Stewart Murray and Tom Sahansky. They are special agents who are assigned to the subcommittee on a part-time basis to assist us on some of the specific cases that we looked at. What we're going to do, Mr. Stan and I, we're going to provide some affirmative testimony over the next hour or so. Mr. Bernard, let me uh, again ask you to speak into the microphone. As it's Mr. Stan and I will provide affirmative testimony over the next two hours, uh, after which all five of us will be happy to answer any questions that you or the other members have. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Stan. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, in the spring of last year, the staff of the Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs Subcommittee was directed to initiate a preliminary investigation into reports received by the subcommittee of widespread misconduct by senior managers of the Internal Revenue Service and charges that upper-level IRS employees guilty of wrongdoing frequently escaped punishment or sanction. Based on the results of that preliminary inquiry, the staff was authorized to continue and expand the investigation. We examined, one, the nature and extent of IRS employee integrity problems, two, 
the record of the IRS in disciplining senior management employees who engage in improper conduct. Three, the adequacy of IRS efforts to audit employee integrity functions and manage employee integrity programs. Four, the ability of IRS's inspection office to aggressively investigate allegations of wrongdoing against mid-level and senior management employees. Five, the climate within IRS for encouraging and reporting of incidents of misconduct by senior managers. And six, whether appropriate checks and balances exist within IRS with respect to its criminal investigation activities. Our year-long probe focused on eight specific incidents of misconduct by senior IRS officials and the adequacy of IRS's response. These eight cases involved the conduct of more than 25 senior management officials from 10 different locations, including Los Angeles, Cleveland, Chicago, New York, Atlanta, Dallas, Cincinnati, and Washington, D.C., encompassing all seven IRS regions. In conducting our investigation, we held over 200 interviews with approximately 130 individuals, both inside and outside of the IRS, and we examined over 25,000 internal IRS and non-governmental documents. Mr. Chairman, before we discuss our investigative findings, we believe it is important to acknowledge, as you have in your opening statement, that the vast majority of IRS employees, including senior managers, are hardworking, conscientious individuals who fully understand the importance of maintaining high ethical standards. Unfortunately, the cases we have examined and the information provided by many current and former IRS employees who have reported problems to us strongly indicate that there has been a significant erosion of ethical standards among many at the highest levels of the service. Based on the sample of cases and issues we have examined, together with the additional incidents of misconduct that have been credibly reported to us, during the course of our probe, we have reached the following conclusions. First, there has been a serious failure on the part of IRS's national office to effectively manage employee integrity programs. Our investigation revealed, for example, that on a number of occasions, IRS national office officials at the highest levels ignored instances of wrongdoing by senior managers in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere or approved inspection plans to investigate serious allegations of misconduct that were likely to lead to inadequate internal IRS probes. Additionally, IRS's computer system for tracking employee integrity problems, known as ISMIS, which is utilized by the National Office for Management Purposes, is riddled with erroneous data and has little value. <coughs> we have also concluded that while IRS systematically audits the effectiveness and adequacy of its examination, collection, and taxpayer service functions, the service's internal auditing of its employee integrity programs is practically non-existent. Second, while we are, able to, we are unable to quantify the extent of wrongdoing by senior managers of the service, our work revealed that significant numbers of integrity problems exist among officials at this level. During the course of our investigation of the eight wrongdoing cases, the subcommittee received about 200 letters and phone calls many from current and former IRS employees reporting additional instances of misconduct and abuse of power by senior IRS officials. Our evaluation of these reports, although limited, indicate that the, the probable existence of another 25 serious cases of misconduct without adequate IRS follow-up. Later in our testimony, we will provide several examples of these additional misconduct cases. Third, Wrongdoing by IRS senior managers is too often ignored entirely or ineptly investigated, resulting in a clearance for the wrongdoers. When IRS testifies on Thursday, its representatives will undoubtedly describe instances when IRS senior managers have been sanctioned for their improper conduct. However, of the eight specific cases of senior official wrongdoing we examined, only one of the many individuals involved was administratively punished and that person only after the case was ignored by the regional inspector for more than a year, and none have been criminally prosecuted. This pattern also exists in the overwhelming majority of additional cases credibly reported to us. Fourth, a pervasive fear exists among IRS employees that reporting the misconduct of their superiors or cooperating in an investigation of those superiors will result in retaliation against them. As a consequence, misconduct often goes unreported or is reported anonymously outside of official channels. In the cases investigated by the subcommittee and in many of the seemingly reliable reports of senior level misconduct communicated by others, 
instances of retaliation against those reporting wrongdoing outnumber by far the instances of punishment of the wrongdoer. Fifth, a mindset exists within IRS that seeks to pre preserve the agency's public image, thereby discouraging the investigation and disclosure of senior management wrongdoing that might tarnish that image. Accordingly, misconduct is often not investigated aggressively unless the matter gets outside the control of the service. On many occasions during the course of our investigation, senior IRS officials in Washington and elsewhere characterize those who report misconduct as dissidents and malcontents, rather than considering the merits of the allegations they bring. Sixth, based on the cases we studied, there are inadequate checks and balances on IRS criminal investigative activities. For example, in the Los Angeles IRS District Office during the mid and late, late 1980s, the questionable conduct of the CID chief and several of his subordinates went virtually unchecked over many years by the district director, by the Western Regional Commissioner, and by IRS's national office in Washington, D.C. We want to emphasize that our investigation covered only a small fraction of CID activities. However, the abuses we found underscore the lack of intensive management review and internal auditing of CID programs and operations. And seventh, when IRS refuses to take aggressive disciplinary action against the misconduct of a senior official when first uncovered, that refusal often leads to subsequent misconduct by the same individual, but of a more serious nature. In many of the cases we examined, including situations in Los Angeles, Chicago, and at national headquarters, punishment of wrongdoing upon first discovery would have prevented subsequent harm by that individual to IRS, to taxpayers, and often to the IRS official himself. Before we discuss the details of the specific cases we investigated that gave rise to these findings, we would like to report to the subcommittee on some difficulties we encountered in our investigation, difficulties that are relevant to future efforts of the Government Operations Committee to efficiently conduct oversight of IRS, particularly as to employee integrity issues. The solution to these difficulties may well require a statutory change in Section 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code. This is the code section that protects the confidentiality of taxpayers' tax returns and tax return information, except under very narrow and carefully defined circumstances. Section 6103 does not grant to the Government Operations Committee or to any other committees of Congress, save the tax writing committees, automatic access to tax return information. Without such access, investigator investigations of the type we have conducted are made extremely difficult. Although everyone strongly supports the need for carefully safeguarding the confidentiality of tax information, the impact of Section 6103, particularly as utilized by the IRS, has been to shield the service from efficient Government Operations Committee oversight, a consequence we believe Congress never intended. Not having blanket access to tax information has hindered and delayed our investigation and has caused IRS disclosure staff to spend hundreds of hours redacting 60, Section 6103 protected information from documents we requested. We were able to obtain the information we needed for our investigation by obtaining Section 6103 waivers from several key taxpayers whose cases we were examining and through plain hard work. However, a subcommittee charged by House rules with IRS oversight responsibility should not be denied access to the records it needs to do its work. This matter needs to be addressed by the full Government Operations Committee at the conclusion of these hearings. An issue of equal concern, Mr. Chairman, is the manner in which IRS has responded to our investigation. IRS has provided subcommittee investigators with thousands of pages of documents and made available dozens of IRS employees for interviews. We regret to say, however, that in many ways, IRS has not been cooperative with our probe. Some examples follow. IRS disclosure attorneys, who sat in on many of our interviews of present and former IRS employees because of Section 6103 tax information confidentiality requirements, have used an excessively broad definition of that provision in advising witnesses what could not be disclosed to subcommittee staff. For example, disclosure attorneys refused to provide internal IRS documents and advised IRS employees not to answer questions, not because the information to be provided was itself protected by 6103, 
but because that information, together with information IRS believed the subcommittee might have, could be regarded as being protected. Moreover, on two occasions, witnesses who had agreed to be interviewed by the subcommittee staff re withdrew their agreement after being briefed by IRS disclosure attorneys on the penalties for unauthorized disclosures, even to a congressional subcommittee. The target of one case we investigated agreed to be interviewed by subcommittee staff, and a specific time was arranged. Before the interview was conducted, a high-ranking regional official contacted that, that individual and advised him against meeting with us, stating that, quote, these people are not your friends, end quote. The target was later counseled by disclosure litigation attorneys not to submit to the interview until he saw the materials the IRS had provided to the subcommittee. This individual later told us he got the definite impression that the IRS attorneys did not want him to talk to the subcommittee. This individual declined to be interviewed by the subcommittee. At this point, I would like to make the subcommittee aware of a document that was faxed to us just this morning. It is an IRS Office of Disclosure alert, which warns, it's bulletin number one, the first one of its kind, according to the person who sent it to us, that warns IRS employees against unlawful disclosures of tax information. This form cites two examples where current and former IRS employees were prosecuted and convicted for 6103 disclosures. This individual told me that he questioned the need for IRS to issue this alert at this time and wondered whether this was an effort of the Office of Disclosure to somehow put a lid on what is being told to the subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Stana, uh, in other words, according to your information, this is, bu this is bulletin number one. Yes, First sir. bulletin ever issued of its kind. That's my understanding, Mr. Secondly, Chairman. we do have present employees of the IRS who are scheduled to testify before this committee. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Well, it'll be interesting to see how their testimony then jives with the our already in, you know, interrogation of them uh, in view of this, uh, of this bulletin. I think that's very interesting that at this late stage of the game, uh, such an alert uh, comes from IRS, and it'll be interesting to see how this affects the testimony of those that we have already heard from uh, and the substance of their testimony. Let me continue with my examples, Mr. Chairman. As a second example, at the outset of our investigation, IRS stated that it would not produce documents or witnesses for interviews without a written request from the subcommittee setting forth the names of the IRS employees we wished to interview and a general description of why we needed to interview them. IRS used this general description in a written, quote, authorization signed by the commissioner, which permitted the witness to discuss only those topics previously identified and only for one interview. As a consequence of this procedure, several interviews were halted or diverted away from legitimate areas of subcommittee inquiry because witnesses were not permitted to respond to lines of questioning not previously authorized. On other occasions, when the subcommittee had follow-up questions for witnesses previously interviewed, we had to write a new request to the IRS, and the IRS commissioner had to write a new authorization. These restrictions, which were utilized by the IRS to assist them in identifying the integrity subjects under subcommittee investigation and in controlling the scope of information they provided us by IRS employees hindered our ability to obtain needed information. Although the subcommittee officially protested this process, no changes were made. Our only alternative would have been to subpoena all the IRS employees and documents we needed, a cumbersome and time-consuming process. As a third example, disclosure litigation attorneys told us they were present at our interviews with current and former IRS employees at the request of these witnesses and only to advise them on tax disclosure matters. We have learned, however, that these attorneys subsequently reported to management on the direction and topics of questioning so the IRS commissioner would not be surprised by testimony at the hearing. Given the fear of retaliation that already existed among employees at IRS, we believe that IRS employee knowledge of these reports to management on witnesses' testimony reduced the willingness of many employees to be candid with us. As a fourth example, we have been told by several IRS witnesses that in preparation for our interviews, IRS disclosure litigation attorneys told them 
not to volunteer information and not to offer any opinions to the subcommittee. This advice, which went beyond the scope of the tax disclosure rules, made the conduct of our investigation much more difficult. Despite these and other problems, there is evidence that IRS recognizes the importance of the subcommittee's investigation, the validity and significance of what we have found, and the need for increased efforts relating to employee integrity. Several months ago, on January 23, 1989, IRS published a new strategic initiative entitled Improving Awareness of Ethical, Integrity, and Conduct Issues, and, quote, action-forcing event, close quote, shown in the initiative was this subcommittee's investigation. The initiative states, quote, the Barnard subcommittee investigation surfaced a number of sensitive management issues focusing on conduct and integrity awareness. Currently, the regional commissioner, Mid-Atlantic Region, submitted a proposal for a quality improvement project on integrity, a study prompted by some serious concerns about the quality and effectiveness of the services integrity program, end quote. The implementation report goes on to state, quote, recent congressional investigations into conduct and integrity of some service employees prompted a critical self-assessment of some service practices and procedures. A number of management issues were identified, among which were the quality of the services communications on employee conduct standards and overall effectiveness of its integrity program, end quote. Do you have a copy of that statement available? Uh, yes, sir. A copy is, can be found in attachment A of, this, uh, of our testimony. This initiative appears to us to be a good first step. However, a heightened employee awareness of integrity issues by itself without an accompanying institutional commitment to objectively investigate and properly discipline misconduct when it is found is simply insufficient. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we now turn to a detailed discussion of our findings on the eight cases we examined. By way of background, all eight cases involve primarily the activities of IRS's Criminal Investigation Division, CID, and IRS's Office of Inspection. CID is responsible for investigating evidence of criminal violations of the tax laws and, if appropriate, recommending criminal prosecution by the Department of Justice or civil sanctions by IRS. The Office of Inspection has two components, internal audit and internal security. Internal audit is responsible for evaluating IRS operations and programs to assure that all organizational responsibilities are performed efficiently, effectively, and in accordance with laws and regulations. Internal security is responsible for conducting investigations into allegations of improper conduct by IRS employees and maintaining the highest standards of honesty, integrity, loyalty, and security among those employees. Internal security refers cases of employee misconduct to IRS management for appropriate administrative action, or if appropriate, to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution. We will now present the specific results of our investigation. I am going to start by first summarizing the three cases in California that we looked at during our investigation, Mr. Chairman. The first three cases I will discuss involve the Los Angeles District Office of IRS, and more specifically, the Criminal Investigation Division and its former chief, Ronald Sarano. What our investigation disclosed was a powerful criminal investigation chief who, together with a cadre of loyal subordinates, was beyond the control of his regional commissioner and the IRS commissioner in Washington. The three cases involving Mr. Sarano illustrate what can go wrong with a criminal tax enforcement system when a key person in that system permits social relationships, job offers, and informants to improperly influence his professional behavior, and when adequate institutional checks and balances are not in place to curb such misconduct. Between the late 1970s and early 1988 when he retired, Mr. Sarano and the Criminal Investigation Division approved and implemented a one-of-a-kind limited amnesty program for tax evader clients of an attorney who was a close social friend of Sarano's. This program, which was never approved by IRS's national office and which does not exist anywhere else in the country, gives individuals who evade taxes on legal source income a significant degree of protection from service criminal investigations and Justice Department criminal prosecution. We believe the Sarano-approved amnesty to be, a, to be contrary 
to IRS's long-standing policy of opposition to federal tax amnesty programs. Mr. Sarano attempted to, this is the second example, Mr. Sarano attempted to improperly influence a Justice Department prosecution of a former IRS employee whose defense lawyer was a social friend of Mr. Sarano's. In the third case, uh, Mr. Sarano used his reputation as one of the most powerful criminal investigation division chiefs in the country to influence two criminal tax investigations against the enemies of informants under circumstances involving serious impropri improprieties and possible illegal conduct. All of these actions took place with the apparent approval of the former IRS Los Angeles District Director. When individuals both inside and outside the IRS <clears throat> finally it raised serious questions about the legality and propriety of Mr. Sarano's conduct, the service initiated what can only be described as untimely and inept internal investigations. The ineffectiveness of IRS's investigations of Mr. Sarano's conduct can be traced to the overly close relationship between the Los Angeles Inspection and Criminal Investigation Divisions, the refusal of the National Office to follow the advice of its own chief inspector that only high officials in Washington, D.C could properly manage the probe, and IRS's institutional mindset that disclosure of serious wrongdoing by its senior managers would be an unacceptable black mark on its public image. What I'm going to do now is describe each of these three cases in detail. Uh, I'm going to, to, to jump around a little to try to, to try to speed it up, but there is a lot of information, important information that needs to be brought out. The first case I will discuss involves two related matters. First informants who are able to improperly misuse IRS in an attempt to advance their own personal financial interests. And second, an IRS internal investigation of the misuse that was untimely and inadequate. The case involves IRS's Los Angeles Criminal Invest Investigation Division, Western Region Internal Security, and the National Office Internal Security Investigations Branch. Our comprehensive investigation of this matter paints a picture of improper influence by informants, misuse of IRS, a conflict of interest, violations of IRS manual procedures, and violation of IRS's rules of conduct. It is our opinion that in this case, an improper relationship with informants resulted in a serious abuse of the IRS criminal investigative process and the grand jury system. What IRS did to examine this matter can only be described as untimely and inept. In March 1985, Informants brought allegations of tax fraud to the IRS Los Angeles District Director and Criminal Investigation Division Chief. The informants, the Marciano brothers of Los Angeles, owned 50 percent of Guest Jeans. They supplied Los Angeles District Director William Conant and Criminal Investigation Division Chief Ronald Sarano with what they, the Marciano said, was evidence of tax and customs fraud by their business partners and co-owners of Guest, the Nakash brothers of New York. The Marcianos alleged that the Nakash's New York-based company, Jordash Enterprises, was also involved in the Nakash's tax fraud schemes. Simultaneously, the Marcianos brought evidence of what they said was tax fraud by a guest licensee in California named Jeff Bobat, who owned Jeff Hamilton Incorporated. The Marcianos' entree to IRS was made by their personal accountant, who himself was a former IRS employee in Los Angeles and a friend of both the district director and the assistant district director. At the time the Marcianos brought their allegations to IRS, they were involved in heated civil litigation with both the Nakashes and Jeff Bobot. Through the civil litigation, the Marcianos were seeking to get back the 50 percent share of guests that they had sold to the Nakashes in 1983, and were attempting to rescind the lucrative licensing agreement they had entered into with Jeff Bobot, also in 1983. There were literally hundreds of millions of dollars at stake in these civil proceedings. Mr. Bernard, at this point, let me interrupt <coughs> and ask you a question uh, at this time. This morning's uh, Washington Post included an ad which interests me because it was a long dissertation and enumeration of all of the uh, civil, <coughs> not criminal, but civil actions that had been taken uh, between the, uh, between uh, the, Mar the Marcianos and uh, Nakashes. Uh, as I read this, it's my opinion that this very expensive ad that appeared in this paper this morning uh, was an evidence to maybe to influence again the public, uh, not and maybe try to influence this committee. 
Uh, but I want to assure from the way I read this, and I'd like to have your opinion since you uh, did the investigation. Does this ad and this information have anything at all to do uh, with the, uh, the investigation that you have conducted in this matter? Chairman, who is uh, the organization that purchases that ad? Well, it doesn't, it says, it doesn't really say. It's, there's no uh, evidence as to who bought the ad. Uh, I would say, though, that the uh, tenor of the ad is trying to indicate that in all of the civil actions between the Marcianos and the Nakashes have been found in favor of the uh, Marciano. That's the guest jeans company. But, on the, but the same thing uh, is my also information that this story is not complete. Am I wrong there? Well, let me first say that the outcome of the civil case is of no consequence to what we looked into, uh, which was influenced by the Marcianos on IRS. Uh, I, ha I, I, I have to say, though, that one of the things we looked at as a motivating factor for the Marcianos going to IRS was their civil case with, with the Nakashas. So other than that, the outcome of the civil case really, really has no bearing on, on what we looked at. It does show that the Marcianos do place a lot of value in their, in their civil litigation with the Nakashas, and it's very important to them. One other thing, based on what we know, the civil case uh, is not completed. What's printed there are the results of the first part of the civil case. I believe the civil case was broken up into parts by, by Judge Epstein, whose name appears in that ad, and that the second half of this case is going to be the Nakash's uh, countercharges against the Marcianos, countercharging that the Marcianos were guilty of misconduct in the operation of gas. And at the end of that period of time, a decision will be made on whether or not to rescind the agreement between the Marcianos and the Nakashas. So the civil case isn't over, one, and number two, the outcome of the civil case really has no bearing on, on what we looked at. Now, I know that you're going to uh, indicate in your testimony uh, that certain information was furnished by the Marcianos against Jordash. Correct. Uh, that and that information was supposedly used by the CID, the Criminal Investigation Division in Los Angeles, to institute a tax fraud case against Jordache. Yes, it was, it was, it was, it began in Los Angeles, moved to New York, and the investigation, the grand jury investigation began, yes. And it's that information that was furnished by the Marcianos to the CID Division in Los Angeles, which we had the, uh, we had the uh, agreement to get through the waiver of Jordache. Correct. It's that information that has been destroyed by the IRS? Correct. Yes. That very important information. The information that was brought to the IRS initially by the Marcianos and all subsequent information developed. Even the though we had a, the, a legitimate access to that Oh, uh, absolutely. I, IRS, and bo IRS and the Justice Department agree that we, have, that we have legitimate access to that information, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Please continue. Okay, Mr. Chairman, what I would like to do at this point is present some of the specific evidence we have gathered to show how employees of the Internal Revenue Service allowed themselves to be misused and improperly influenced by informants. In evaluating the situation in Los Angeles, we conducted over 65 interviews and re-interviews with 35 different individual, individuals, and we reviewed and analyzed well over 20,000 pages of IRS and non-IRS documents, letters, memoranda, and reports. Let me first start by talking about uh, informants motives and information. Our, inv our investigation revealed that the quality of the information brought by the Marcianos to District Director Conant and Criminal Investigation Division Chief Sarano was either never properly evaluated at all or was not evaluated in a timely manner, despite the Marcianos self-serving motives that were well known within the Los Angeles IRS office. Using all of the information IRS made available to us, and that, we were, and that which we were able to obtain ourselves, we have concluded that the information brought to IRS by the Marcianos was of dubious value and questionable quality. Yet, because IRS failed to thoroughly evaluate the information in a timely manner, two criminal tax investigations were initi initiated against the Marcianos' civil adversaries. Section 332.24 of the Internal Revenue Manual Special Agent Handbook, and that's the handbook for the CID special agents, uh, criminal investigators, states that, quote, informants provide information for a variety of reasons. In estimating the reliability of an informant 
and in, in evaluating the inf information which he furnished, consideration should be given to his or her, her motive. Page 13. I will begin with the allegations and information the Marcianos provided to IRS on Obat. From our review of internal IRS reports and interviews with Los Angeles IRS staff, we discovered that Mr. Sarano apparently knew of the heated civil litigation between the Marcianos and Bobat immediately after the Marcianos brought their information to IRS. The IRS agent who was initially assigned to investigate the Marciano allegations against Jeff Bobat told us he knew from the Marcianos themselves that they, quote, hated Bobat, end quote, and wanted, this is another quote, to get even with him. He said they were not informing on Bobat to fulfill their, and this is a quote by him again, patriotic duty. He also said that he knew there was money at stake in the civil litigation. Despite their apparent knowledge of the Marciano's high-stakes civil battle with Jeff Bobat and their desire to get him, no one at IRS, from Ronald Sarno down to his agents, carefully evaluated in a timely manner the credibility of the specific information and allegations of tax fraud brought to them by the Marcianos. Mr. Chairman, we reviewed the closed IRS case file on Jeff Bobat to evaluate for ourselves the Marciano information and review what IRS did to evaluate the information. What we found was a two-year investigation that went in a number of different directions but wound up nowhere. This lengthy, fruitless, and costly investigation could have been prevented if there had been thorough evaluation of the inform informant information. In fact, the closing report which was on the Bobat case, which was written in April of 1987, exactly two years after the Marcianos brought the information to IRS, stated, and this is a quote directly from the closing report, none of the guests incorporated the Marcianos' allegations could be substantiated, nor are they sufficient to prove a criminal tax case. The IRS case file on Bobat contains a document prepared by Bobat's accountant and supported by an independent third party that the case agent told us he obtained in August or September of 1986. This document, which the IRS eventually agreed with, contradicts and completely refutes the Marciano's original allegations against Bobat of backdoor cash sales and invoice manipulation. The document is dated June 11, 1985, seven months before IRS initiated a full-blown formal investigation and 22 months before IRS closed the investigation of Bobat. Our question for the special agent and IRS is why wasn't the Marciano information evaluated sooner in, in the investigation? Why was the criminal case formalized after the informant's information was discredited? And why was the apparently weak case kept open so long? We discovered through an analysis of the case file that Bobat made a substantial tax payment on April 15, 1985, virtually at the same time the Marcianos brought the information uh, to IRS. Rather than evaluate the informant information first, IRS decided in early 1986 to expand the investigation of Bobat to earlier years prior to the ones the Marcianos claimed tax fraud in the hope that something could be developed to prove tax fraud for those periods. The IRS agent who conducted the Bobot investigation in 1986 stated he knew Sarano, and this is a quote, wanted to do something, and that the agent also said keeping the Bobot investigation open might result in leads that could develop into other garment industry cases. As it turned out, we have been told that no new leads were developed by the Criminal Investigation Division at any time during the Bobot investigation or since. Five subcommittee investigators representing both the majority and the minority interviewed a confidential source who was, in a, who was in a position to have direct knowledge of the facts and circumstances surrounding the Marciano's interaction with IRS. This person, who you, Mr. Chairman, have spoken to over the last week, told us the Marciano stated to him that they went to IRS for the purpose of advancing their own personal financial situation with respect to the Nakash and Bobot civil litigation. He also told us that from his direct interaction with the Marcianos, they, the Marcianos, knew the information they were bringing to IRS was bogus. The issues raised by the Marcianos, according to this individual, were non-issues based on his own specific knowledge of guest operations, Bobot's guest license, and the garment industry in general. 
This individual's observation is consistent with the testimony of Arthur Anderson and company before the subcommittee on May 31, 1989. A representative of Arthur Anderson said, based on work they performed, they couldn't come to any conclusion at all, and that is a quote, about Nikosh customs fraud, which has since been linked to tax fraud. I'm going over to page 17 now, about halfway down. As in the Bobot investigation, we attempted to review what IRS did to evaluate the information the Marcianos brought to IRS on the Nikoshes and Jordash. We asked IRS to provide us with the information that the Marcianos provided to them in April 1985. IRS's analysis of that information and any other information developed by the service on the matter. In an interview with the subcommittee staff, former district director Bill Connett said he and Sarano received thick binders with private investigative reports, photographs, and other information on the Nikoshes from the Marcianos. He told us the information filled one or two big packing boxes. We asked the IRS, as you know, to supply us with the Nikosh and Jordash information provided to Conant and Sarano by Paul Marciano in March and April 1985, along with any other information provided to or developed by IRS prior to the time the investigation became a grand jury matter in New York in November 1985. Our intention was to evaluate the quality of the Marciano information and what IRS did to evaluate the quality of the information. Mr. Chairman, as you know, we have been told by the Justice Department and IRS management that their criminal investigator in New York who took over the Nikosh Jordash matter from the Los Angeles office, who received the Marciano supplied information from Sarano, and who has investigated this matter for a New York grand jury over the last four years, destroyed all the original information supplied to IRS by the Marcianos and all other information obtained before the grand jury began. The only information please, he claimed... Please, oh, and who was that? The agent? His name is Stephen Levy. Continue. The only information he claims to have is information obtained during a raid of Jordash in, in January 1986. The New York agent claims the documents which the Marciano supplied, and he, in quote, threw away, were duplicative of what was obtained in that raid. Mr. Chairman, to imply that the only information the Marciano supplied prior to the grand jury investigation was information obtained in the January 1986 raid is ludicrous. It is inconceivable that the Nakashas and Jordash would have in their possession private investigative reports of themselves commissioned by the Marcianos, surveillance photographs of themselves commissioned by the Marcianos, internal IRS interview notes, IRS analysis of the Marciano information, and memoranda of meetings that took place between IRS and the Marcianos in Los Angeles and New York before the grand jury started. As you remember, Mr. Conant explained the information they received in Los Angeles in, 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 all, in, in, in much detail to us. And that is the type of information when I just that? described. The, uh, when, the, when, did, when, was you in, when did you interview Mr. Conant? Approximately that? four weeks ago. Four weeks ago. He had a very distinct recollection of what was, of what was obtained. By the way, he is, a, he is in France, right? He's a, he is a senior level person in IRS, Revenue Service Representative in Paris. We were told that, a, that as a matter of practice and policy, these documents should never be destroyed. Mr. Levy did not even create any record that would permit anyone to determine what information now considered grand jury in nature was obtained before the grand jury was initiated. We believe this is a direct violation of Internal Revenue Manual Section 9267.3, which we quote here. I'm not going to read the quote. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Levy's destruction of the documents has effectively eliminated our ability to evaluate the quality of the information which the Marcianos brought to IRS about the Nikoshes and Jordash, and has eliminated our ability to evaluate any IRS review or analysis of that information. As you know, Mr. Chairman, you and Congressman Hastert have requested that the Department of Justice initiate an FBI investigation into the destruction of these documents by Mr. Levy and his motivations for doing so. In our opinion, the, Mar the Marciano's impetus for bringing the information on the Nikoshes, Jordash, and Jeff Bobot to the federal authorities was financially and revenge motivated. This conclusion is supported by testimony from a source with direct knowledge of guest operations and IRS agents who stated, among other things, the Marcianos wanted to get Bobot. 
We have attempted to determine why IRS's knowledge of the Marciano's motives did not prompt IRS to evaluate the quality of the information they, they brought in accordance with Internal Revenue Manual guidance. I now like to, let me just say one more thing. The obvious question uh, is, you know, was influence exerted on IRS officials that guaranteed the investigations would be initiated and pursued despite the quality of the informant information? And with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about informant influence. Gentlemen, uh, withhold them. Mr. I just want to clarify for the record here a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> your, allegation, your allegation say that there's two instances, one against uh, Bobat, who is a licensee, I understand, of, of guest genes. Is that correct? Correct. And another allegation of Jordash, who is, uh, owns 50 percent of guest genes that the Marcianos wanted to be able to, to buy Get back or re correct. retrieve in some way. Correct. Uh, <clears throat> the destroying of documents by Mr. Levy, who was a employee by the IRS, is that unprecedented in your? Well, it's it's. We've talked to uh, a number of current and former criminal investigators, and uh, yes, everyone we've talked to told us. Uh, then, secondly, the information uh, obviously. Or one of the reasons they said they destroyed that is that it was duplicative information on what they uh, were able to ascertain when they mm -hmm. put the raid on uh, Jordash, I believe. Uh, but that evidently is not so because we understand that in that information that there was the information given by Mr. Sereno and passed Mr. on uh, uh, additional information, oh, so some very irretrievable information was destroyed in that situation. Is At that correct? Correct. Thank and, you. And there's a, there's a, as an attachment to our statement, there's a, a transcribed uh, portion of our interview with Mr. Conant where he explains in great detail what was in that information they received. Hey, could you just briefly tell us what additional information there was there? There were, he said there were private investigative reports of the Nakashas commissioned by the Marcianos. He said there were surveillance pictures of the Nakashas taken by uh, uh, agents of the Marcianos. He said there were analyses. He also said Mr. Sarano took copious notes at the meetings, uh, at that meeting and in a prior meeting with the, with, with the Marcianos. Uh, those notes should be in the file. Those are the types of things that the Jordash people would not have in their warehouse or their offices in New York. As a matter of fact, the Jordash people would not have something that a private investigator was I would, doing. I would think them. not. He wouldn't be a very good private investigator. Right. Thank you. I don't want to get ahead of your testimony, but are you going to talk about what has happened uh, as far as the criminal investigation of Jordache? As far as the criminal investigation of Jordache? Uh, uh, the grand jury in New York. Uh, it's uh, ongoing. Huh? Ongoing. They, in other words, uh, this case is still ongoing. Correct. Uh, the case against Jordache. Is ongoing. The, the case against Jordache which is being conducted because of the Marciano information is still ongoing. The grand jury is still investigating it. In its, in its fourth year. A and it's in its fourth year of investigating it. Yes. Please continue. Although contrary to what is stated in the Internal Revenue Manual and IRS training materials, we believe IRS let the informants, in this case the Marcianos, and properly influenced the investigation of Jeff Bobot in Los Angeles and the Nakashas and Jordash in both Los Angeles and New York. Section 332.24 of the Internal Revenue Manual Special Agent Handbook states that with respect to informants, show appreciation for the information furnished, but do not let an informant determine the procedure to be used in the investigation or otherwise control it. IRS training materials state an investigator's ability to be objective is jeopardized if too friendly a relationship develops with the informant. Investigators have lost control of informants' investigations and in rare instances their personal values, integrity, and integrity because of misplaced loyalties to an informant. That's a quote right out of their own training materials. This is in the IRS training, training manual as to... For criminal investigators. Yes. And now, and I would like to advise the committee that that's going to be very, very important because of other testimony that's going to be uh, 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 re uh, revealed having to do with the uh, agents of the IRS. 
We believe the evidence demonstrates that the Marcianos exercised unusual influence over Ronald Sarano by cultivating a strong personal and social relationship with him and by offering him a job with a six-figure salary. Mr. Sarano, in turn, influenced his subordinates and others in IRS. During 1985, Can Los Angeles... Let's go back and repeat Can you just that? repeat that? Which is sure. Uh, that uh, Ron Sarano was cult... Uh, he was influenced by this strong personal and social relationship that the Marcianos cultivated with Sarano and the fact that he was offered a job by the Marcianos to, to commence upon his retirement at a six-figure salary. Do you have uh, evidence to substantiate that? Yes, there's, a, there's an attachment to the, to the statement where Mr. Sarano requests to go on leave without pay uh, in order to go to work for guests. Are you, are you going to cover that in full? Yes, detail? sir. During 1985, Los, Los Angeles Criminal Investigation Division Chief Sarano became the Marcianos, in quote, front man, a term used by Sarano himself to describe his activities during an internal IRS interview in 1987. Beginning in April 1985, at the time the Marcianos brought the information to, uh, to IRS, Ronald Sarano began to develop what can only be described as a close personal and social relationship with the Marcianos. While the Marcianos Washington, D.C. Council told you, Mr. Chairman, on May 23, 1989, that the Marcianos' relationship with Sarano was an arm's length relationship, we have developed evidence from depositions, sworn testimony, IRS's own files, and subcommittee interviews that clearly indicates Ronald Sarano met with the Marcianos over 20 times between April 1985 and December 1986. At least 14 of those meetings can be described as social contacts lunches, dinners, parties, weddings, breakfasts, where various subjects such as Sarano's future employment at guests were discussed. In an interview with subcommittee staff, former Los Angeles District Director Fred Nielsen, who took over for Mr. Conant in March of 1986, said he told Sarano in mid-1986 that he, Sarano, and this is a quote, should have nothing to do, end quote, with the Marcianos and that they were, and this is a quote from Mr. Nielsen, sucking him along. Our evidence indicates that late in 1985, Sarano began negotiating with the Marcianos for employment at Guess. The source of this informant is a senior IRS official who testified to the subcommittee staff that in October 1985, Sarano told him that he, Sarano, was negotiating for a, quote, six-figure salary at Guess. His statement was but buttressed by the former Los Angeles assistant district director who told us that in January 1986, Sarano told him he was going to work for Guess. Sarano himself, in, a, in sworn testimony contained in IRS internal files, stated that Paul Marciano invited him to lunch on March 26, 1986, at which time Paul Marciano offered him a job complete with salary, company car, and bonus. Because of this job office, Sarano disqualified himself from the Bobot investigation because of his ties to the Marcianos. The Marcianos, through their Washington, D.C. Council, have continued to maintain to the subcommittee that the Marcianos never offered Sarano a job. Indeed, in a sworn deposition taken on November 20th, 1987, in connection with the civil suit that we discussed earlier, Paul Marciano flatly denied that he ever offered Sarano a job. Mr. Sar Sarano has stated otherwise. In fact, Sarano, in the same sworn testimony that I quoted earlier, stated that shortly after Paul Marciano's job offer, in March 1986, Paul Marciano contacted Sarano and said he and his brothers wanted Sarano to start earlier than November 1987, his planned retirement date. Sarano had submitted a request for leave without pay to go to work for guests beginning in May of 1987. The request was approved by the Los Angeles District Director, Mr. Nielsen, but was subsequently disqualified by the Western Region. A copy of the memorandum Sarano prepared requesting the leave, the application form which clearly names Guess as his future employer, and a copy of Paul Marciano's sworn testimony of November 20th, 1987, where he denies offering Ron Sarano a job or any other consideration can be found at attachment D to this statement. Now let's go back to the sequence of those events. Uh, because this is very critical, I think, in, in, this, uh, in this particular part of your testimony. Um, 
Marciano, in a sworn deposition on November the 20th, denied offering him a job. Correct. Now, what, what case was that? I mean, what... what uh, that was in relation to the civil case, uh, which was advertised about in the Washington Post today. That was, that was the testimony that was, well, that was taken that led up to the decision that was uh, publicized. Why was that pertinent to that case? Well, I think at that time the Nakash attorneys were trying to show there was a link between Mr. 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 Marciano, Paul Marciano, and Ron Sarano, and that that was the reason why the Marcianos brought the uh, information to IRS, that they were getting special favors at IRS. So that was in November the 20th of 1987? Correct. All right, then, but the IRS's files, as you uh, indicate, mm -hmm. indicate that Mr. Sarano himself uh, indicated to IRS that he yes. had been offered a job. Absolutely, on, on March 26th, and 1986. What was the occasion of Mr. Saranoff's, uh, Saranoff, uh, what, what, why did he uh, uh, issue such a statement to IRS? Uh, well, I guess he, he, he said he, he wanted to do it because he needed to disqualify himself from the Bobot case. Okay, in order to disqualify himself from Bobot, he then acknowledged to IRS that he had been offered a job. Yes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, my yes, Mr. Martinez. Uh, question of uh, You referred to this ad, I believe, yes, sir. And that the attorney for the Nakashas was trying to prove that the Marcianos had influence over the investigation of. Uh, right. In other words, they were. They were. I guess. I guess. And this is just what I, you know, what I believe based on the information. That at that point, the Nakash attorneys were trying to show that the Marcianos were going to certain lengths to try to put pressure on the, on the Nakashis to settle their civil case. Did, uh, do they have copies, did that, those attorneys for the Nakashis have uh, copies of these kinds of information? No, that information was obtained directly from the Internal Revenue. I don't think anybody has seen, outside of IRS, has seen those, those documents. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm referring to the document, which is a uh, IRS form in which the request for the leave of absence and the reasons yeah. and where it says yes and first. And uh, I was just wondering if uh, in the, uh, that trial, since it is a grand jury, if uh, well, that they had attempted to or would they be able to get this kind of information? The one, one is the letter uh, from... Uh, uh, no. They can't get it at all. Mr. Bernard, uh, how long was the Bobot case ongoing before Saranoff disqualified himself? Uh, approximately uh, 11 months. It had already been going on for 11 months before he disqualified Correct. himself. Uh, well, then, did he possibly violate his own recusal? Uh, well, the, the information we have is that he knew about, that he was negotiating for the job as early as October 85. Uh, well, let's go ahead. Let's yeah, continue. As, as early as, yeah, as, as early as 85. He should have recused himself as soon as he began negotiation with the Marcianos. But I think it's important to note that IRS was on record. IRS was on record by Mr. Sarno himself that he, uh, a job had been offered to him. Okay. And, that, and during that same time, they were still investigating the, uh, the accusations of, uh, against Jordache that had been brought by the Marcianos, correct? Could you repeat the question, please? At the same time, they knew, they, the IRS knew about the accusations brought by the Marcianos against Jordache. Yes. So they knew about the employment offer and, and the accusations at the same time. Oh, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you at that okay. point, but feel free. Okay. The Marcianos, through their uh, Washington, D.C. Council, uh, have continued. I guess I, I've lost my I point. think you've got to start at 24, first right. paragraph. We have corroborated the offer of employment that I just discussed by Paul Marciano to Ron Sarano from two different sources within Guess. Uh, a former Guess employee told us that Paul Marciano described a former subordinate of Sarano and Sarano as people who were, who were helping them at IRS. Former guest employee also told us that Paul Marciano told him if Jeff Bobot gave up on the civil case against Guess, his problems with IRS would go away. Paul Marciano went on to ask this employee if he wanted to see Jeff Bobot's tax return, which he claimed he had. 
The employee refused, then telephoned the guest's in-house counsel who said he, the counsel, did not want to know anything about the matter. We believe Sarano's relationship with the Marcianos and the job offer were the crucial factors that influenced Sarano's behavior and had a domino effect down through the ranks of the subordinates. The consensus among the IRS staff we interviewed was that Sarano was a strong leader that exercised tremendous influence over his subordinates. We believe this influence had an impact on how Sarano's subordinates handled the Jeff Bobot investigation. Although no agent or manager would admit to being directly influenced by Sarano, they admitted that Sarano participated in the Bobot investigation and was interested. One agent said during the summer of 85, Sarano provided helpful hints on what to do on the case. Another case agent stated Sarano's interest had some impact on a decision to open a full-blown official investigation beyond January 1986. The revenue agent who was... Well, now, wouldn't this appear to be a, a violation of his recusal? Well, he hadn't recused himself yet at that point, but okay. our information shows that he had already began negotiations for the job. He should have recused himself. There was a viol yeah. We believe there was a violation for not recusing himself, which is a, section, which is a, a criminal violation, Section 208, uh, and uh, yes, if, if he should have recused himself, and since he didn't, that was a violation, and the fact that he was negotiating for the job was a violation. The revenue agent who was assigned to assist the criminal agent in, in January 1986 on the Bobot case stated, Sarano made it known to the criminal agent that he, Sarano, was interested in the Bobot case and felt it would be a good case and wanted it done. During 1986, this agent and virtually the entire office knew Sarano had accepted a post-retirement job offer from the Marcianos. We learned from two colleagues of the criminal agent who was working the Bobot investigation that management pressured him to keep working the Bobot case even though the agent believed the case should have been closed down around September 1986. When interviewed by the subcommittee sa staff, the case agent said he did not want to close down the investigation around August or September 1986 because he finally realized that he did want to close down the investigation around August, September 1986, because he finally realized he could not make a criminal case. He said he was told by his managers, who worked directly for Sarano but claimed they weren't influencing him, to take one final look at the matter. A review of that agent's diary revealed he spent only about 12 days on this case during the last seven and a half months it was open. With respect to the information which the Marcianos provided to IRS on the Nakashas and Jordash, we believe evidence indicates Ronald Sarano was able to exert influence by becoming the front man, the coordinator for the Marcianos. He claimed he became the front man because Paul Marciano liked him and IRS needed the Marcianos cooperation. Based on what we have found and were told by IRS agents, the Marcianos needed no prodding to supply information on Bobot and the Nakashas. In fact, we learned that the Marcianos filed claims for rewards on both the Bobot and the Kosh Jordash investigations. This means that the Marcianos would receive a percentage of any delinquent taxes IRS assess assessed against either Bobot and the Nakashas. That's in the IRS records? Yes. Ronald Sarano arranged and attended the first meeting the Marcianos had with Customs, along with the agent he assigned to the Bobot case. That agent described this meeting to us as a real, and this is a quote, show being put on by the Marcianos. Later in 1985, September, Ronald Sarano traveled to New York to introduce the Marcianos to senior representatives of the U.S. Attorney's Office and IRS's Manhattan District Office. What apparently wasn't known by anyone at the New York meeting was that at that particular time, Sarano was developing a social relationship with the Marcianos and very possibly negotiating for a job at Guess, as I stated earlier. About a month later, in October, uh, Sarano mentioned the guest job possibility to a fellow IRS employee. As a result of the Marciano's trip to New York in September 1985, with Sarano as their sponsor, the IRS was able to use whatever information the Marciano's had supplied to that point to convince the Justice Department to open a grand jury investigation of the Nakashas and Jordash. Our investigation was in has uncovered evidence that the Marcianos were able to directly influence the investigation of Bobot as well as the Nakashas and Jordash. They have done this by direct intervention in certain IRS investigative activities and by becoming friendly with certain agents. We found on the Bobot case that agent assignments appeared to be more 
a function of the Marciano's preferences than IRS's needs. Information which we have obtained from interviews with IRS agents and IRS documents indicate that an agent was removed from the Bobot investigation because he refused to be directed by the Marcianos, and that as a result, they, the Marcianos, were not impressed with him. The agent told us that Paul Marciano called him regularly with suggestions. The agent said he eventually stopped returning the many calls he was receiving from Paul Marciano. Sarano believed that the agent was moving too slow, and therefore he transferred him off the case. In our opinion, it was the agent's willingness, to, unwillingness, to be controlled by the Marcianos that was responsible for his transfer by Sarano. The agent that eventually performed the bulk of the work on the Bobot investigation said he continu continually received information about Bobot from the Marcianos. He told us when he hit a dead end, he would call Paul Marciano and ask, in quotes, what do I do now? We find this to be a clear example of informant influence. We have a situation where the criminal case agent was asking Paul Marciano, what do I do now? On an investigation of someone that the Marcianos were locked in heated civil litigation with involving millions of dollars. And someone who the original agent on the case told us that the Marcianos hated and wanted to get even with. Through our probe, we also learned that the Marcianos may have had a direct impact on how IRS agents investigated the Nakashas and Jordash. During, the, during a visit uh, of Mr. Levy to, to California, a private citizen was interviewed by Levy and the Los Angeles agent who was assigned to the Bobot case. This private citizen, who was a former Jordash employee and current owner of a garment company, told us in an interview that Levy tried to intimidate him in 1986 during the interview by yelling and saying if he cooperated with IRS and provided information detrimental to the Nakashas and Jordash, that he, the private citizen, would get more business from the Marcianos. Now, Mr. Levy, is this a different Mr. Levy? No, it's the same Mr. Levy. This is the same Mr. Levy that yes. is that in, indicated that 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 uh, documents were destroyed. He didn't indicate. He said he destroyed. Said destroyed the documents. Okay. Los Angeles, the Los Angeles agent initially corroborated the private citizen's account of Levy's proposition. A second interview was conducted of the agent by IRS attorneys in 1988 at which time he, he said Levy used, in quotes, verbal intimidation and told the private citizen, that if, in, in quotes, the Marcianos would appreciate any help he could provide with respect to the investigation of the Nakashas. We also learned that when Levy visited Los Angeles, he and the Los Angeles agent went to dinner with, the, with all four Marciano brothers at an exclusive restaurant. Again, I refer back to the Irish training materials, which clearly state, in quote, an investigator's ability to be objective is jeopardized if too friendly a relationship develops with the informant. According to attorneys for the Nakashas, close to this point in time in mid-1986, the Nakashas apparently got frustrated with what they perceived was a misuse. Well, the gentleman with Hall, uh, we have a vote on the floor. Why don't we uh, just take a five-minute recess and we will uh, reconvene in five minutes. Subcommittee will come to order. We uh, overlooked a very important matter in the beginning of our uh, hearings today, which I sort of, I, in a way, I won't apologize for, but something we don't normally do, but something we are going to do throughout the remainder of this hearings. And then I'd like to Mr. Bernard and Mr. Stanley, if they would stand and Take the oath. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so after God? Yes, yes, we do. All right, you, you might continue. Okay. Uh, according to the attorneys for the Nakashas, close to this point in time in 1986, uh, the Nakashas <clears throat> apparently got frustrated with what they perceived was a misuse of the IRS by the Marcianos. In August 1986, the Nakashas decided that they too would go to IRS with information from their civil litigation with the Marcianos, which they believed revealed Marciano kickback schemes and potential tax fraud by the Marcianos in their operation of gas. A representative of the Nakashas. This, this is a reversal. 
Yes, this is what the second half, I believe, the second half of the civil case is, is going to address in California. Okay. I may be wrong, but I, I believe that's the case. But, but this is a reversal of the first role. Correct. Okay. A representative of the Nakashas who had previously assisted IRS's criminal investigation division on an investigation which resulted in six corporate officials being indicted, prosecuted, and imprisoned in 1980, brought the allegation and information about Marciano tax evasion to Dallas in August of 1986. He refused to bring the information directly to IRS in Los Angeles, which is where the Marcianos live, because of the close personal ties between the Marcianos and Sarano. Internal IRS documents show that the Criminal Investigation Division quickly coordinated the situation with the Los Angeles Criminal Investigation Division. In fact, the matter was coordinated within IRS at the regional office level as well as the district level. After conducting an interview with a former guest manager that in their opinion substantiated many of the allegations that were made against the Marcianos, the Dallas IRS staff met with representatives from the Los Angeles District in Santa Monica, California on September 24, 1986. Shortly after this meeting, approximately six weeks after the Dallas office initially received the allegations against the Marcianos, the matter was turned over to the Los Angeles office. And within days of this happening, the Los Angeles District Director Nielsen decided that the matter should be referred to the Laguna Niguel District, also in California. Apparently, this was done for the same reason the Nakashas went to Dallas first, that being Mr. Sarano's relationship with the Marcianos. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the Marcianos' representative in Washington, D.C. has alleged that the Nakashas' representative acted improperly in bringing these allegations to IRS in Dallas. We have investigated these allegations as thoroughly as we could without a tax disclosure authorization from the Marcianos, despite our many requests and attempts, and I believe you were involved in some of those requests and some of those attempts, and found that the matter was properly coordinated between Dallas and Los Angeles, that the Nakash representative was properly handled as an informant by IRS staff, per manual and training guidelines, and that the prior testimony exists which raises serious questions about more recent testimony of a specific individual that the Marcianos Washington DC Council claims supported his theory of improper behavior by Dallas IRS agents and an Akash representative. In following up on the individuals, this individual's most recent testimony brought to us by the Marcianos Council in the form of a January 19, 1989 written declaration, we found that it contradicted an earlier statement made by the same individual to IRS investigators during an interview on November 16, 1987. Ironically, let me add this, ironically, the individual who the Marcianos Washington DC Council said could prove wrongdoing by Dallas agents is the same person who provided the Dallas agents with proof of Marciano kickback schemes and told the subcommittee staff in a telephone interview that these kickbacks existed. I think we need to re. I think we need to uh, re review uh, re review that a little bit. Sure. Because uh, I think that uh, there has been some some uh, confusion uh, about this particular incident that you have just. Uh, is it any way that you can go back and review that again? Summarize. Uh, and be a little bit more specific. Okay. I don't know whether or not we are, are gaining anything and whether or not we are by not mentioning people's names because I think it's going to be mentioned at some point. I, uh, I, think, we, we, uh, I, uh, I think we need to, I think the committee would be confused just by reading this particular part of okay. the testimony. Who's, Let's go back over that okay. again. This is a, as, as you have just said, this is an investigation. Mm -hmm. that was instigated by the Jordash Correct. officials, Nakashis. Correct. Correct. A representative of theirs went to Dallas. So they, the they had a, their representative went to the Dallas office Correct. and furnished information Correct. for the purpose of instigating a, uh, a, uh, an action against <clears throat> the guest genes. For the purpose of seeing whether IRS would be interested in right. initiating an investigation. And he went there because of the fact is that he was scared that, I would not scared, but he was, he didn't believe that a fair treatment of his accusation would be made if he went to 
Los that, Angeles. Yes, that's one reason. The other reason was that he had worked with that office in 1980, in 1980 on an investigation which resulted in six corporate officials being imprisoned. We have a copy of a letter sent to that. Sent six to corporate him. officials of whom? Frito Lay Company. It's a, it's, a, it's a different matter. Okay. All right. So, but eventually, the Dallas office with this representative did go to California. Yes. This representative, uh, did he sit in? Uh, did he sit in with a uh, meeting of the uh, Dallas office and the Los Angeles office? Uh, I believe he claims he did not. Uh, the person who they interviewed in 1987 said he did not. However, this declaration that was brought to us by the Marciano's representative, which was just signed uh, within the last six months, uh, implied that he did. Well, if he did, uh, as an informant, mm -hmm. was that outside of the rules of the IRS? Technically, no. It, it's, it's, it's called developing a secondary informant. With, when one informant when one informant has information that another person has information, it's proper for that, inf that first informant to bring the IRS officials to the second informant, introduce them, and, uh, and, 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 and be there. As long as no tax information is disclosed, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And it I is just a want technique to clear that up, because I think that, that, that uh, you know, I, I, as one, as I have said from the very beginning of this, we want to be eminently fair with and we, both sides. And we checked. We, we, we uh, for the record and for the record, I just want to state that, that we're not interested in the Marcianos or the guest genes. We're not interested in the Jordash or the Nakashes. That's, that's outside of our jurisdiction. What we are trying to determine, and I want to emphasize this again, is how the IRS was involved in this particular transaction, <coughs> and, and this is why I wanted to reemphasize that. When those allegations were brought to us by their D.C. Council, the Marciano's D.C. Council, we did check into them as thoroughly as we could. We poured through the manual, uh, Mr. Stannard and myself. Uh, we, we talked to probably eight to ten current and former CID people, uh, not only in IRS but in other agencies, and, uh, and the technique is called developing a secondary informant. What we were developing here, uh, gentlemen, is uh, the fact that, uh, that we, while you were out, they were developing the fact that another side of the story comes out in as much as the Jordache company also hired an uh, investigator or an agent who brought uh, actions or claims against the Marcianos and Guest Jeans. And we were going through how that had been handled by the IRS. Uh, and uh, to, just to be, to be sure that the procedure that was handled was, a little, was, was somewhat different than it was otherwise. I don't know whether you want to answer any questions now, but we'll have plenty of time for questions just, uh, later. Brief, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, echo your comment that uh, this subcommittee is not interested in Jordache genes or guest genes, the personalities involved. Our interest is the IRS. Correct. Thank you for saying that. Please continue. Let me talk a little bit about what we feel are some violations of IRS's <coughs> rules of conduct. We believe our evidence indicates Ronald Sereno violated IRS rules of conduct in 1985 and 1986. Specifically, we believe there were violations of disqualification and confl conflict of interest rules. Within days of the telephone call from Dallas to Los Angeles in late August 1986 about alleged Marciano tax evasion, Sereno was told by his district director, Fred Nielsen, that he was disqualified from any participation in the matter. Despite this edict, he, we have learned through interviews with our current IRS staff that over a two-year period, two Sar what? a two-day a, a two period, thank you for correcting me, a two-day period, Sarano attempted to obtain the information the Dallas office had transmitted to Los Angeles on alleged Marciano tax evasion. Mr. Sarano should have known better in light of his imposed disqualification by Nielsen. Fred Nielsen told us that he repeatedly advised Sarano to sever his ties with the Marcianos, but that the Marcianos were sucking him along, that his relationship with the Marcianos stunk, and that his continued bragging about his future job at Guest was creating a morale problem in the office. How did you confirm this? We interviewed Mr. Nielsen himself. Well, continue. In spite of Mr. Nielsen's warnings, 
Mr. Nielsen's imposed this qualification on Sarano from the Marciano matters and the morale problems in the office, Sarano still attempted to find out what information IRS received about the Marcianos. On December 22, 1986, Sarano again attempted to obtain information about IRS's investigation of his future employers, the Marcianos. Specifically, Sarano telephoned his Sarano telephoned the Laguna Nigal Criminal Investigation Division Chief and asked if his division was about to number a criminal tax case against two of the Marciano brothers. Our information indicates that Sarano told the Laguna Nigal Division Chief that he knew of the investigation and requested that the investigation be completed as promptly as possible because he was planning to work for the Marcianos upon his retirement. We believe these inquiries were possible violations of Rules 231 and or 232 of the IRS Rules of Conduct. Mr. Chairman, I might just ask one clarifying question. Who was at that time the Laguna Niguel Division Chief? Who was uh, Robert Pledger, who was formerly in the Los Angeles District. In fact, he came up through the ranks under Mr. Sarano. Is Mr. Pledger still Pledger still in that position? As a as a assistant to the regional. Executive Assistant to the Assistant Regional Commissioner for Criminal Investigation in Chicago. Chicago now. He's been transferred. <clears throat> Thank you. Now I'd like to talk about IRS's internal investigation of this whole matter. Mr. Chairman, the information gathered and analyzed during our investigation uncovered potential violations of IRS manual procedures, improper influence by informants, misuse of IRS, conflict of interest, and violations of the rules of conduct. With all these problems, you may ask what IRS did to investigate this very troubling situation. Based on our evaluation of IRS efforts to investigate this matter internally in 1987, we have concluded that the investigation was untimely and incomplete. Mr. Chairman, I believe IRS's own actions over the last year support our conclusion. Apparently, IRS was not totally comfortable with what was done in 1987. We have learned that in response to our investigation, IRS has retraced part of its 1987 effort. Initially, it appears IRS wanted to investigate Sarano shortly after he violated his disqualification from the Marciano matter in late August 1986. Before an investigation was ever initiated, however, IRS National Office Inspection had some concerns that the individual in Los Angeles who would have been responsible for supervising the internal investigation of Sarano was too personally close to Sarano and others in the Criminal Investigation Division to do an objective and thorough job. IRS National Office Internal Security staff traveled to Los Angeles in November 1986 to determine who should investigate Sarano. Based on the investigation by the National Office inspectors, a decision was made by IRS's top management that the Los Angeles Internal Security Supervisor was not too close to the Los Angeles Criminal Investigation Division to investigate Sarano and others in the division. This opinion was not shared, however, by the National Office inspectors who actually traveled to Los Angeles to look into the matter, and they told us that themselves in interviews. We interviewed the Los Angeles case inspector assigned to perform the initial internal investigation. His now name let's, is... Let's, let's go back. The IRS top management actually went to Los Angeles. No, well, they sent inspectors from Washington. And, uh, and they determined that the Los Angeles criminal in investigation uh, was not, too, was close. not too close. That's what top management decided. The top management decided. Correct. That, and they did that over the uh, advice of the inspector. Of well, the inv one of the, the inspectors, inspectors, one of the inspectors that we interviewed said, you know, you know, he, he doesn't want to say, I told you so. But he said, I told you so, you know, when we interviewed him. But they were overridden by the national office. That is apparently what happened based on what we have learned from our interviews. Any, any names? I mean, who in the national office did that? The chief of, in, the, chief of the internal security division, okay. Arnold Decker. Arnold Decker. And, and an assistant regional, the assistant regional inspector at the time, uh, whose name is Mike, what is Mike Rinaldi. He's no longer the assistant regional inspector. All right, continue. If I might, yes, ask Chris. One additional question: uh, Who was the Los Angeles internal security supervisor? In question. The, the, okay, the supervisor, the branch chief who had responsibility 
for the group that investigated Mr. Sarano, his name is Mike Bick, and we'll discuss his involvement very shortly. And it was his participation that was the subject of the... Uh, no, it was actually, okay, Mr., no, uh, you want to know who was accused of being too close? Yes. It was a group manager in the Los Angeles Post of Duty named uh, uh, Debbie Jones. I'm sorry? Deborah Jones. Deborah Jones. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We interviewed the Los Angeles case inspector who worked for Debbie Jones, who was assigned to perform the actual everyday work on the internal investigation. His name is, is Russell Davis, and he will testify here tomorrow. He told us that he too, right from the start, anticipated problems with the investigation. Davis said he knew that his supervisor was perceived as being too close to many managers in the criminal investigation division, including Sarano. Mr. S Mr. Davis said that this perception was real and deserved because over the years he personally observed the close everyday relationship between his supervisor and members of the criminal investigation division. Mr. Davis said that during his initial investigation he found that criminal investigation division staff were hesitant to talk to him about Sarano for fear that the information would get back to Sarano through his, through his supervisor and that there would be retaliation against them by Sarano and other criminal investigation division managers. Mr. Davis believed a specific investigation of Mr. Sarano himself was warranted. Despite these beliefs, because let me say one thing, that, that the investigation they opened initially was not a, you know, an investigation of Sarano specifically, but just a general investigation of, of the criminal investigation division. Sarano wasn't a specific target yet, and that does have a bearing on how the investigation is conducted. Uh, it, 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 it's harder to get information. It's harder to talk to people because people are a little hesitant to talk when you don't know, when they don't know who it is you're investigating specifically. Despite his beliefs, he told us that he was being pressured to close down the entire matter. Mr. Davis told us that it, if it had not been for the Forbes article in 1987, a con conduct investigation specifically targeted at Sarano probably would not have been initiated. Mr. Chairman, we believe that this pattern of investigating senior level officials only after the allegations get out of the IRS loop and into the media or some other non-IRS forum is disturbing and a recurring theme throughout our investigation. As it turned out, the Forbes article on the Los Angeles situation was published and Sarano was investigated. A new case agent was brought in from outside Los Angeles to replace Mr. Davis. Uh, regional management, Mr. Bick, became directly involved on an everyday basis. So what we have here is a situation where it wasn't until the matter got out of the loop before IRS took the type of action that Mr. Davis recommended the previous February. Well, why did they, just, why did they replace him? Well, his name was mentioned in the Forbes article, and they felt that it would be best to bring in somebody from outside the district to, to, to do this new specific investigation of Mr. Sarano. <clears throat> Mr. Like I said, if, if Mr. Davis's recommendation the previous fall was uh, to have someone other than his supervisor in Los Angeles manage the investigation. We reviewed in great detail those internal investigative efforts that were performed in reaction to the Forbes article. We believe they were ineffectively performed in 1987, and based on IRS's own actions during the last year to re-interview individuals and interview new witnesses, IRS management may hold the same opinion. The investigations were comprised primarily of interviews. Probably 90% of the investigation was interviews. We believe that while there were a substantial number of interviews conducted, some key interviews were not conducted. For instance, Mr. Conant was never interviewed during the internal investigation. And he was the one that initially went with Mr. Sarano to the Marciano's home to receive the information. And the information that, that he provided to us about that meeting was, is, is very crucial to the whole situation. We also discovered that key questions were not asked during the internal IRS internal probe. It also appears, it also does not appear that the inspectors conducting the internal investigation performed any analysis themselves of the quality of the information provided by the Marcianos. We believe key analyses were missing or lacking. There was no attempt to analyze what influence Sarano had on the agents beyond whether he made any overt, blatant attempts to direct his staff in an inappropriate or corrupt manner. We would not expect Sarano to make any obvious attempts to influence his subordinates. We believe internal security should have focused in on Sarano's ability to use his position, 
his reputation, stature, his known wishes with respect to the Marcianos, and his future plans with the Marcianos to influence how his staff pursued the Bobot investigation. Mr. Levy's destruction of the Marciano supplied information on the Nakashas, which we believe is a very serious situation that needs to be investigated, was not detected during the internal investigation. Apparently, they never requested the information the Marcianos provided on the Nakashas. If they had, they would have discovered then that Levy destroyed the documents. Because Mr. Levy says he destroyed the document shortly after the 86 raid. The internal investigation was conducted in November of 1987. So if they had made an attempt to evaluate the Nakash information brought in by the Marcianos, they would have requested that documentation, and they should have found at the time that, that those documents were gone. So obviously they, didn't look at, obviously they didn't look at the documents or make an attempt to. Another disturbing aspect of these internal investigations was a lack of any effort to reconcile the tremendous amount of conflicting sworn testimony obtained during the investigation. For example, former District Director Nielsen claimed he told Sarano that he shouldn't be seeing the Marciano socially and putting so much trust in them. Yet Sarano told the IRS internal security inspectors that he was never advised by either Nielsen or Regional Inspector Coleman to stay away from the Marcianos. I'm going to go to the bottom of that page now. There are two final issues related to the internal investigation that need to be discussed. One relates to actions of Los Angeles Criminal Investigation Division Management, which we believe served to undermine the internal investigation. And the second is an action by the National Office Inspection Office that served to use the internal investigation in a misleading manner. An anonymous letter was dated December 9, 1987, was sent to the commissioner of IRS about actions related to the Los Angeles internal investigation. The author of this letter accused Criminal Investigation Division Management in Los Angeles of monitoring the internal investigation conducted in response to the Forbes article. Specifically, the letter states that the Criminal Investigation Division group managers were directed, and this is a quote from the letter, to monitor inspection contacts made to CID personnel. The group managers were told to find which special agents were contacted by inspection and to find out from these special agents the questions asked by the inspectors. During our investigation, we received testimony which indicates that these instructions were, in fact, given to special agents by some of the group managers in Los Angeles. We, t we got that from someone who was given those instructions directly and told us in an interview. In addition, we have information that at least one individual in the Criminal Investigation Division was threatened by a group manager to keep quiet and not provide any information about Mr. Sarano to internal security or anyone else. And we also received that information in an interview. The case inspector in charge of the Sarano investigation told us the allegations made in the anonymous letter about reporting the internal security interviews and questions back to management were true, it would have an intimidating effect on the witnesses and an impact on the outcome of the interviews. We believe it would undermine the entire investigative effort, which was primarily interviews. Moreover, Mr. Chairman, we believe IRS has attempted to cover up and mislead with respect to the situation involving Mr. Sarano and the Marcianos. The U.S. attorney investigating the Nakashas in New York asked, for, asked IRS for information on Mr. Sarano's relationship with the Marcianos. In a, March 20, in a March 1988 response to the U.S. attorney, the acting IRS assistant commissioner for inspection, Ken Thompson, wrote to the assistant U.S. attorney in New York that IRS's, and this is a quote, investigation disclosed several meetings between Sarano and the Marcianos, and that, in quotes, these would, ap would appear to be social contacts, end quotes. The letter goes on to state, quote, in approximately March 1986, Sarano had discussions with the Marcianos concerning possible employment with Guess Incorporated after his anticipated retirement. Immediately after discussing possible employment with the Marcianos, Sarano prepared a memorandum disassociating himself from criminal investigative matters involving the Marcianos. This letter is very misleading for a number of reasons. First of all, if nothing else, the IRS investigation of Sarano clearly established a social relationship between Sarano and the Marcianos that included numerous contacts. Second, Sarano in March 1986 disqualified himself from the Bobot case only. It was District Director Conant 
I'm sorry, District Director Nielsen, who imposed the disqualification on Sarano of all criminal investigation division matters involving the Marcianos. This did not occur until August of 1986. Third, the letter fails to mention that Sarano twice violated this disqualification by attempting to obtain information about the IRS investigation of his future employers, the Marcianos. Fourth, the letter fails to mention that a senior Los Angeles manager testified that Sarano mentioned possible guest employment to him as early as October 1985. We believe this letter by Mr. Thompson is an attempt to minimize any embarrassment to IRS that could result from Mr. Sarano's relationship with the Marcianos and the impact that the relationship and Sarano had on the Department of Justice's decision to initiate a grand jury investigation of the Nakashas and Jordash at IRS's request. I'm going to state my summary conclusion. Uh, just one second. Who was the letter sent to in New York? It was sent to Mr. Giuliani, the U.S. attorney in New York at the time. Continue. Mr. Chairman, we believe that IRS must strictly enforce the provisions of IRS's own manual and IRS's own training materials pertaining to the handling of informants and the evaluation of information in the context of informants' motives. In this case, the information was not thoroughly evaluated in a timely manner, and informants were able to influence investigative decisions. There do not appear to be any checks and balances to prevent this type of situation from occurring. When this type of situation is allowed to occur, people suffer. Sarano was involved in a serious conflict of interest situation. In addition, our evidence indicates witnesses were intimidated by IRS management during the investigation and threatened with retaliation. If this occurred as widely as we suspect, the entire investigation effort may be of little value. Mr. Chairman, as you know, since there was no punitive action taken against Mr. Sarano, some have concluded there was nothing inappropriate about his, his relationship with the Marcianos or his behavior in that regard. This conclu conclusion is not correct. Individuals we interviewed who were close to the internal investigation believed, based on the information which was developed, that Sarano would have received administrative punishment for violations of the IRS rules of conduct that we cited earlier. In fact, internal IRS documents indicate that had Mr. Sarano still been at IRS when the U.S. Attorney declined, returned his declin declination of any criminal wrongdoing by Sarano based on the incomplete report he received, he would not have received the clearance, but, would, but rather would have been subject to IRS administrative sanctions. Since Mr. Sarano was no longer at IRS, these administration, administrative sanctions could not be imposed. I'd like to go to the second California case, if there's no questions. Hey, I'd like to go to the next case in California, if there are no questions. Well, just, just before we move on, uh, I don't believe you stated in here, mm -hmm. uh, did you state exactly what what happened to Mr. Sarano? Mr. Sarano retired from the IRS in late February 1988. Uh, nothing happened to Mr. Sarano. All right, let's, uh, uh, let's res recess for five minutes uh, so that we can cast our vote. You're watching coverage of a hearing on alleged employee mismanagement at the Internal Revenue Service. C-SPAN will continue with this hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer and Monetary Affairs in just a moment. Thanks for watching. Good evening from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN. Be sure to join us on Sunday for live coverage of the annual meeting of the National Governors Association. State leaders from around the country will convene in Chicago and C-SPAN will be there for conference sessions and live viewer call-in programs. That's live coverage of the National Governors Association beginning this Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 7.30 a.m. Pacific on C-SPAN. Coming up in just a moment on C-SPAN is continued coverage of a hearing on a congressional investigation of the Internal Revenue Service. Members of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Commerce Consumer and Monetary Affairs met for that session on Tuesday. 
We'll follow that at 2.55 a.m. Eastern Time with remarks by several Republican members of the House who met with President Bush on Tuesday. They stopped to answer questions from reporters on federal budget matters. Then at 3.05 a.m. Eastern Time is a White House ceremony honoring youths who participated in the Job Training Partnership Act. President Bush and Labor Secretary Elizabeth Dole presided there. And at 3.25 a.m. Eastern Time, 12.25 a.m. Pacific, is a portion of House floor debate on the 1990 Defense Authorization Bill. Members debated several amendments on funding for the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that's our schedule for the next few hours on C-SPAN. Thank you for watching. For viewers who want to know more about C-SPAN, we publish a weekly newspaper called the C-SPAN Update. It's a useful companion to your C-SPAN viewing with stories about our public affairs programming, articles concerning the issues, events, and newsmakers we cover. There's information about our network and feedback from viewers just like you. Plus, a pull-out section with our general schedule, including air times for programs we know about in advance. Just $24 a year brings you 50 issues of the C-SPAN update. To place your order now, call 1-800-346-8800. Use your credit card, or we'll be glad to bill you. This week's update reports on the annual conference of the nation's governors. It gives an explanation of how Supreme Court decisions are handed down, and it previews an address by Thomas Foley on his new role as House Speaker and on matters coming before this session of the House. If you order the C-SPAN update now, you'll receive a free gift. Gavel to Gavel. It's a valuable guide to the televised proceedings of Congress. Call 1-800-346-8800 and we'll send you Gavel to Gavel and 50 issues of the C-SPAN update, both for just $24. Call now. The new House Speaker, Thomas Foley, addresses the National Press Club and examines some of the issues facing Congress. That's on C-SPAN, Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific Time. C-SPAN is a nonprofit cooperative created and supported by the cable television industry as a public service to its national cable television audience. In addition, C-SPAN is underwritten in part by the following. Democracy isn't easy. It's people staying involved in their communities. It's a strong press and the literacy to read it. Gannett Foundation supports programs in communities in and communications. It's all of us doing our part. Next on C-SPAN, we continue with a hearing on allegations of employee mismanagement at the Internal Revenue Service. Georgia Congressman Doug Barnard chairs the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs. And during Tuesday's session, members of the panel heard testimony from a former employee of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles. Committee will come to order. Uh, we're having a vote, as you can see, on the floor, but uh, I'm sure that the uh, members will get over just as quickly as they possibly can. Uh, at the time that we recessed, uh, Mr. Bernard, you were at uh, California case number two. You want to pick up at that point? Okay. Mr. Chairman, the next case also involves former Los Angeles Investigation Division Chief Ronald Sarano. The matter is totally, a totally separate one from the one I just described involving the Marcianos, Nakashas, and Jeff Bobat. This situation occurred in 1986 and relates to Mr. Sarano's improper interference in a criminal tax enforcement action by the Justice Department Strike Force in Los Angeles against a former IRS employee. <clears throat> The former IRS employee was being represented 
by an attorney who was married to a friend of Sarano, who he, Sarano, played tennis with on a regular basis. On two separate occasions, Sarano attempted to influence the case by asking whether or not the felony charges against the attorney's client could be reduced. Sarano first questioned one of his own agents, who was assigned to the strike force on this particular investigation. This agent told us that on March 19, 1986, Sarano told him that he plays tennis with this attorney's husband every Saturday. Sarano also told the agent that they should go easy on the IRS employee. The agent said he was very troubled with Sarano's statements, so he immediately contacted his group manager and branch chief to discuss Sarano's approach. The agent was counseled by his group manager and branch chief to wait and see if Sarano goes to Rudnick. Mr. Rudnick, Marvin Rudnick was a strike force attorney involved in this, and Mr. Rudnick will testify this afternoon after we've completed. If that happened, then the three would go to internal security and demand an internal investigation of Sarano. Within weeks, and actually we just found out today, within one week to the day, and ironically the same day that Mr. Sarano said he was offered the job by the Marcianos, uh, Sarano asked to see Rudnick. Marvin Rudnick in an interview with the subcommittee staff said that at this meeting with Sarano and the group manager, Sarano asked Rudnick if there was any way to pursue lesser charges against the IRS employee under investigation. Rudnick told us that Sarano explained to him he was a good friend and tennis partner of the husband of the attorney representing the IRS employee. Rudnick said he was shocked by Sarano's request and the reason for it. Rudnick said he refused to discuss any reduction in charges. Rudnick said he went back to his office and immediately reported the incident to his boss, then chief of the Los Angeles Strike Force, Ted Gale. Nothing happened with regard to this matter for over one year. Apparently, Mr. Rudnick believed the Strike Force chief had dealt with the situation, and the IRS agent had no idea that Sarano had gone to Rudnick. It wasn't until September of 1987 when Rudnick received what he believed was an inadequate IRS prosecutive report on the IRS employee that the issue surfaced again. At this point, Rudnick explained the March meeting with Sarano to the internal security staff. One of those internal security staff people will be testifying here tomorrow. These internal security staffers reported the Sarano-Rudnick incident and their regional supervisor, to, region, to their regional supervisor, Mike Bick, in San Francisco sometime in September 1987. Mr. Bick was not very interested in investigating Mr. Sarano at this time. If you remember, Mr. Chairman, it was Mr. Bick, among others, who at the same point in time was trying to shut down the internal investigation of Sarano's criminal investigation division with regard to the guest Jordash matter. After a review of internal IRS documents, we found that this matter wasn't fully considered until October 22, 1987, when the IRS agent who Sarano first approached in March of 86 submitted an affidavit to Internal Security after Rudnick told him about his, Rudnick's, meeting with Sarano. An internal investigation was performed. After reviewing the investigative report and performing some investigative work ourselves, it was clear that the IRS agent and Mr. Rudnick both agreed that Sarano's requests were troubling and improper. Both agreed that Sarano was trying to do a favor for a tennis friend's wife and that the motive was personal and not professional. The opinions of Mr. Rudnick and the IRS agent were downplayed in the internal investigation report summary, which we have a copy of and we will make available to any members of the subcommittee that, that would like to read it. The report summary does, however, contain a number of gratuitous and self-serving comments by Mr. Sarano himself, some of which we have checked into and found to be false. For example, Mr. Sarano said he played, and this is a quote, played tennis on two or three occasions in the past three or four years with the husband of the defendant's attorney. We interviewed the defendant's attorney ourselves and was told Sarano, her husband, and a few others were participants in a group that met every weekend in Beverly Hills to play tennis. From reading the report summary and the interview write-ups, we believe that every effort was made to downplay the possibility of any wrongdoing by Mr. Sarano in the investigative report. The information from this investigation was packaged with the remainder of the Sarano investigation and sent to the U.S. Attorney in Los Angeles. In our opinion, what was referred to the U.S. Attorney on this matter by IRS internal security management was similar to what was referred on the other matter involving Sarano's relationship with the Marcianos, namely an incomplete investigative report that did not present a true and balanced picture of events as they occurred. 
I now like to go to the third California case. Mr. Chairman, whenever you conduct an investigation as extensive as ours, you stumble onto things that you were not looking for or were not even aware of. Such was the case when we were in California this past February. While interviewing the attorney, who was the wife of Ron Sarano's tennis friend, who I just discussed, we heard an amazing and, quite frankly, an unbelievable story. After following up on the matter, we found out it is truly an amazing story. The attorney explained how she and her husband played tennis every weekend with a group of people who included Ron Sarano and an attorney named Richard Tratner, who also happened to be a former IRS employee in Los Angeles. The attorney described how Mr. Tratner and Mr. Sarano had set up a special system whereby clients of Mr. Tratner, who were tax evaders, could, take tax, could make tax payments to IRS without revealing their identity. The taxpayers would remain anonymous but if the individual was ever investigated or audited by IRS, somehow Mr. Trantner could verify that this person made a tax payment on a prior date and thus avoid criminal prosecution. What she, would, what she was describing appeared to be some type of amnesty program for Mr. Trantner's clients. Interestingly, Mr. Chairman, Ron Sarano is currently represented by Mr. Trantner. We know this because it was Mr. Trantner who told the subcommittee staff director and prepared a letter to you stating that Mr. Sarano would exercise his constitutional right against self-incrimination if subpoenaed to testify today. To our amazement, while still in California on the trip, we were told by Los Angeles IRS, IRS officials that Mr. Trantner was involved with something very similar, in fact almost identical, to what was explained to us by this attorney. IRS management told us for at least six years, and uh, this is LA management, told us for at least six years and maybe longer, Mr. Trantner has sent letters to IRS with checks attached. With the payments, Trantner would attach a key to a bank. ever investigated or audited by IRS, the fact that a payment was made and tax return placed in a safety deposit box on a certain date would have some effect on the person's culpability. IRS representatives in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. also told us Mr. Sarano was never personally involved with processing Trantner's letters. No one in Los Angeles seemed to know, however, that it was Mr. Sarano who apparently arranged this, this entire scheme with Mr. Trantner. We received a formal written response from IRS headquarters which provides detail on the safety deposit box scheme of Mr. Trantner's. What IRS has told us is quite disturbing. The situation in Los Angeles involving Mr. Trantner is the only one of its kind in the entire United States. The payment scheme was never officially approved by anyone at IRS's national office in Washington, D.C. We know, however, from our own investigative work that Mr. Sarano may have, been perso may have personally provided the unofficial approval of, or blessing to Mr. Trantner. Mr. Tr Mr. Chairman, what is, what is most disturbing is that the IRS in their written response says Mr. Trantner's scheme, and, and this is a quote, might have an effect on the willingness of the Department of Justice to prosecute one of Trantner's clients since it would be more difficult to get a conviction if the full tax were paid. In other words, this scheme of Mr. Trantner's may be, pro may be providing his clients admitted tax evaders with certain protections that we do not believe they are entitled to. Mr. Chairman, the fact that Mr. Sarano was involved in this scheme which we now learn could provide protection against criminal tax prosecution for clients of a personal friend of his is very, very disturbing. IRS itself has a long-standing position of being opposed to the tax amnesty concept. Furthermore, the fact that we learned about the scheme during an interview with a private attorney on an entirely different matter is also disturbing. The reason why IRS headquarters, national office, still hasn't learned about Mr. Sarano's involvement in this scheme is that they never interviewed the attorney involved in a Sarano Rudnick matter like we did. If IRS routinely conducted more thorough investigations on matters involving senior officials, they would learn things that now go unidentified. How many more personal amnesty programs are out there? How many other situations or schemes exist in IRS's 63 district offices that haven't been approved by national office? Since this type of behavior does not get routinely reported, it is imperative that when internal security does investigate top management, it does so thoroughly, completely, and timely. An investigation of a senior manager just for the sake of performing the investigation in response to publicity means very little. Unless the investigation is of sufficient depth, 
and is complete, thorough, and covers all that it should to get to the truth. That is the issue we must stress and resolve by these hearings. Let me ask you a couple of questions with regards to this one. Uh, number one, when did the IRS management learn of this so-called scheme? Which management? Uh, L.A. Or, or national office? Washington National. I think when we brought it to their attention after we came back from California. It's been had, going on for 10 years. Had it been used extensively uh, in California or just one time? No. How many letters were there? Uh, maybe two, three dozen letters. Two, three dozen letters involving two, three dozen different clients of Mr. Tratton. And Tratner's. all of those was Mr. Tratton's uh, Absolutely. Uh, clients. We have copies of all of the letters. And this was a scheme that the records will show was devised by Mr. Sarno? Well, based on our interview of the attorney who described who described the scheme in, in the utmost detail to us. And we, we heard this cold. This was an inter we were conducting an interview on a different issue, and she volunteered this to us cold. We knew nothing about it. And she, did, she described the scheme to us in, 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 in the utmost detail and said that Mr. Trantner and Mr. Uh, Sarano discussed this scheme regularly at these tennis gatherings, and, uh, that, and that's how she became aware of it. Now, that's the, that's the attorney who was the wife. That's the attorney who was the wife of Mr. Sarano's friend. But who, he but, went to Mr. But, but then, but then, I, I'm just a little confused okay. as to when did the uh, Los Angeles? Uh, when was this determined to be wrong? That's what I'm trying to say. Well, I think when we brought it to the attention of the national office. That's when they did. Uh, yeah, just within the last uh, two and months. And they and they had no no knowledge of this system before then. No, na national office did not. L.A. The L.A. District Office had a knowledge of it, sure, because they were allowing this to happen. Uh, L.A. Was, was kind of an island out there on and its own. And there was no effort made by Los Angeles to, to determine if this was a legitimate uh, uh, scheme, whether it was approved by management and so forth. Well, it was. It, it was a. It was approved by man. The district. The letters from Mr. Trantner and the payments went to the district director. The district director would then forward the letters to Mr. Sarano's division. Okay. Mr. Sarano's division would prepare a response. And there are copies of these letters and the correspondence in the, la in the last attachment to our statement. Uh, Mr. Sarano's division would prepare a response. And essentially, the response said, if your clients can meet these four or five criteria, and essentially those criteria were that his clients were not were not uh, criminally culpable. They were not. All right, was approval ever then asked of the national office for that arrangement? No, not that, not that we, we have determined. A national office, when they responded to our letter with our questions about this scheme, did never indicated that they knew about the scheme and never indicated that Mr. Sarano was involved in the scheme at all. Did the district director have any knowledge of this? Absolutely. The letters went to the district director and in Los Angeles. And he never found anything wrong with this arrangement? No. In fact, in the response from IRS, the district director at the time, Mr. Conant, said that he helped prepare the boilerplate responses to Mr. Trattner. In, uh, Mr. Schiff, do you have any questions at this point? No. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll go. I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Stanner. Thank you, Len. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I'm going to go over five cases with you that we've developed, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. I know that we've got many things to cover, but at the same time, we have some important information that we'd like to convey to the subcommittee. The subcommittee's next case involves a former assistant commissioner for criminal investigation, one of IRS's highest ranking officials, who engaged in several acts of misconduct. Initially, his wrongdoing consisted of improperly... Before you move forward, let's just look at the chart over here. Uh, he is a former assistant commissioner for criminal investigation. Yes, Mr. Chairman. If you look at the chart on the left, you'll see the commissioner's box is on the upper left-hand corner. He is the one to the immediate right. He is the assistant commissioner for criminal investigation. There are, I believe, at the time there may have been seven assistant commissioners. They're the, the, top, uh, the top officers so he reports in the IRS. directly to the commissioner. He reports, at, at the time he may have gone through an associate commissioner. Today they report directly to the commissioner's office, okay. which would include some deputy commissioners. 
Initially, his wrongdoing consisted of improperly using government travel funds to maintain a relationship with a female friend. <laughs> Inspection was notified about this abuse on at least three separate occasions by three different individuals, but declined to investigate the allegations and instead referred the matter to the Associate Commissioner for Operations. The Assistant Commissioner denied any wrongdoing and was advised by the Associate Commissioner to handle his travel arrangements appropriately. After this warning, he again abused official travel and also engaged in other wrongdoing involving the illegal removal of government property. The assistant commissioner, who retired in April 1988, would likely have gotten away with this wrongdoing had not a freelance journalist in May 1988 asked the assistant commissioner for inspection about allegations of misconduct. Only then, after knowing of the alleged misconduct for almost two years, did inspection open an investigation. Inspections investigations substantiated allegations relating to abuse of travel regulations, illegal removal of IRS training materials, and abuse of his government position to affect personal financial interests. The investigation also disclosed misconduct by the Assistant Commissioner's deputy, who became a partner in a post-retirement business venture. An investigation on him was also opened, and allegations of misconduct were also substantiated. Both cases are now with the Department of Justice for prosecutive decisions. I will now discuss the details of this matter. Well, let me ask you a question. How did they get to the Department of Justice? They were referred by the um, Assistant Commissioner for Inspection upon the completion of their investigations. Okay, continue. Right. In March 1986, Anthony Langone, the Southeast Assistant Regional Commissioner for Criminal Investigation, if you'll look to the chart on the left, your right, you'll see the Assistant Regional Commissioner for Criminal Investigation would report to the Regional Commissioner. There are seven Regional Commissioners in the IRS, so there's a, a sort of a branch off to the side. The direct line goes to the Regional Commissioner, then up to the Commissioner. There is a dotted line that follows from the Assistant Commissioner's office to the Assistant Regional Commissioner. He was appointed by the IRS Commissioner to be Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Criminal Investigation. About two weeks after he reported for duty in April 86, his immediate superior, the Assistant Commissioner for Criminal Investigation, became seriously ill. This turn of events left Langone in the position of Acting Assistant Commissioner. Within eight months, he was appointed by the IRS Commissioner as the Assistant Commissioner for Criminal Investigation, effective February 4, 1987. According to CID secretaries, soon after reporting to Washington, Langone began to receive one or more phone calls each day in his office from his female friend. When questioned by the secretaries as to the identity of this individual, Langone replied that she was his stockbroker. The secretaries were skeptical of this explanation because of the frequency of the calls and his inquiry about how he might get incoming calls to ring only at his desk. Also from the start, the secretaries noticed that Langone planned his official travel itinerary such that he was routed to or through Atlanta, Georgia for extended stopovers. Going to page 59 now. Uh, let me ask you a question. All right. When was this case referred to the Department of Ju uh, Justice? This case was referred to the Department of Justice in, I believe it was October 1988. So in other words, it was uh, referred after this investigation had begun. Yeah, that, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. From April through September 1986, Langone made six trips on official travel to or through Atlanta. Two of these trips were clearly for official business purposes, and one trip had a personal aspect, and the government was reimbursed by Langone for the additional costs involved. However, the other three trips were later determined to have been for personal reasons, but the airfare was vouchered to the government. Given the daily phone calls to his office, and given that Langone did not request hotel accommodations or a rental car for his trips to Atlanta, the secretaries who were responsible for preparing the travel vouchers suspected that the trips were being taken for personal reasons. On September 9, 1986, Langone's secretary reported the abuse of travel to and through Atlanta directly to the assistant commissioner for inspection. The secretary indicated that since she was responsible for preparing his travel vouchers, she did not want to be held accountable in any way for questions that could arise from them. The secretary told us that the assistant commissioner for inspection did not promise to take any particular action, but instructed her to make a note to the file indicating that she discussed with him her concerns about the frequent trips to and through Atlanta. The secretary prepared this note and signed it. 
Shortly after this meeting, the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection discussed the abuse of travel allegation with his Director for Internal Security. Both men agreed that no further investigation into the matter was warranted. No travel vouchers were examined to determine the truth or the falsity of the Secretary's allegation. In November 1986, the second notice about Langone's abuse of travels came to inspection. A senior technical advisor, who I might add will be with us tomorrow, uh, telephoned the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection to relay his concerns about the abusive, circuitous travel routes Langone took to see his friend. The technical advisor feared that Langone would be permanently appointed as the Assistant Commissioner, which could later prove to be an embarrassment to the IRS Commissioner. Once again, inspection did not examine any travel vouchers to verify the truth or falsity of the allegation. The third notice about Langone's abuse of travels came to the Indianapolis Inspection Office on April 23, 1987. An anonymous mail caller from the Southeast region made several allegations against Langone, that he had a girlfriend who worked in the Atlanta Service Center, that they used the FTS telephone lines to communicate with each other, that he manufactured reasons to make unnecessary trips to and through Atlanta to see her, and that the girlfriend sometimes accompanied him on other trips. The caller also alleged that the Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Criminal Investigation, Joseph Pagani, was also making personal trips to Atlanta at government expense. On May 6, 1987, about two weeks after the anonymous call was made, the Acting Central Regional Inspector sent a memo to the Director for Internal Security outlining the allegations made by the anonymous caller. After the memo was received by Inspection Branch in Washington, the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection consulted with the Senior Deputy Commissioner and other high-ranking IRS officials on how this matter should be handled by inspection. The joint decision that emerged from the various discussions was to handle this matter administratively. That is, no investigation would be opened and the matter would be referred to the Acting Associate Commissioner for Operations. This would have been Langone's immediate superior and that person would evaluate it and take appropriate action. For the third time, no one in inspection examined travel vouchers to determine the truth or falsity of the allegations. By this time, Anthony Langone had made 18 trips to or through Atlanta. Only five of these trips were solely for official business purposes, and Langone reimbursed the government for any additional cost for airfare on the four other trips. The remaining nine trips were later determined by IRS to be made for personal reasons, but Langone vouchered the airfare to the government. For his part, Pagani had made one personal trip to Hartford, Connecticut, which he vouchered to the government. On July 1, 1987, the Acting Associate Commissioner for Operations met separately with Langone and Pagani to discuss the allegations of abusive travel. The Acting Associate Commissioner told us he did not examine any travel vouchers prior to this meeting because he assumed an inspection had done so and found no criminal wrongdoing. Langone denied making any unnecessary trips to or through Atlanta and said that any personal trips are made at his own expense. Pagani also denied any travel abuses. The acting associate commissioner gave Langone and Pagani no sanction or reprimand and advised them that their travels were under scrutiny and that any personal trips were be to be handled appropriately. After being warned about inappropriate travel by the acting associate commissioner, Langone took several trips on official business that were later determined to be abuses and violations of travel regulations. For example, he traveled to Atlanta for personal reasons and vouchered $254 in airfare to the government. As a second example, Langone on Saturday, Saturday February 13, 1988, traveled to San Juan, Puerto Rico on official travel as an extension of a business trip to Los Angeles. He stayed over Sunday. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> he did what now? He flew to L from Washington to L.A. via Puerto Rico. That's a new record, isn't it? Well, it is. It's not the most direct route, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. He stayed over Sunday, Monday, which was a holiday. He took one day annual leave on Tuesday and flew to Los Angeles on Wednesday. He did not claim per diem expenses on this extension. But he uh, also did not reimburse the government for the additional $294 airfare expense incurred as a result of his extended travel itinerary. Interestingly, his female friend was on official travel to Puerto Rico at the same time. After the acting associate commissioner's warning, Pagani made one trip to...
might be worth looking at. <laughs> hey, Mr. Pagani made one trip to Hartford, Connecticut as an extension of an official business trip to New York and vouchered the additional airfare to the government. In 1987, Langone and Pagani were planning to go into a post-retirement business partnership with the CID chiefs in Newark, Dallas, and Los Angeles, which would be Mr. Sereno. Their plan was to operate a financial investigative firm which would investigate certain types of financial dealings on behalf of their clients. After the acting associates commissioner's warning, Langone and Pagani became involved in several other acts of wrongdoing which appeared to have been taken to enhance their post-retirement business. The first involved a campaign to get their names to the public before their retirement. In June 1987, CID created a program analyst position. Langone and Pagani directed this analyst to see how many magazines and newsletters would publish stories about themselves. <laughs> Subsequently, he directed, the, he directed the analyst to prepare a video about CID for the general public and directed that he would personally appear in the opening and closing segments. And shortly before his retirement, Langone directed his staff to type and mail letters to committee chairman of the American Bar Association and federal law enforcement agencies announcing his retirement and future plans. These letters were typed on CID letterhead and mailed with government postage. The second action relating to the post-retirement business involved Langone's and Pagani's removal of CID training materials upon retirement for use in the business. Lang was, was it letter clear by counsel? I'm sorry? The letter, was it clear by counsel? Uh, I don't believe so. I believe this was a... Um, and this that was, is a clear violation? This is a clear violation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Langone removed from IRS a 35 millimeter slide presentation on the Department of Justice Asset Forfeiture Fund that was prepared by CID staff. Pagani removed from IRS a copyrighted videotape recognizing laundering schemes that was purchased by CID for instruction on money laundering schemes. Both items were used during seminars conducted by the private financial investigation business. The tape was returned to IRS on July 27, 1988, and the slides were returned on August 6, 1988, after official inquiries by a CID official. Pagani was also involved in another unauthorized removal of CID training materials. In September 1987, he traveled to the CID training center at Glencoe, Georgia, with Los Angeles CID chief Ron Sereno, who was also under investigation for wrongdoing at this time, to review CID special training materials. Thousands of pages of training materials were reproduced, boxed, and mailed to Pagani in Washington. This was done outside the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act, and the government was not reimbursed for the $468 in related expenses. These materials disappeared when Pagani retired in March 88. The third action relating to the possible enhancement of the post-retirement business involves a training course conducted by a media consultant that was attended by only the four future partners, Langone, Pagani, Sereno, and the Newark CID chief, within weeks of their retirement. This training course, presented by Susan Peterson Productions, was a one-day session titled Dynamics of Communications. The course is designed to familiarize and acclimate course participants with on-camera and other media techniques. It was taught by two instructors who were assisted by one camera operator and various pieces of video equipment. This media training for the future business partners cost the government $2,850. The gentleman, second. Can I go back and just get the cast of characters? It was, who were the main, the, the two people? From? There was uh, Anthony Langone, who was the assistant commissioner for criminal investigation, his deputy, Joseph Pagani. And? There was Ron Sereno. Sereno is the same character now we've talked about in Los Angeles. You heard of, and there was a, uh, the fourth person who attended this class was a man named Robert Roach, who was CID chief in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And as I understand it, he um, was under investigation for improperly using IRS summons authority for personal, for personal So reasons. we begin to see a whole pattern. I mean, that's the key. Well, that's, that's the message we're trying to uh, convey to you, uh, Mr. Hastert, that uh, these aren't isolated incidents. There, seem to be, uh, there seems to be a pattern emerging here of senior executives doing these sorts of things and, and, and no one making them uh, All in the their CID actions. department, criminal investigation department. Well, there, there, are, there are others, but the, the eight cases we looked at involve CID and the Office of Inspections. I think when, uh, when you hear from other witnesses, you will see that uh, 
uh, it's not only these people who, who partake in this. Um, there are other departments in. But there's almost a, a business collusion outside of their r official realm. Uh, they're tied in. In this case, they were. These were former CID chiefs who grew up in the organization together, and they knew each other. And uh, here they are. They're pr they're planning to go into a business together. Upon How many time. CID chiefs are there in a the country? Uh, well, there are 63 districts, and I believe every district uh, has a chief. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stanley. I would presume, though, that with the with the office that these gentlemen held, that they would have been authorized within their within their authority to have set up this course and dynamics of communication, did that need any higher approval other than themselves? Well, you know, certainly these kinds of things would have to be approved. Uh, the paperwork I read indicated that uh, since, they had not author since they had not publicly announced their retirement plans, you know, put in the paperwork, mm -hmm. that um, at least some in IRS considered this as, as maybe not a violation. However, I would point out that Mr. Serrano, for sure, and, and I, I believe Langone and Pagani had made their retirement plans known to others, and therefore, even though their, their retirement was not publicly announced, it was known by the staff in CID that they would be retiring, and in fact, CID staff were very skeptical of this training course. Was it use unusual that just four participants participated in this program? Uh, well, obviously, in a course of this nature, you can't fill the room with uh, you know, 50 participants. I think the unusual thing about this course is, yes, the, the few number that, that participated and that these were four future business partners. Are you going to develop now what the IRS did when they learned of this? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Had it with, with the sure. chairman yield. But now these guys are, are, are the, the government, they, they didn't pay for it. The government paid for it, right? This, this was paid for by the federal government. And they had already given notice of retirement, or they were right, right in the brink of retirement? Well, they were within weeks of retirement. I, Sereno, I believe, had put his pay. This was in early February when this course um, was, was conducted, and he attended. And if you recall from Len's testimony this morning, that his case was over at the U.S. Attorney's Office at this time. So uh, the basic, these guys are, 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 are using government money to pursue a course of study under the auspices of the IRS for their own development, and they're right on the brink of retirement. That's what the information indicates. Le and, and let me ask you one more question uh, that, that relates to this. Uh, many IRS manuals to do something like this, you would go ahead and, and get executive approval. Are these senior enough executives that they could approve this on their own? Well, I believe they would have needed some sort of, um, you know, approval through an administrative office. But being that they were at this level, I wouldn't think that they would have too much problem uh, uh, getting a course like this uh, approved. Fine. Thank you. I would also mention that the, the fee that was charged for this course, $2,850, was not a, uh, a fee that was charged on an individual by individual basis. If there would have been five, if there would have been six, if there would have been two, it still would have been the same price. All right. Thank you. Okay, had it not been for a freelance journalist, uh, Langona Pagani would never have been called to account for their misconduct. On May 27, 1988, almost two months after Langone retired and three months after Pagani retired, the freelance journalist interviewed the assistant commissioner for inspection and the assistant to the commissioner for public affairs in connection with a book he is writing about the IRS. During this interview, the journalist alleged that Langone removed IRS training materials upon retirement and used government resources for personal benefit. Inspection opened an investigation of Langone on June 2nd. Early in the investigation, a CID special agent brought 11 additional allegations against Langone, including allegations involving abusive travel and taking official actions to affect his own personal financial interest. This investigation substantiated the allegations relating to the removal of training materials and other violations. It also found that Langone violated travel regulations in the amount of about $2,000. The report of investigation was forwarded to the Department of Justice on October 14, 1988, and the, office, the Justice Office of Professional Integrity is now considering action on this matter. But the point you're making, though, is that the activity of the IRS only developed uh, after the freelance uh, writer brought it to their attention. Absolutely. Uh, there were. Well, let me put it this way to you, Mr. Chairman. Three different individuals on three different occasions reported the abuse of travel directly to inspection. Nothing was done. Not even one voucher was pulled to see if it was true. 
and, and basically Langone and Pagani were given warnings. That continued and other misconduct came up. And that was not investigated until after they retired and only after, uh, you might say, a, a non-IRS or an outsider brought it to their attention. Right. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Schiff. Uh, Mr. Stan, I just wanted to ask, what is the status of this matter, to the best of your knowledge, at the Department of Justice? As of this week, it is still under consideration. Uh, to the be best of your knowledge, I think you stated a date. How long has the, in view of the fact that the allegations could, if provable, be criminal in nature, uh, how long has the Department of Justice had this? Well, the Department of Justice uh, received the Langone report on October 14th, so that would be nine months, and they received uh, the Pagani report in January, so that would be seven months. So it's or six or seven months. It's been a while since been a they've while had since they've gotten it too. Yes, it is, Mr. Schiff. In other words, we have not heard from the public integrity. Uh... They have not taken final action on the matter. It, it, our best information is is that these cases are still under consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please continue. All right. A, a reflection on this matter discloses a number of disturbing aspects, notwithstanding the obvious misconduct on the part of Langone and Pagani. The first aspect is the reluctance of inspection to aggressively pursue allegations against these senior officials. As I just mentioned, three different individuals who were in a position to know made similar allegations against Langone on three separate occasions, but neither inspection nor the acting associate commissioner made the effort to examine his travel vouchers to determine the truth or falsity of the allegations. A second disturbing aspect is the reluctance of lower graded employees to bring allegations against their superiors. The CID secretary and the senior technical advisor should be commended for having the courage to report wrongdoing by their boss. Another individual reported uh, wrongdoing anonymously, apparently out of a fear of reprisals or retaliation. Again, no action was taken by inspection. Others in CID were aware of wrongdoing by the former associate commissioner, as evidenced by the numerous allegations identified by a national office special agent at the start of the June 1988 investigation. The third disturbing aspect is the apparent lack of independence of the assistant commissioner for inspection. After the anonymous allegation came up to Washington via Indianapolis, the assistant commissioner consulted with the senior deputy commissioner and other high-ranking officials on how to handle the matter. According to the former assistant commissioner, the decision to handle the matter administratively was jointly made. Such joint decisions are not indicative of a tough and thorough and independent inspection service. A persuasive argument can be made that had the assistant commissioner for inspection made an independent decision to open an investigation into the abusive travel allegations, Langone and Pagani might have realized that misconduct by senior officials is scrutinized and punished at the IRS and thus might have deterred them from further acts of misconduct. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stanner, how many more of, of these uh, cases are we going to be de dealing with this afternoon? Well, there are, there are four more. Actually, uh, two of the four cases involves the central region. There's a very short case which uh, I might add, we just got some, some new information yesterday on, and there is a very important whistleblower case that I'd like to, to spend some time on. Well, I was thinking uh, it's 2, uh, tw uh, two ten at the present time. Uh, we have another witness this afternoon, Mr. Rudnick, uh, and you have covered Mr. Rudnick's case uh, up to this point, right? Yes. I'm just wondering if it would probably be uh, appropriate to maybe interrupt your review at this point, hear Mr. Rudnick, and then go back in with this case uh, after Mr. Rudnick. Uh, I, I think just up. Well, yeah, but it's going to take them another two hours to finish. No, I would tell them to finish by three o'clock. How long would it take you to finish all the remaining cases? Well, Mr. Chairman, if, if you like, I can, uh, I can try to be finished by three o'clock. Well, let's try to do that then. Okay. Now, in doing that, I'm going to be um, well, I, skipping I, I, over some things that are see, in the record. The things, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you think? In other words, my feeling is that if we could do Mr. Rudnick's now, then we would have more time to let them go into greater detail with, with that. Well, they got about 40 pages. Yeah. I think we want to We need not go through all 40 pages. And then we'd want to ask questions. Much of that is... Uh, you have a witness ready. I do. Well, you're right. There's 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 yeah, I, I, I'm... My judgment will prevail. Uh, we will, at this time, we will suspend this particular part of the testimony, return it back immediately, 
And at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Rudnick if he will. Uh, yes. Is there a tendency here to, to just all of these people engage in a conspiracy of some type? Uh, of course, it's. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Bustamante, I, I, I did not discover evidence of a, a conspiracy between all of the people that we will, we will talk to today, or talk about today, but there are some patterns that evolve, and, and particularly in these cases where you have CID officials who grew up in the organization together and uh, form a post-retirement business. Uh, you can make the argument that they're friends, and we all have friends, and we, we like to be with our friends, perhaps even in post-retirement business ventures. The point here is, is that we don't think that uh, government funds should be used to promote that. Well, before we make the final decision, do you have any problems with that arrangement? No, Mr. Chairman. All right. Well, let's, uh, we, we can go, let's recess for 10 minutes. Uh, and at the, when we come back, if Mr. Rudnick would agree to, uh, to appear, and then we will uh, continue. The subcommittee will come to order. As we uh, indicated uh, just before we recessed, Temporarily, we will suspend the testimony of investigators, and now we will uh, hear the testimony of Mr. Uh, Marvin Rudnick. Mr. Rudnick, uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so after God? I do. Have a seat. Thank you. Mr. Rudnick, we want to thank you very much for, your, for coming to be with us today. Uh, I understand that the incident that you will be testifying on today was brought to the attention of the subcommittee by the office of Mr. Horton. Uh, Mr. Horton is the ranking minority member of the full government operations committee and an outstanding member of Congress as well. I'm advised also that whenever they mention your name to anyone in response, it is always that you have man of honesty and a man of integrity, and I compliment you. And that is the type of witness that we welcome to this hearing today. Mr. Rudnick, at this point, we would be happy to hear your testimony. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I think we have just Mr. Chairman here at the moment. Well, I'm Mr. Bustamante is on the telephone. Thank you. He's calling in his responses. Thank you for those kind remarks. I've been a strike force attorney since 1980, and before that, an assistant United States attorney in Tampa, Florida. Before that, I had worked for the state attorney's office as a prosecutor, and before that, the state legislature of Florida as an investigator and attorney doing political corruption investigations. So since 1973, I've been around investigations and prosecutions continuously. I'm now a, a former prosecutor and in private uh, practice in Los Angeles. The matter that I believe I'm here to testify about uh, took several years to develop, but to get to the meat of the coconut, as we say in court, on March 26, 1986, at 2 p.m., I'm reading from a memorandum that I prepared in my own handwriting, my own handwriting, I should say, on that day, I was called by Al Lipkin, who is in charge of organized crime investigations in Los Angeles. And he is the contact person that the strike force relies on, on all IRS matters involving organized crime investigations and prosecutions. I've known Al Lipkin for what must be almost 10 years now, as I've known Ron Sereno for almost 10 years. I did not have daily contact. In fact, I had very little contact with Ron Sereno except for this incident and a couple others that I uh, can recall, one of which I'll testify to today. But Mr. Lipkin and I talked fairly regularly over those, ten year, over those 10 years. The case that Mr. Lipkin, well, let me give you the scene first. Lipkin comes to my office at the Strike Force, which is in the federal building in downtown Los Angeles. Lipkin's office is next to Sereno's office, or nearby there, on the fifth floor above me. Lipkin would normally come down and talk to me in my office because that's basically where we conduct our investigations on behalf of the Justice Department. He came to me and said that Ron Sereno wanted to talk to me that day. And I asked him about what, and he said about Mr. A. Now I'm using Mr. A at the request of your staff 
because they do not want me to identify the particular person. I'll try to do my best, and I will do everything I can to avoid uh, disclosing these names pursuant to your staff's request. But as far as I'm concerned, Mr. A is public record in the courts in Central District of California, so it'd be up to your staff to decide what to do with the information. I'm being cautious only because of the concern that I believe my former employers, the U.S. Department of Justice and the Internal Revenue Service, have had about disclosures under 6103, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by now, uh, from these hearings at least, that preclude us from being able to make such disclosures about tax information. Mr. Rudnick, let me just say at this point, we have and still do respect 6103 very much. We have no problem with 6103 when, as far as its purpose was concerned. Our whole problem has been how, uh, how 6103 has been, in the words of one person, it has been the moat uh, behind which uh, we have tr there has been an effort to hide a wrongdoing and hide the identification of wrongdoing. So we respect the fact is that you're sensitive to 6103, and, and, and I just want to let you know and be comfortable with the fact that we are as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, should, for the record, should note that as a trial lawyer, I'm also very sensitive about losing my career over a slip-up. And uh, I'm do the best I can under the circumstances to try to ferret out the public record from the the non-public record and do the best I can to testify. Now, at the time that this, this visit from Mr. Sarno was established with you, you were, at that time, a uh, U.S. I was a special attorney with the organized crime and racketeering section of the United States Department of Justice. Okay, fine. Translated, that means that I'm a federal prosecutor specializing in organized crime. I just want to identify that you are not with the IRS. I am not with the IRS, okay. but I will point out that for many years I worked very closely with the IRS, and mo most of my organized crime prosecutorial career was associated with, or with IRS cases. So my background, for example, is mostly in the criminal tax area as well as the racketeering laws. The day that Mr. Lipkin came into my office, he had asked that I meet with Mr. Sereno. Now, Mr. Sereno and I rarely meet, as I pointed out, and uh, I knew it must be important if he wanted to meet, uh, but he wanted to meet in his office, and he wanted to meet about Mr. A. Now, to describe who Mr. A is, Mr. A is a, an IRS revenue agent who is a group manager in one of the district offices in the Los Angeles district. I guess it'd be a sub-office of the Los Angeles district. Mr. A's main job is to review people's tax returns and make decisions on a daily basis of whether they were properly filed. I came in contact with Mr. A when doing an investigation about a Mr. M. Now, I realize this is complicated and I'll do the best I can Mr. M is an organized crime figure from Boston who had been released from prison in the East and came to Los Angeles to do what they call the loan shark scam. And you can just put quotes around that. That's basically what they call it. Danny M, we'll call him if I can keep it straight, uh, main job in life is to fleece people of their money and use muscle to protect themselves when they want their money back. Danny M. did a scam on the streets of Los Angeles along the Ventura Boulevard corridor, which is kind of the main uh, street of the valley, the San Fernando Valley. By the time he was done, he took about anywhere between three to six million dollars off unsuspecting business people, and he did it by promising them that if, he gave, if they gave him cash, he would give them a high percent of interest as a return, but with a wink, he, chose, he told them, don't report it to the IRS because I'll give you cash. That way you can collect your interest in cash and you won't have to report it and we've got ourselves a nice deal. The problem is that Danny M chose never to uh, report it himself and of course, and never intended to repay back the monies to the, to the victims. Now these are not uh, victims who I would say are uh, 
are the poor and the downtrodden. These are the, more the wealthy type people who got fleeced. And these people are, uh, were formidable witnesses and key witnesses in my case. Well, I put the case together over the years 1985 and 1986. During the course of that case, I reviewed the tax returns of Danny M and found that a Mr. T, we'll call him, for tax preparer, Mr. T signed the tax return. We interviewed Mr. T and he said, I didn't, don't have the work papers on this tax return. And of course, it's important to us to be able to get those work papers because that's what we rely on to be able to prosecute Danny M for his tax evasion on the income he made from the, what we now should call the Ponzi scheme. When we found out that Mr. T did not, well, although signed the return, did not prepare the return, I asked, we asked who prepared the return, and they said Mr. A, back to Mr. A. Mr. A, and I said, who is he? Mr. A is a, an IRS agent. And I said, what is an IRS agent doing preparing the fraudulent returns of a mafioso? And that, in that is the story that led me to this committee hearing today. I met with Mr. A, who essentially copped out to what he had done and gave me not a lot of information other than the fact that he had done it and that uh, I knew that there was more to the story than what he had said. I asked inspection, which is internal affairs to almost everybody but the IRS, as I understand it. I asked inspection to come in and investigate, and Mr. Cassis was assigned, to my knowledge, at the time in uh, March of 86. It was very important to us to go forward with the prosecution of Mr. A, the IRS agent, not just because he's an IRS agent, but because in a prosecution of Danny M, it's very important that we don't have a defense or face a defense that Danny M can claim that his tax returns were prepared by an IRS agent. Therefore, why are you prosecuting me? And he would theoretically rely on the corrupt activities of the IRS agent, but that would be no help for me in trial. Because when a jury faces you and they find out that the tax return was prepared by an IRS agent, you're just not gonna convict Danny M the mobster. So that was my problem. And that became a big problem in that case. But not a problem that's insurmountable. The way you handle it, you prosecute Mr. A, you convict Mr. A, you put him on the stand, and you have him testify about the fact that he's been convicted of a crime, that is, a cr the false tax return, and that he uh, did it at the direction of the defendant, not just on his own. And Who that brought the action against Mr. A? I prepared the action, recommended that he be prosecuted. It was approved by the tax division and about a year and a half later, and he eventually was prosecuted and convicted. Who investigated and brought that case to your attention? That was done by the, 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 uh, in conjunction with the CID in Los Angeles. And that's the uh, Criminal Investigation Division. The case agent on the case was a Mr. Restucia, who uh, has a long history of, uh, to my knowledge, doing good work in the CID offices. Was, this under, was that CID office under the uh, supervision of uh, Mr. Sarno? It was. Mr. Sarno was the chief of that division. I see. Between uh, Mr. Sarno and Mr. Restucia was Mr. Lipkin. So the way it would go is Mr. Restucia would, would work with me on a daily basis putting the case together. Mr. Lipkin would, would be his boss. There would be a, another branch manager between Mr. Lipkin and Mr. Serrano, and then there'd be Mr. Serrano. So there was some distance between the, the fellow who investigated it, brought it to your attention, and the top man, which at that time was Mr. Serrano. That's correct. Okay. We had no reason to believe that Mr. Serrano knew anything about the matter until the day in question which, uh, which is when he came to your office. When Mr. Lipkin arrived at my office. Okay. That was March 26, 1986 at 2 p.m. Now with Mr. A in a position where he is facing a federal criminal case, his career was essentially in ruins. He had resigned, by the way, by the end of the month. And with a major organized crime case looming in the future with an IRS agent as our key witness, and with the problem that there's going to be a very strong defense put up that the IRS agent uh, gave uh, possibly legitimate advice to the mafia guy, 
Our only choice was to prosecute Mr. A. So that day, Mr. A was essentially our next target of our investigation. Mr. Lipton came into my office and said that Mr. Serino wanted to talk to me regarding Mr. A. I didn't know what it was about. I just went up with uh, Mr. Lipkin and I met with Mr. Serino. Mr. Serino told me there were just three of us in the room, Mr. Serino, myself, and Mr. Lipkin. Mr. Serino told me that he was a friend of Pat Wilkerson. Uh, I should say he was a friend of Pat Wilkerson's husband. Now, Pat Wilkerson is Mr. was Mr. A's attorney, a woman attorney. She was a former assistant United States attorney in our district. She was now representing Mr. A after he met with us and needed counsel. We had informed him of his rights uh, by that time, although we did not know he would be a target the day we met him. I then, uh, he then said to me, he started the conversation, he said, by the way, I'm reading from a, the memo I may have mentioned before in my own handwriting. Which so, was written in 86. Which was written that same moment after I got back to my office when you hear what happened during the course of the memo. Yes. It was the same day that Serena got an offer from Guess, the Guess Company also. It was a pretty eventful day. Yeah, th I can't talk about that, but I can tell you that the meeting I had with him was on March 26, at 1986 same at day. 2 p.m. And this was written immediately on that day, probably about 3 or 3.30. I dated the time of the meeting, not the time I wrote the memo. Mr. Serino said that he wanted to know what we were going to do re Mr. A. I said if Mr. A pleads to a felony, tells the truth, and swears that he did not assist anybody to do criminal acts or favors while in the IRS, in 1982 to present, we could end it all right now. Now I said this because I wanted to be sure that there weren't any other problems. Now at the time I did not know, I learned later that a witness had come up to me and told me that Danny M had bragged about town that he had an IRS agent on his, uh, in his, uh, what do you call it? Uh, hip pocket. Hip pocket. I don't think those were his words, but that's basically what he was bragging about. We never could tell whether Mr. A was that person, but there was no other IRS agent that was connected to the case uh, at that level other than Mr. A. So Mr. Uh, I told Mr. Serino that we're just not going to, we're going to do a felony because uh, uh, unless he, he gives us everything he has, we're just not going to be able to, uh, to do anything less than that. Uh, I said we needed Mr. A to testify against Danny M, and having him plead to the false return would assist our case. Serrano told me at that time, what about a misdemeanor? And I remember this independent of my memo. I, I just couldn't believe my ears hearing that, that he would want a misdemeanor on somebody this significant to the rest of our case. I said, no way. We're looking like we're giving him a break. What if he makes big bucks from this? We'll never know if he goes down too easy. Serrano said that Mr. A was a sad story. I agreed. Now, I should point out that, that my memo doesn't say this, but I remember independently of that, and I must not have thought it was important at the time to put down, but I just want to make a record of it, was that at the time I met with Mr. Serrano at first, he described Pat Wilkerson's husband as a tennis friend. That wasn't as significant to me at the time uh, as when I was interviewed by your staff, which, when I did not have a copy of the memo before me. And then um, the memo goes on, uh, basically, I, he, Serrano said it was a sad story. I agreed it's a sad story. It's a sad story any time an, an IRS agent goes bad, in my view. And I can assure you that the experience I've had in all my years in government are that the, 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 the lying IRS agents that are doing the daily work, at least the war ones that have worked around me, in my experience, have been absolutely dedicated, honest people. 
and that's the truth. But that doesn't mean we don't have incidents, and apparently the committee has found uh, substantial evidence uh, that, ver that worries me terribly. But the truth of the matter is, is that for the most part, most of these agents are going to collect their paycheck, do the right job, and follow orders from above. And if the people from above aren't straight, then we all have problems. And Sereno then, getting back to the meeting I had with him, I told him that Mr. A also prepared a false return for another person, not just Danny M. The other person was a co-conspirator of Danny M. So I was concerned that if he prepared more than one corrupt tax return, I don't want him going down on a misdemeanor because I may need him for more than one case. And uh, then we go into some di discussions that I'm advised would not be something the committee uh, would be relevant to this matter. I'd be more than happy to let the committee staff uh, advise or have uh, Justice Department counsel available to advise. At that time, Sereno dropped the matter and uh, he saw me, and my demeanor that day was that I was pretty strong in favor of prosecuting Danny M. and Mr. A. But I think you'll, your committee will find that that's been my, uh, my demeanor on most cases. I mean, my job is to do my job, and my superior's job is to make those other decisions. Now, what happened after that, uh, I went downstairs from the fifth floor back to the second floor, went immediately into my boss's office, the chief of the strike force is Ted Gale at the time, who's now still with government. But uh, I told Mr. Gale about it. I was very concerned about what had happened. This isn't, doesn't happen often. Mr. Gale um, uh, was an honorable, we call straight guy, told him the truth. And uh, I did a lot of pacing back and forth in front of him. I may have mentioned that. And that's where we left it. I told him everything I told you. Came back to my office, wrote this memo, put it in my file, and that was it. I expected if anything was to happen, it would be at their level, not at my level. Nothing happened. Mr. Gale left a few months. He left uh, over a year later, I should say, and never heard another matter, not another thing about it until the Mr. A's case came back from the tax division of the Justice Department sometime in, I think, in early September of 1987. It takes a while for these cases to go through the, 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 the mill. What happens is, as a practical sense, we review the case, we make our, our, our findings, the special agent issues a report, uh, the report goes back to the Justice Department tax division, they review it to determine whether it's consistent with their policy goals and they come back with their, their approval. My recommendation was at the time that we should prosecute him not only for false tax return, but also for a, a corruption count, which is what I call a corruption count. But it's essentially 7214, which is Title 26, United States Code 7214, which makes it a federal of felony to not report an opportunity given to someone to commit a fraud. It's a little convoluted, and if you want to ever look at the statute, you can improve that statute someday. But basically what it does is it says that, that if I have, as a prosecutor dealing in strategy, a trial, it says that if I have Mr. A on the stand, he's going to have to admit that he knew about the fraud, didn't report it to the commissioner, which makes him a, more of a co-conspirator with the defendant, which takes away the defendant's f false, what we call, phony defense which is something we all have to face on a daily basis in prosecuting cases. That was not in the recommendation when I saw it in September of 1987, and I was shocked. I said, well, whatever happened to our corruption count? I talked to the agents, and they said, well, that's over an inspection. And I said, well, what happened to the inspection case? Um, no one knew. They brought Mr. Cassis back, who was the, in the inspection investigator who came to my office, I asked if, if, would he come to my office and talk to me, find out whatever happened to it. And Mr. Cass has told me, well, I'm leaving on Friday. I could not give you the date. I don't recall exactly the date, but it was the Wednesday before the 
Friday, which was the last day of Mr. Cassis's employment at the IRS, and I'm sure that date can be reestablished. Mr. Cassis told me that he was told by a CID that the strike force did not want to pursue an inspection investigation. Now you understand, from our perspective, inspection was very important to us because we don't know how deep the mafia might have its tentacles into the IRS. Now this all makes great headlines for some people, but in reality, from the day-to-day -day work that we have at the strike force, we don't have the luxury of knowing where we're going in our investigations. We just do the best we can to try to protect ourselves as we're moving forward in the dark. And in the dark is, if there's a mafia guy who has got an IRS agent doing his tax returns, and he's willing to get, and that IRS agent's willing to get somebody else to be his front man on the tax return, and that the IRS agent knew all along that it was a false tax return, admitted it to me, and another person is telling me that Danny M has got a man inside the IRS, I think anybody here would have done the same thing and said, hey, how deep does it go? And that's basically what we wanted to know. When I asked Mr. Cassis what happened, he said, that CID was told by the, that the strike force didn't want them to pursue the investigation. And that moment in time, I told him for the first time, I said, well, do you know about my conversation with Sereno in March of 86? I think I probably said 1986 of last year. But. And he said, no, what happened? And I told him what I told you, probably the shorter version. And uh, he said, well, do you know that there's a grand jury investigation involving Mr. Sereno. I said, I didn't know. I said, who has it? And he says, across the street, which is the U.S. Attorney's Office. The Strike Force offices are in the federal building. The U.S. Attorney's offices are in the federal courthouse. And I said, well, I don't know anything about it. And that was essentially the end of our conversation. At that moment in time, he said, will you be willing to, to now, I don't know if this was said at that moment or was said later when I met with one of his superiors. Would you be willing to testify under oath or give us an affidavit about what happened with Sereno? And I said, of course I'll give you an affidavit, but I want you to tell my superiors about it and make sure that we all know what's going on here. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to give you any paper until they approve it. And there was some communication between me and, and, and Mr. Cass's superior at which I, I, by that time it looked like the whole thing was unraveling. So it, it, basically the best thing I can remember about that is that his superior, and, I, and the committee will know this better than I will, I didn't get his card that day. He slammed his fists on the table so hard, giving the impression that inspection had been had now, I don't know anything about what his motivation was for slamming his fist, but it was, it was very, very demonstrative of a very deep-seated concern that didn't make any sense to me at the time. But it was definitely important to him because I've never seen anybody so angry about something. And I didn't know that what I had to say was that important to them. Was it your interpretation that he was angry for what you had told him? Uh, that he was uh, he, he was pleased that uh, you had verified what his suspicious was. My impression was that he was angry that somebody had had oh. had him in the in the in the worst sense of the of. And of what the was word. his name? If it was Ripito, it could be Ripito. I okay. it, I know it was not. The um, I think he's testifying tomorrow. Yeah, it, whatever. It, I think it was Mr. Ripito. It was whoever Mr. Cassis yeah. brought me to. I, I don't know whether Mr. Cassis is going to testify or not, but, but uh, Mr. Cassis at that moment in time told me that, uh, that uh, you know, this is very important to inspection. And in fact, I remember advising them that, you know, you know, if you've got a big problem here, why don't you, you know, get your best people on it? And I think I may have even mentioned one of the people that I had met at inspection who was a woman agent there, who I had, uh, who was handling the Nevada corruption investigations of Judge Claiborne, which some committee members may recall. I used to work in Nevada, and I prosecuted uh, the Aladdin Teamster kickback case in Nevada, along with uh, Jeffrey Anderson, the chief of the strike force. And in that case, 
we had problems in, with the judge, not in the case, but during that time of that case, we had problems with the judge, and I met this inspection person. It seemed like, you know, it was on the up and up, and I said, why don't you go and get this person? But I understand since then that that's not, wasn't a good idea. I'm not sure. I think your committee would have to, would have more information about that. At, at that, after that, it was essentially, um, I was still trying to find out, well, how deep were Mr. A's roots into uh, helping Mr., uh, helping Danny M, and I got a, a very thin report out of it after that and was not very pleased by what I think they did, but I think that's for other people to judge at this time. As it turns out, uh, I never, uh, I did not participate in the prosecution of Mr. A or, Ms. or Danny M later on when, uh, when the time came to prosecute. Was Mr. A f finally prosecuted? He was, and he, was, he pleaded guilty, I think, to a felony, and he got probation. I'm not sure that uh, what the strategies were. I did not handle it at that point. Yes. Well, there's just a, a start for refuse to, to move further into the inquiry that you were trying to, to make? Or who refused that for you to go expend the investigation? Well, I think what happened was it was kind of a, a situation where I had recommended an internal investigation by inspection. They apparently chose not to go forward with it and had been told is by this CID, CID. Or is this the strike force? Well, the CID, I'm told by the agent, who is the internal affairs agent, that CID, Mr. Serrano's division, to personalize it, told him that the strike force Prefer probably me, but they, he didn't use my name. But the strike force had said not to pursue it, which is not the truth. We did not say not to pursue. We said the opposite. Thank but you. we don't have, I should say, you know, daily contact with inspection. I mean, inspection is something that, that may, is something be, that's fairly unique to us. We usually deal with organized crime figures, not IRS agents as targets. Mr. Rudnick, of course, let me ask you, uh, uh, many, several members of the, court, uh, of the panel, as well as myself, would like to ask you some clarifying uh, questions. How much more testimony have you got there? I'm just about done. I only have one little area that I want to pursue, would it be, uh, and that is the conversation with Lipkin. Go right ahead. Yes. Uh, just a little while ago, you said uh, that in pursuing the investigation, you recommended a person, uh, Bailey, I believe, and it's one of the agents that you seem to have confidence in. And you made the statement, it seems like this person was, she seemed like she was on the up and up. Yeah. Because she was assigned a very sensitive investigation in Nevada, which was the, the Judge Claiborne case. But, you know, when you say you're thinking of somebody to uh, follow this up, and you say you think they're on the up and up, it almost seems like there's a, an implicit uh, sentiment that, you can't be, there's not everybody in the agency and not everybody you're dealing with is, is going to be that reliable or dependable or, or, as you put it, on the up and up. Well, that's a problem you face in any investigation. You never know whether someone's telling you the truth, just like you're going through now. The problem is that you look for good people to do your investigations because you've got to delegate authority to those people to interview the witnesses, examine the documents, be critical of the evidence. When we look at people as good investigators, we see what have they accomplished in their own right. And I knew only one person that I can think of at inspection. That happened to be this one person that uh, handled the Claiborne case. So I thought inspection was pretty straight. I didn't know we had a problem that I was facing that day. So at that time, you didn't feel that uh, there was, let's say, pervasive corruption among so many people that you wouldn't uh have confidence in just assigning that case to anyone? No, I mean, it's, it's, that's a tough question to answer. I mean, uh, I don't think it's pervasive corruption, but I do think that you have to be careful about who you assign cases to, because if you want to kill a case, you just assign it to an incompetent. And if you want to turn something that's, that's very um, close call on a case and you give it to a good prosecutor or a good investigator, they could turn it into something significant. That's the politics, so to speak, of investigation. Some committees, I'm sure, find things that other people are surprised to find, that they could find. 
But my experience is very simple. I say, those people did the Claiborne case. In my mind at the time, that was significant to me. I didn't know we were going to have other problems. Unless you continue to finish, and then we will. I have one last area, and I will. Uh, There was a lot of other areas, but I'll make it uh, go right to the end. Mr. Lipkin next uh, talked to me about this matter at the end of 1987 in December. I don't have the date handy in, at this time. Mr. Lipkin told me in the meeting that uh, he stopped in my office again at the, at the strike force. He said, uh, if I recall, he said that uh, he knows that I wasn't the one that, that um, told the inspection originally about the problems in his office, but that he wants me to know that Ron Serrano talks to lawyers all the time, and that if it really got bad, he would have done something about it. Now, this was, I think, between Christmas and New Year's of 1987. I bring that to your attention only because I found that to be very significant to me because I did not know that Ron Serrano talked to lawyers all the time. I don't know why he would have, and I don't know what, who they were, but that would be for your committee staff to decide if that was significant uh, uh, in and of itself. What significance was that to you? Well, I mean, if you're head of CID, you're not supposed to be negotiating cases with anyone. I mean, the rules are that the prosecutor negotiates the cases with the lawyers. Now, if Mr. Lipkin had said that he was negotiating cases, that would even be more surprising. But at, it was somewhat difficult to, uh, to weigh, in my mind, at the time, because he wasn't very clear. He was in somewhat other words, it would be unusual for the CID, the Criminal Investigation Division, to discuss with prosecuting attorneys? No, lawyers, non-prosecutors. Defense Forgive lawyers. Yeah, well, we call them. lawyers defense lawyers. We call ourselves, we call defense lawyers lawyers. We call ourselves prosecutors. Okay. It's just the nomenclature. So it'd be improper in my mind for him to have had any kind of dealings with criminal defense attorneys, if that's what he meant by the word lawyers. That's what it meant to me at the time. I did not pursue it. And uh, I assume by that time, since I'd already been questioned twice, by uh, the Internal Security Division Commissioner of Internal Revenue Services Special Investigators around November and inspection after that, I assume that they're conducting their investigation and will act accordingly. Mr. Rudding, I have a series of questions, a little follow-up questions, which I think you can answer very quickly. Uh, uh, I don't think they need any real elaboration because I think you've already covered it pretty Thank well. Uh, but. If you could, would you please characterize your conversation with Mr. Sarano regarding the investigation of the IRS employee and the tennis friend? What did you tell Mr. Sarano at this meeting? Well, I didn't tell him I thought this was corrupt, but I felt it was corrupt. I mean, when he asked you to, uh, to, to, to change, reduce the charge to a misdemeanor, what was your reaction to that? I mean, what I did you... I said no way. You said no way. No I, way. And there, yeah. there was no way this man was going to get a misdemeanor as long as I was the prosecutor on this case. It would be a bad decision for the United States Department of Justice, in my mind, because it would hurt us in taking down Danny M. When I say taking down, I mean prosecuting Danny M. We have these slang expressions as prosecutors, and I'll try to be more formal with you if I can. I believe that you did know Mr. Sarnoff, Mr. Sarnoff before he came down to see you that day. Yes, Mr. Sarno is well known to all of us as uh, being the person who uh, runs CID, but not a person we deal with in any way on a regular personal basis. I've never had lunch with him, I've never had dinner with him, I've never seen him socially. Uh, based on your association or that your, at least your familiarization with him uh, and your first-hand observations, how would you describe Sarno as a manager and what kind of influence and control did he have over those who worked for him? Well, he has very strong control over his people and his people have talked to me privately over the years that he's, he's a very, very tough administrator who makes his decisions based on, uh, on uh, personalities in many ways. Um, what I mean by that is that, is that 
I've known good quality agents that have not risen in the bureaucracy, but I've got to tell you, I'm not the best judge of that. Well, let me just ask you for further emphasis more than anything else. Uh, because of your experience and background, understanding, and knowledge, uh, how did you characterize a request made of you by Mr. Sarno? Was it proper? Was it improper? How would you put it? Absolutely improper. We don't have conversations like that. I want everybody in the committee to know that. We do not have those. Those are oddball situations. But when they happen, you've got to face it. And it's not an easy thing for anybody to face. Now, why did you immediately report the conversation uh, to Mr. Gale? Because it was improper. And I was also concerned about the fact that we had two very sensitive IRS investigations going on in the office at the time. They, um, that if they had been uh, influenced improperly in the way this would have been influenced, it would be very devastating to our program and to what I think was very significant, a very significant case. Did Mr. Gale indicate to you uh, that he was going to react in any way to your discussion with him? No, he just took the information and, uh, he took the information and, uh, that was it. You understand from our perspective, when you tell the boss something like this, it goes right up. You just assume it goes up and then they take care of it. And my hope was that day that he would do whatever is necessary to keep the, the kind of problem this posed from other, our other sensitive investigations that uh, And you, you uh, are, I, I believe that you said that you were somewhat shocked to learn a year later that internal security had apparently, had apparently done nothing to investigate the IRS. Yeah, you have to understand, uh, Mr. Chairman, that during that interim period, we were busy. Yeah. We had trials. I had a, a mail, major mail fraud trial in Phoenix that was going on. This, I was almost getting ready to prepare for that. That's what the time of the meeting with Sereno. I had, a, I had another case in federal district court uh, for the fall. Plus, I had the grand jury investigations of Danny M., which was very which a large amount of work, and as well as the, what is known in L.A. as the so MCA words, you, and payola cases. In other words, you were, you were not surprised from the standpoint that you were not acquainted with it because you had so much to do. But when you learned about it, you were surprised that nothing had been done. Yes, absolutely. It was yeah. just uncalled for right. in my mind. Mr. Hassert? Well, I guess maybe in some sense we're repeating ourselves, but your impression when you were called up to talk to Mr. Sereno just in layman's words, was, was that something that you thought was improper? Oh, absolutely was improper. The question is how, we, how bad it was would, would be determined by whether in any investigation that took place would, have, would explain any evil motive on his part. If and he was collecting money under the table for doing that, then that's, that's a crime. If he was doing it to obstruct justice, that's a crime. But if he was doing it, from, I can't imagine an innocent but he was doing but it. I am a prosecutor, so. He said, he said to you that he was doing it because an associate of his, a tennis playing associate, I understand, his wife was the lawyer in the case, and it was, uh, he's doing it as a friend, right, quote, so. unquote. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And uh, have you ever run into anything else like this in the CID? I have not seen this brazen an effort to try to influence a prosecutor in the CID. I have seen a, another couple instances of questionable conduct that you can never put your finger on, but obviously must have taken place for the events to have occurred. But that's not, from what I understand, the purview of your committee's hearings today. So in your experience, this is an unusual situation. I mean, to have somebody, the head of the CID, in that office. Yeah, I think if, if, if I could, could write a, a novel about this, I would say that if it, if it had happened, it could most likely would have happened at a higher level than me. I think if they had decided to do this thing in, they didn't have to go to me. They could have gotten it done higher up. For some reason, Sereno felt he had to go to me. That in, their, in that act is a story. I don't know the end. I don't know the, the end to. I should. A little say. cloudy and and with the final disposition about Mr. A. I think was his name. <clears throat> what what did finally happen to him? He pleaded guilty to one of the felonies. They never prosecuted the third count. 
Did they use this testimony then against? No, the, the eventually uh, Miss Danny M pleaded guilty as well. But uh, I can't speak to whether in fact it would have come out the same way had I continued to prosecute them. I was not the final prosecutor. I see. You were moved to another case? Well, I was, I was told that I would not handle that case after a certain date. Do you feel that uh, there was, in your, do you have any reason to believe that there were influences that, there that moved you off that case? I'm not sure it was corrupt influence. I think what probably happened was the controversy associated with maybe what had been going on internally at the IRS concerning Mr. Serino's actions with me may have caused justice. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating now may have caused justice to say, well, we better give this to another prosecutor for now because uh, Marvin is, is involved in this other matter. But I can't say that for sure, although when I, I can tell you this much. When they told me I was going to be taken off the Danny M and the Mr. A case, uh, I was not given an explanation. And is that I did ask. Is that unusual? It's move? very unusual. But this is an unusual event, too. Well, we hope so. Thank you. I hope so too. Thank you. Martinez. Yes, but John, I just have we like uh, my colleague has said we might be getting redundant now, but uh, there's something that uh, kind of troubled me is that one that you were taken off and you had a definite goal, it seemed to me in mind that you wanted to go as far as you could with this to find out if there were any other situations like this. How many other people had this agent maybe done, did uh, re returns for? Uh, falsify returns for and you never got that opportunity and uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, you say you did ask why you were taken off and they never did respond to you why you were taken off uh, did you have any reason to believe at the time from your investigation of that particular individual Danny M and this particular in investigation of Mr. A that there might have been other situations that Mr. A was involved in and that you, there could have been uh, no did, specific reason to No, believe? I did not have any reason other than one other tax return. Well, there was one other tax return prepared I was by Mr. A? That I was told. Yes. Well, my friend, uh, yeah, let me, what, what makes it interesting, uh, uh, Mr. Martinez, is the fact that Mr. A hired uh, the lawyer tennis Player who was married to a friend of Mr. Serrano, the, the, the foursome that played tennis regularly. How did he in, know to hire that person? Pardon? The question you're posing is yeah. how did he know to hire that person? Yes. I don't have the answer. That's a good so question. This is an area that... Uh, uh, That's a good question. The, well, That's, see, thank that, you. that is what I'm trying to get at, is that if, if you make assumptions uh, I think reasonable assumptions from the parties that are involved here that there may have been much more to this than, than has been uncovered, uncovered to this day. I'll never know. But you did have strong suspicions. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very briefly. Um, Mr. Rudnick, can we just back up for one second here? When you were in Mr. Uh, Serrano's office, he said exactly what about Mr. A, Mr. A's case. I, I don't mean word for word, but can we go back as to what he wanted you to do? Well, briefly. Uh, basically, what he wanted me to do was to get a misdemeanor. Give a misdemeanor. Now, what I didn't know is what advantage would it be to Mr. Serrano to have Mr. A get a misdemeanor. Well, uh, I presume you thought Mr. Serrano was speaking on behalf of the IRS. Did he give you a reason as to why the IRS would want a misdemeanor in this case? Well, you know, if you look at it institutionally, you might say, you could argue, well, he's an IRS agent, let's be nice to him. But if you look at it as a, as a good pro criminal, from a good criminal prosecutor's mind, it doesn't help. It only hurts your case. It's unfortunate for him if he's a sad story, and it's unfortunate that we have to prosecute our own people. None of us like to do that. I certainly didn't want to do it. Did Mr. Serrano give you a reason, though, why he felt this should be a misdemeanor case? No, he just said he wants a misdemeanor. But he told me that he was a friend of the lawyer's, the, the husband of the lawyer who represented Mr. A. And that's all. That's all, that's all that's you all were told? It was. It's quite unusual, by the way, for him to have 
exposed himself that way in that conversation. But don't forget there were three of us in the room. Mr. Lipkin was there. He would know the truth. He well, heard it. Conti continuing on then, again, briefly, you then were disturbed enough by this conversation to report it to your supervisor. That's Mr. Giles, is, is that right? Mr. Gale. Gale, I'm sorry, Mr. Gale. Mr. Gale uh, was your supervisor. He was. He's right. my immediate supervisor. Right. Now, was he with the Department of Justice? He still is, but he has moved to Providence to be chief of their criminal division in the U.S. Attorney's Office now. But Mr. Gale was not uh, with the IRS. He's with the Department no, of Justice. Department of Justice. Right. And if I'm understanding you, because then you said you, you heard nothing further, um, nothing happened from your point of view on your you're reporting the matter to Mr. Gale. Or did well, I, we I went said. forward with our case just as if this never happened. Right. But with respect to your, you considered it unusual that, that the head of the CID division would approach you in this manner. Oh, absolutely. Which is why you reported it to your supervisor. And, and your, if I understand you correctly, your supervisor, uh, at least to the best of your knowledge, took, took no action on it, near as you can tell. I don't so. know what uh, Mr. Gale did. I know that uh, my instincts are that Mr. Gale reported it up. He's that kind of person, but I really don't know. Right. But nothing, all right, then somewhere along the line, it appears to have stopped if, in terms of, uh, let, let me just phrase it this way, to the best of your knowledge, if in fact Mr. Serrano's approached you as unusual, to the best of your knowledge, anywhere in the system was anything done about that? I really don't think they did anything about it. Right. With I think if they had done something about it, we would have heard about it sometime before my conversation with Cassis in September of 87. Just last couple of things. Uh, uh, with respect to your being taken off the case of Mr. A and Danny M, the names you're using, uh, you did say that uh, th they both pled, ultimately, Mr. A to a felony and I guess Danny M also to a felony? That's correct. All right. In your opinion, from what you knew of the case, were, they, were, were those results reasonable results? Any, any problem well, with those results? At or? least they were felonies. Well, would they you all deserve felonies. The question is, you don't know what will happen in a trial, Mr. Schiff. I mean, in a trial, you could lose it all as well. So it's hard to, to speculate. Mr. Dan Danny M. was a very, very bad guy from our perspective and deserved our ultimate attention because he was on parole at the time he committed this huge fraud. So therefore, to allow him to continue and... and, and play his games on Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles with, while he's on parole, and also to just to do it anyways was just plain wrong, and des he deserved what we used to call in the office double-digit prison. He needed at least 10. It's not easy to get 10 years on a, on, a, on a fraud, but in this case, I felt we could do that, but we'll never know. What did he get? I think he ended up with a, um, a six or eight year sentence. One last question. Uh, just curious, Mr. Redding, are you still with the Department of Justice? Or I'm something? not. Could I, could I ask if it's not in, don't consider it a private question, what you're doing now? Well, I'm going to be in private practice from now on in the, as a trial lawyer in the city of Los Angeles, I hope. Does Once your we're... leaving the Department of Justice have anything to do with what you've been testifying about? It may have. I don't, I don't know for sure. I'm still trying to uh, piece that together. Well, does that mean you were asked to leave the Department of Justice? They asked me if I would leave, and I refused and they terminated me. Did they give you a reason for that termination? They said I was insubordinate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bustamani? What was Mr. Lipkin's reaction when Serrano asked you to go easy on Mr. A? He said he was at the meeting. Didn't do anything. He, no just, reaction? Sat, he just sat there. Do you think he was aware Yes, he was clearly aware. He was he, part of the act. He was the water boy. He was sent down to get me. I have no further questions. Mr. Cox, before you were transferred away, Mr. Rudnick, from the uh, Danny M. and Mr. A. cases, did you have occasion to look into uh, IRS rules concerning uh, activities like that undertaken by Mr. A? Is it normal or abnormal for an IRS agent to moonlight as uh, a tax preparer for private individuals, particularly good people question. like Danny uh, It's I illegal, as I read the law, for him not to have reported what he had done. I mean, we're not talking about a person who's moonlighting here, although that's what happened. We're talking about a person who prepared false tax returns for a mafia figure. 
Now, that's a felony. I think you'd have to talk to the IRS about their regulations as to what specifically they authorize their own people. Though I think there'll be some tomorrow who will be testifying. But in the preparation, at least in the initial stages of, of your contemplating uh, a case against Mr. A, you didn't come across any specific IRS rules that would prevent... I think we did, and I think they, that the results of that were that they can, in some instances, maybe with permission, but I'd really rather revert, revert to someone with more knowledge. But, but your point is that stipulating, for the sake of argument, that it were proper in some circumstances for an agent to involve himself as a moonlighting tax preparer if he became involved in the course of that innocent uh, uh, work with those someone who uh, were in fact uh, engaged in fraud. Those weren't the facts here, that's correct. Well, at what point do you believe that, that Mr. A knew that Danny M was an unsavory character trying to cheat the government of taxes? Well, when he admitted it to me, he knew it. And that was in Mar mid-March of 86. I mean, is it likely that he undertook the employment uh, with Danny M knowing at the outset that Danny M was a gangster? I don't know that answer. I think had we pursued the investigation, that might have been something we would have looked at. We never got a chance to look at it. Thank you very much, Mr. Rundick. Thank you. Mr. Rudnick, were you recently asked to participate in a Los Angeles project involving integrity issues? Yes, I, I was asked to testify just last week on the commission, ethical, ethics commission in Los Angeles and testify as to stronger disclosure. <coughs> My testimony was noted. I was asked as an expert to testify about uh, specific ethical issues on public uh, figure disclosures in the city of Los Angeles uh, by their ethics commission. Well, Mr. Rodney, I want to again thank you for being here today and coming forth with this very important and valuable uh, information uh, concerning our investigation. And I uh, want to thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I thank the committee for the opportunity to tell you uh, what happened. At this point, I will ask uh, Mr. Bernard and Mr. Stanner and their associates if they would re- uh, uh, Reapproach the uh, witness stand. We've been somewhat fortunate that we got by with the last witness without an eruption on the votes. Uh, I don't know how fortunate we will be the remainder of the afternoon. I do know that the uh, amendments will be given more time. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't want to at all indicate that we, we want to get every piece of a very, every piece, every important piece of information that y'all have got. Time is not of the essence as far as I'm concerned. I, I'll be here late into the evening because we need to finish these cases. But I do say that uh, if you can summarize in some ways, <coughs> it would be helpful as far as the time is concerned. But I don't want you to sacrifice information for time. Okay, Mr. Chairman, what I'll do is try to get to the essence of some of these cases and bring out the most important facts. And uh, if there is a question as you follow along, on your copies, uh, feel free to stop me, okay? I'll try to, I'm yes, sorry. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, uh, very briefly, before we go on to new cases, would you permit me to ask one brief question about something we've covered, this sure. document not, I've had a chance to look at it. Mr. Stana, can I go back for a second and talk about this alert document you talked about at the very beginning of your testimony, uh, published by the Internal Revenue Service the Office of Disclosure, bulletin number one. Okay. Um, it, do you recall, I, I have not, I just have a general question to ask about it, and that is, on its face, uh, it doesn't say anything wrong, does it? I mean, it reminds people what the, what the law is, is that no, correct? No, let me refresh your memory on how I came about this document. This morning, uh, over the fax machine, I received this from um, an individual who works for the IRS uh, out in, uh, outside of Washington. 
this individual had uh, also told me that, uh, in his opinion, the timing of this, this bulletin was uh, rather coincidental, seeing as uh, we would have numerous or a number of IRS officials come up and um, testify to the subcommittee. In this person's opinion, to put out this alert, which was the first one that, that he knew of, uh, it constituted, um, uh, well, he felt intimidated by it, frankly, and uh, didn't know what it really meant. Was, was it the opinion of the IRS that what his testimony would uh, somehow uh, have to be tailored so that we wouldn't be able to get to certain facts? The fact that this uh, mentions two criminal actions brought against people who uh, violated 6103. It, in this person's opinion, uh, the timing of this was, uh, was very unfortunate. And the reason I brought it to the subcommittee's attention was uh, in the context of some of the difficulties I explained this morning in my opening statement, that uh, okay. some people feel that the use, and in fact we concur that, that in some instances the use of 6103 uh, goes beyond what, what most people would consider as normal bounds. Just so I understand then, any, any um, implication would deal with the timing rather than anything that's specifically the content that's, of this bill. That's correct, Mr. Schiff. It's, uh, I think, as, okay. as the chairman pointed out, we are not out to break the disclosure laws. We, we let every witness know what our limits were. If there was a question over who, um, you know, we had an authorization from and who we did not, if the disclosure attorneys would not mention it, we would try to make a point of mentioning it. It's the timing of this thing that coincides with our... It appears um, to me that if uh, IRS took note of our investigation as early as January of this year, uh, that it would have taken them, not have taken them until July to have issued an alert. I mean, they indicated back in January through an internal memorandum uh, that, they, uh, that they were concerned about integrity problems uh, and this, that, and the other, and uh, uh, made mention of our investigation. Uh, I, I'm a little, I'm a little amused, uh, not amused, I'm, um, I'm amazed that it took them six months to get out an alert if they thought an alert was uh, necessary, especially in view of the fact that on, as of June, uh, as of July the 24th, the 25th, uh, these hearings were going to begin. Mr. Stan, if I may just ask, did this go to all IRS offices around the country? It's my understanding this went to all IRS employees. Mr. Thank Chairman, if I might just ask sure. a question on the material covered this morning also. Go right ahead. Uh, because uh, while we were in recess, I had the opportunity to review two documents relating to the destruction of documents, which we discussed this morning, which are facially irregular and inconsistent. Uh, one is a memo to file dated June 15, 1989 from Stephen Levy. The other is our letter to our chairman dated June 21st, 1989 from the acting assistant to the commissioner for legislative liaison. In his memo to file, uh, written exactly four years after the events the memo to the file covers, Mr. Levy states that the reason that he destroyed documents was that he evidently <coughs> quite carefully, uh, one would imagine, compared uh, some subset of the three million documents that was produced uh, with the other documents that uh, had originally been given to him by the Marcianos and determined that there were, quote, no discrepancies and because he was short of space disposed of them. The letter from Gail Morin, the acting assistant to the commissioner, states that the special agent discarded some of these documents as, quote, not being relevant. Uh, do you have any idea uh, how it is that the special agent tells us in this memo written very recently that it was because he personally compared them and found no discrepancies that he uh, disposed of them and that the uh, uh, letter Bernard, from the IRS is different? I'm sorry. Mr. Bernard, uh, Len Bernard, uh, addressed this question to some extent this morning, so maybe he's in a better position than okay. I am. Okay. It's, it's a very good question, and uh, to be quite honest with you, we really haven't sat down with IRS management uh, and uh, asked them whether or not they received any kind of elaboration from Mr. Levy beyond his, beyond what's in his memo to the file. Uh, I think that's a uh, that that's a question that you should ask on Thursday to to the commissioner because I, I that's a very good point, and it, and it's I believe it's even underlined in the package that we that we distributed. Uh, uh, 
There is no doubt in my mind that he destroyed documents uh, that were not obtained in the raid. And the point you make is a good one because that particular sentence indicates that he did destroy documents that go beyond the documents that were, that were obtained in the raid of Jordash. And I think that's a very good question, but I am not sure whether or not Mr. Levy supplied Ms. Ms. Morin or, any, or other people here in Washington with a further explanation that goes be beyond this memo. I'm just Well, I'm just well putting sure. the best face on the letter from the IRS, one would expect that he did uh, because she wouldn't have come to that conclusion based on reading the memo to the file. Uh, one other question about the memo to the file. Uh, as one who practiced law for a decade and then uh, also uh, was involved in government law in the White House, I've, I've seen big document productions before and I know what three million documents, not three million pages, but three million documents really means. Uh, it strikes me as unlikely that one individual That's a personally was able to match uh, one universe of three million documents with another universe of several boxes. Uh, maybe that's, that was possible, but uh, that's a that's a, that's another did, very very. Did he good do it point. alone? Uh, we've again we've had very little access. There's a very little in the file that we received from IRS. To, uh, we we we've seen some letters, and there is not an extensive list of agents assigned to the grand jury. So you know you have to be assigned to a grand jury. You have to be an agent of the grand jury to have access to documents. I, I believe, I'm not positive on that, but there, no, there's no indication. He said, I went through the documents. That's what his memo to the file says. And uh, so that's a real good question. He said he did it shortly after the raid, I believe, in his memo to the file. He didn't say, I went through the documents over a 10-month period. It said he, he, did, he threw away the documents shortly after the raid. So that's another very good question that I can't, that, that I can't answer at this point. Uh, the last Mr. question. Levy's the only person that can answer that, or maybe since there are IRS representatives here today and, and they're hearing this question, maybe they can get that information uh, by Thursday and maybe Mr. Goldberg can then present it. I, cause the last question, it's my recollection that uh, when the request from this subcommittee was first put to the service, uh, the response was that the request could not be complied with because of the statute preventing it. Uh, uh, is that yeah, let, let, me, let me kind of go over that a little bit with you here, and I can maybe list the chronology. When we started this investigation, we did not have an authorization from the Nakashas in Jordash. Right. Therefore, we cannot get those documents immediately. We went to the Nakashas in Jordash and asked for a disclosure authorization. Uh, early, the, this was after we had tried to go the resolution route, and that failed we decided we did need access to tax information. And the only way we were going to get it was to go to each individual <coughs> taxpayer payer and get an authorization. So we went to Nakashas and they agreed to give us that authorization. Uh, we received one signed authorization early in 88, and I believe January. Technic there was something technically wrong with it, according to IRS. They redrafted an authorization for us. We gave it to Nakashas, they signed it. I believe it was, they signed it on March 23rd. So being conservative, from March 23rd until the day we got this letter, IRS knew we wanted these documents. They told us they couldn't give us the documents because of the grand jury matter in New York and that they would have to get permission from the Justice Department to do so. If the documents were destroyed in January of 86, as Mr. Levy claims, IRS should have found out about that shortly after we sent them the Nakash disclosure authorizations in, in March. It would have been very easy for them to come back then and say, well, you know, it's really a moot point because there are no documents. They've been destroyed. They didn't do that. They continued to tell us that they couldn't give us the documents because the Justice Department hadn't made a decision. I believe you became personally involved in this situation. And you put a call into the Justice Department. As a result of your call, things began to move until Mr. Ch Mr. Bernard got the call from Carol Crawford at the Justice Department saying, it's, it's, you know, you can see the documents, but there's a problem here, and I think you need to find out from the IRS what that problem is. Shortly after that, we found out from the IRS that the documents were destroyed. This was all in that time frame of January 20, 21, 22. But your point is a good one. They knew in March we wanted the Jordache documents. If they went out and found out from Mr. Levy in March that they were destroyed, they could have told us. It would have saved a lot of kind of leading us on thinking we were going to get something as soon as the Justice Department made that decision. 
And I think it's pretty clear that the Justice Department was not in a position to know whether the documents existed or not. They were making the legal call, and it was IRS that might have been expected to know that the documents had been destroyed. Correct. Correct. The, the impression I got from, the, from Mr. Bernard's call from Carol Crawford was that they were not aware that the documents were destroyed by, the, by Mr. Levy, who was a CID agent, uh, and, until uh, shortly before she made the call to Mr. Bernard. All right. I appreciate that clarification. Thank Mr. you. Cox, we did get a letter. We did get a letter from, uh, was it the Justice Department? Uh, which I would not consider a strong letter. The, law, the letter only indicated that it had been taken under advisement by the Public Integrity Department. And in a uh, conversation with Ms. Crawford, you know, I got the understanding that uh, it really wasn't appropriate for this committee to contact the Public Integrity Department. Now, why, I do not know. This is subsequent to the revelation that documents yes. have been destroyed. Uh, that letter I've seen, and, and frankly, I'm satisfied with the uh, report from Justice. I think that it, yeah, well, I have it indicates too. that they are taking this very seriously and that well, the referral from this subcommittee is I would have thought seriously. that myself, but I did say I was somewhat uh, dismayed that, that I couldn't, uh, I did not get a I didn't, I didn't think we got a very enthusiastic support from justice as far as the activity of the Public uh, Integrity Department. Now, that's my own personal opinion. I hope that that can be uh, reversed. Well, I hope that what we're seeing is a lot of circumspection and, and uh, yeah. uh, not a lot of, uh, I lack of so. enthusiasm. I think it's probably the former. Okay, before we move away, I just want to make one other comment on Mr. Schiff's remark on this alert. Um, in the last couple of weeks, these hearings have gotten quite a bit of uh, press in anticipation of their being held. And we, our contacts with uh, present and former IRS employees has increased. People are calling us, volunteering other things to us. And one thing that concerns me about this memo is that someone might interpret this memo as the official position of IRS is you do not report wrongdoing. And consequently, bodies like this one would not be made aware of acts of wrongdoing. I hope that wasn't intended. But as I said before, it's not that we think that uh, 6103 is something that should be violated. It's just the timing of this thing was, was, was not... Uh... We need to move along. Okay. And let me, let me abbreviate what I've got here to give you the gist of what we're talking about in the interest of time. The next case involves a CID chief in IRS's central region who was involved in two incidents of alleged misconduct. The allegations were made in two anonymous letters from the district's CID agents to the Assistant Commissioner for Criminal Investigation, who turned the letters over to the Inspections Branch in Washington. The first letter was written in July 85 and alleged that the CID chief used a government undercover boat to joyride with two CID group managers over the 4th of July weekend under the ruse of doing a general surveillance on one of the Great Lakes. The agents allegedly became so intoxicated from beer purchased with government funds that they had to spend the night on an island. The second letter was written in March 86 and was followed up with a phone call to inspection a week later. Both contacts allege that in February 84, the CID chief and a CID special agent were speeding and driving while intoxicated in a government undercover car. They were stopped by suburban police and disarmed after the agent became very disorderly and abusive. Both were released after they identified themselves as CID agents. Now, inspection made brief and superficial inquiries into these allegations and cleared the chief of any wrongdoing. Now, I wish to focus your attention primarily on the two inspection investigations that were easily derailed before really getting to the bottom of the allegations. Uh, consequently, I have not identified the chief or his district. I can if you like. The first involves a project boat, which was conceived by the CID chief to gather information on individuals who owned expensive boats to determine whether the boats were being used as abusive tax shelters. Um, what the crux of the project was is the CID agents would infiltrate, if you will, uh, marinas and places where people who own large expensive boats would, would hang out. And they would note license numbers, boat registration numbers, and try to strike up conversations with these people in an attempt to uh, get a sense of uh, exhibited wealth, and then they would go back to the office and pull the corresponding tax return and see if the tax return shows an income that would support that kind of a lifestyle. Um, the project used a boat that was seized in a customs operation and was, was given to IRS for this operation. Um, 
In July 85, an anonymous letter from, quote, a loyal special agent of many was sent to the chief of criminal investigation, or the assistant commissioner for criminal investigation in Washington, made a number of allegations against the chief. One allegation was is that he abused premium pay. Another was that he was joyriding in the boat. And the other one was he was misspending government funds. The letter specifically identified the CID chief and the two group managers as wrongdoers. And the assistant commissioner forwarded this anonymous letter to inspection for its evaluation and action. Now, because the source of this allegation was an anonymous CID agent, inspection basically doubted the reliability and opened what's known as a special inquiry employee case. Now, this decision had a significant impact because SIE cases are considered preliminary. And the scope of these investigations are generally limited to interviewing the complainant, who in this case was anonymous and they couldn't contact, checking pertinent records, few existed, and interviewing third parties who might shed light on the matter. Now, the subjects of SIE cases are generally not notified that they're under investigation. And Treasury IG is generally not notified that there's an investigation underway either. There was a, an inspector from Washington assigned to this case. He flew to the district and interviewed three people, the chief's boss, the chief's subordinate, and a local group inspector. The group inspector called the National Weather Service to get a report on the weather that weekend. Um, this preliminary inquiry surfaced no evidence of wrongdoing, and inspection closed out the matter after spending 50 staff hours on the case. Now, our review of the inspection report and the facts and circumstances in the case indicate that um, inspection could have done a much better job on this. There are three issues. With respect to the premium pay issue, the chief said that few agents volunteered because of the weekend work. Then, citing the lack of volunteers, he basically asked the district assistant district director if he himself could go on premium pay which is an overtime pay that's generally given to government employees who work long and unavoidable hours. Well, basically the chief asked him, the, the chief volunteered himself for the project, asked to be put on premium pay, which was approved. We discussed this project with many present and former agents, and we identified seven names of individuals who volunteered for this project. This project was staffed by four people, including the chief. We identified seven street agents who volunteered. The chief said he could only get three people to volunteer and consequently put himself on premium pay. This had a very, a very disturbing effect on the morale in the office. Premium pay is meant for the agents working the most difficult tax cases. It's not generally for the, the kind of information gathering projects we had here on a boat. This is considered pretty good duty. The allegation about joyriding in the boat and sleeping on the island uh, is a little more complicated. Um, the report states that on the day in question, July 6, 1985, the chief and two of his group managers took the boat to an island in the lake to perform a general surveillance. According to the report, when they started back, a storm suddenly came up, which prevented their return, so they had to spend the night on the island. Um, we found that events that took place during the period in question really didn't go this way. First off, the weather data indicate that a storm did not suddenly come up that evening. Our review of boaters' advisory broadcasts showed that there were no small craft advisories issued that day, and the data from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration buoys anchored in the lake showed that the wave heights and frequencies were about the same from the morning they left for the island to the following morning. All three agents on the boat told us that, contrary to the report, there was no storm that evening. The chief told us that he st simply stayed on the island too long, and the darkness, coupled with some pretty choppy waters, uh, made him believe that the navigation was too risky, and they stayed on the island. He denied that drinking could have affected his decision not to leave earlier in the day, perhaps when it would have been more safe, or his judgment as to the riskiness of the boat ride to the island. It appears, though, that the agents planned to mix pleasure with duty on the day in question. This is the only day, according to project records, where three agents were together on duty, and all three agents were CID managers and all were known to be socially close. Further, the group manager assigned to the project had invited an IRS secretary, who was a former girlfriend, and her friend, who was also an employee, to accompany them to the island that day. These women had no official ties to the project. One of the women, whose identity we discovered, told us that his invitation for her to ride on the boat was an open social invitation that she never accepted, but she didn't know whether her friend went along on the boat. The group manager indicated to us that the secretary was not on the boat, but that a, quote, fourth person, end quote, was on the boat that day. He declined to, to tell us who this fourth person was. The chief and the other group manager denied that there was a fourth person on the boat or that women were on boat uh, that day. 
Now, this was not the first time the boat was used to mix pleasure with duty. On the previous day, the group manager assigned to the project was on surveillance with another agent. After surveillance work was completed and they returned to the mainland, the two agents parted company and the group manager drove the government boat back to the island for what he described as bar hopping. The chief and the two group managers were drinking for much of the day. The chief brought along a cooler of beer for the boat and the drinking began before noon on the way to the island. Now the agents told us that they, buy, or they, they bought several rounds of drinks in the process of gathering information. They might come up to an individual and say, hi, how are you, and buy him a drink and talk to him and see what kind of information they can get. This went on all day. Now it's important to note that drinking on an undercover activity is permissible if you need it to blend into a situation. However, drinking to excess on duty is a violation of Section 216.3 of the IRS Rules of Conduct. The chief denied being intoxicated that day, as is the group manager he invited along. However, against his self-interest, the group manager assigned to the project admitted to drinking to excess, and he said he believed the others may have as well. There's a strong possibility also that uh, even though this was an SIE case, the chief was tipped off about this boat investigation. The group manager who was on the boat that day said that uh, the chief told him that there was an investigation underway while it was ongoing, and that later he told him that he was cleared. Further, if you read the inspection report very carefully, you'll see that shortly before the inspector arrived in the district to interview third party witnesses, the chief told, and you have to strike in your copy, the assistant district director, that was a, an error. It's the assistant CID chief and the local inspection manager that when he was on surveillance the day in question, a storm suddenly came up. This information was passed along to the inspector and this effectively derailed the investigation. The third allegation made in the letter involves the misspending of government funds, and this was not addressed at all by inspection. We found that on July 5th, the day before the alleged wrongdoing, one battery for $63.55 was purchased for the boat. The agent who actually purchased the battery and his group manager both claimed to have purchased the battery and both vouchered and received reimbursement for the expense. The group manager admitted to us a few months ago that the agent actually purchased the batter battery and that he obviously made, quote, a mistake by vouchering the expense. This improper vouchering is a possible violation of 18 U.S.C. 1001, which is the false statements against the government. We also noted that relatively large sums of 100, 115, 95 rounded dollars were vouchered for food and beverages, which far exceeded normal per diem rate with no ex explanation why these amounts were necessary. The chief said he didn't consider these to be extraordinary because oftentimes you buy rounds of drinks for people as the information gathering is ongoing. But in reviewing the reports, uh, the memorandum of activity, we noted few uh, events that were listed in the reports that would indicate a situation where you would buy rounds of drinks. It was generally just surveillance observing people. Um, you know, these amounts of money really aren't uh, uh, substantial, but the situations are indicative of a, an inadequate accountability and control of government funds that certainly requires improvement. The project ended in August 85 when it came, uh, became apparent that uh, the boat project was getting nothing of value and uh, the boat needed expensive repairs that they didn't wish to pay for. Now the termination report for the project states that 50 individuals were identified in the narcotics area and were included in the high level drug leaders project for development. Well this report is very misleading. At best the project developed 50 information items like auto license plate numbers or boat registration numbers. Now, I don't know what kind of car you gentlemen drive, but if you drive a fancy car, you might have been considered one of these 50 people and in this report made to believe that you're a high-level drug leader. Um, th it did not identify drug traffickers or even tax cheats. Not one criminal tax case was opened as a result of information developed from this project. The second incident involving the CID chief relates to a two-day undercover operation that was performed in February 84. At a pre-operational meeting, uh, a pre-operational meeting was held in a hotel to discuss plans for the undercover operation. After the meeting ended at 10 p.m., the chief and the undercover agent began an, quote, area familiarization, which is a CID term for getting to know the geographic area and the physical layout of any buildings involved in the undercover operation. Get to know where the doors are, the tables, where the bar is, and so on. However, this area familiarization included stops for drinks at local taverns that were not part of the undercover plan and ended with an incident that was reported to inspection almost two years later. Inspection opened an investigation on the chief about two years after receiving an anonymous letter uh, alleging uh, DWI and uh, an agent uh, getting out of control and, and uh, becoming very abusive to policemen. 
Now again, because the writer of the letter and the, call, the telephone caller who reported two weeks later were both anonymous, they again opened an SIE investigation. What is an SIE investigation? An SIE investigation, there are two types of cases that inspection does. A conduct investigation is generally opened when you know the identity of the wrongdoer, the identity of the informant, and a specific allegation, like Joe Jones is stealing typewriters. You would have three elements of information. You would say, OK, we can open a conduct investigation. If you lack one of those three, or one or more of those three, they would open a preliminary type investigation known as a special inquiry employee, thus SIE case. Now, the difference basically is that you can identify third party witnesses and do other kinds of inf information gathering um, to develop uh, whether the allegation is credible or a specific offense occurred. But you are not to interview the, um, the target in the case unless the target's already been identified for you. Would you, uh, would you I, I don't want to interrupt this, this particular, but I had this question to ask. Do you feel like the IRS gets so many anonymous calls like this and tips like this that it's impossible for them to uh, really investigate them? Well, that, that's a real good question because uh, I think what it brings up is, is, is an issue that uh, we've come across in the investigation. Many in IRS are afraid to allege wrongdoing of their bosses by, by their own name. So what they do is they forward an anonymous allegation, hoping that somebody will do something about it. They don't want to come forward themselves because the record has been that oftentimes these people are retaliated against. And we saw this in the Langone Pagani man. Uh, so what happens is they write an anonymous letter, it comes to inspection. Now, if inspection gets an anonymous letter, uh, more often than not, it's going to open up one of these SIE cases where they don't interview the wrongdoer. So uh, what happens is you do a very preliminary inquiry like happened in these two cases, and you try to talk around the people who are most familiar with the offense, and you can get, the chances are you can get uh, derailed fairly easily. You wouldn't know, though, what the percentage of following up on these anonymous calls would be, would you? No, not offhand, Mr. Chairman. Not offhand. I think, I would think that, uh, you know, they, they make some sort of an evaluation as to the merits of the case. Sometimes they might get an allegation that says, all the high-level managers at the service center are just rotten. Well, what do you do with an allegation like that? But in this case, you had an allegation that this specific CID chief was DWI and abusive to local officers on this day. Here's the officer's name, but I'm not telling you who I am. And thus, they opened the preliminary. And verified uh, the date and the time and the place and the, uh, and the uh, boat and so forth. Yes. Okay. Well, what we did is, when we did this, we found out that the date given to uh, inspection on the and the, uh, and the uh, boat and so forth. Yes. Okay. Well, what we did is, when we did this, we found out that the date given to uh, inspection on the car incident was two days off. Mm. It was reported as February 24th in the inspection report. Actually, it was February 22nd. OK, now, uh, when the case was opened, um, the inspector made arrangements to interview the policeman who was allegedly at the scene and uh, made arrangements to interview him at his home. According to the report, the policeman told the inspector that he recalled the incident because it was the only time he stopped federal officers, that he stopped the car because the driver was speeding about five miles over the speed limit, and when the driver searched the vehicle for a registration, the policeman observed a handgun. The policeman pulled his own weapon and ordered the two from the vehicle until backup arrived. Once they were backup arrived, they were identified as CID agents. Both men were courteous and conducted themselves in a professional manner. And it didn't warrant any type of citation, and none was issued, a non-event. Uh, the policeman said that he initially pulled the vehicle over because he had never seen a DeLorean before. This was the undercover car. And he was curious. He said if they were driving any other kind of vehicle, he probably wouldn't have stopped them. Well, after receiving this information, the inspector flew back to Washington and closed the case. He did not look for a police report, and uh, he did not talk to anyone else on the case, spent 36 hours on the investigation. We did obtain the police report. In fact, here it is right here. And I'll discuss it in a minute. A police report did exist. But let me describe some of the... Um, facts and circumstances surrounding this case that differ substantially me, from the police report. Let me at report. this point ask unanimous consent that that police report be a part of the uh, record without objection so ordered. Okay. The events as they were related to us were that the chief and the undercover agent visited more than one, quote, tavern, possibly more, on the area of familiarization. None of these taverns involved the undercover operation or the location of that. 
The chief said that he himself consumed no alcoholic beverages, but he sat there and observed the agent having several drinks, possibly tequila. He knew the agent to be a heavy drinker and that the agent became drunk. Now, the agent was still on duty, so his intoxication is a violation of the IRS rules of conduct, and the chief was a party to this because the chief sat next to him watching himself get, watching this, this agent get drunk. Uh, the agent, by the way, vouchered $26 for the beverages he bought for this particular uh, bar hopping. The policeman told us that at 1.55 a.m. on February 22nd, his radar detected the chief traveling between 50 and 55 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone, not five miles over the speed limit. The policeman stopped the car, he was pursuing it, and it took him a while to get down the road and get him. The policeman noticed that the chief was ha carrying a handgun and asked him to get out of the car and he disarmed the chief. The policeman pulled his own firearm and uh, radioed for immediate backup. When he asked the other agent, the undercover agent, to get out of the car, the agent jumped out of the car, out of the passenger side, screamed at the policeman that they were federal agents and he had no business stopping them. Now, the agent was very intoxicated and carrying a weapon at this time. The policeman said the agent intentionally threw his law enforcement credentials at him and they fell to the ground so he'd have to bend down and get him. The policeman said that the agent was abusive, unruly, and very drunk and his behavior almost got him shot or jailed. Thereafter, four backup policemen arrived, and one of these policemen disarmed the agent. After the chief and the agent were identified as IRS special agents, they were permitted to leave the scene. Now, since the chief appeared to be sober, he was allowed to drive the car away. Now, this is important. During the summer of 85, this policeman accurately described this incident as he described it to us to another CID agent in the office. At that time, he also said, that the chief gave him a business card and told him to call him about job opportunities at the IRS. The chief said that if he gave him his business card, it was only his identification because he wasn't carrying his law enforcement credentials. The chief denied telling the policeman to call him about job opportunities and denied initiating any discussions about employment at IRS. Now, the chief told us that he reported the undercover agent's unruly behavior to his boss the following day. Now, we found no evidence in the special agent's personnel file to indicate that this was done or ever acted on. However, after the undercover operation was finished, the chief nominated this agent for a $750 special act award, citing his performance on this and another operation, but not mentioning this incident. The award was approved. The policeman told us that he specifically told the inspector about the agent's unruly and obnoxious behavior and that the agent was almost shot or jailed. He also told us that he did not tell the inspector that both men acted professionally and courteously, as appears in the report. The policeman said the inspector did not ask for a police report, and he did not provide one. We obtained the police report, which I pointed out here. It clearly says on here, the passenger with the name was very disorderly and uncooperative on the traffic stop to the reporting officer and the backup units, printouts attached. Had they gone to the police station, to get, the, to get this document, which we were able to obtain five years later, they could have opened up a door into this, uh, this story of, uh, of uh, the, the policeman, if the policeman did tell them a different story, and possibly gotten to the bottom of this. As with the boat incident, it appears that the chief might have been, might have been tipped off about this investigation. This is the irony of the SIE, if they're not telling uh, the target that there are possible that they are a possible target, it's ironic because everyone that we've been associated with the target knew about it anyway. Copies of the anonymous letter were sent to several locations and shortly after his arrival in April 86, this is while the inspection investigation was ongoing, the new district director discussed the boat and the car incidents with the chief and he warned him about this sort of behavior. The district director told us that he believed the chief already knew he was under investigation by inspection at this time. Now, it's questionable whether inspection ever intended to do much with this allegation, given that it occurred two years before. But additional effort on the part of inspection to focus on the totality of the incident would not only have disclosed important information relating to the chief, but also would have surfaced disturbing information about this undercover agent. It was later learned that at this time, the undercover agent had a substance abuse problem that was brought on by job-related stress. This problem subsequently grew worse and was identified two years later after the agent removed a prescription pad from a doctor's office and illegally obtained controlled medication. The agent has since been placed in a treatment program and has been downgraded and reassigned to non-CID duties. Now, thorough and reliable inspection and inspe investigations are important not only to detect possible wrongdoing, 
but as a means of evaluating candidates for high-level positions in the service. The Executive Selection and Development Program identifies, selects, and trains the future senior management managers of the service. The district director told us that because the chief was cleared by inspection of both incidents, and because the chief exhibited sound judgment in the months following his arrival in the district, he believed the chief to have high integrity. The district director nominated the CID chief for the Executive Development Program in 1987 and 1988. I'd like to go on to a, the next case very quickly. The uh, quick question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick, uh, the actions of this uh, criminal investigations uh, chief uh, being out in the boat and having driving the DeLorean and that type of thing, is that usual? Do those, do the chiefs usually go on the front line to do that type of work? Well, normally managers manage. Uh, it's, it, uh, let me separate the two incidents. Uh, with respect to the boat incident, it is highly irregular for a chief to be placed on premium pay and really do street work. Uh, usually the chief keeps himself one or more steps above and, and manages. In this case, uh, he cited the fact that uh, there weren't enough volunteers and he wanted to see the project go, so he volunteered himself and, and was put on premium pay. As I said earlier, we identified the names of seven people who did volunteer. I don't know how, uh, how he came across that uh, there were only three. And then the automobile? The automobile accident, CID chiefs or the, the assistant chief uh, do attend pre-operational meetings when uh, an undercover activity is being planned and, and getting ready to go on. And that's where he was when this, this car incident happened. Um, I would say that uh, with, I, I, would, I would say that the CID management both in Washington and, and in the regional offices would not say that they would condone the drinking of alcoholic beverages in this manner. And indeed, uh, the common thread that we see in both projects is that uh, alcohol seemed to play an inordinately large role in both these incidents. Um, agents are uh, prohibited from drinking if they're going to be driving. So your answer is on the boat incident, that was unusual, and the car incident, his presence well, the chief, there was justified. The car incident, let me make this very clear, the chief would attend a pre-operational meeting. Fine. It is, un I would not say that the CID people would say it's permissible for the chief to watch his agents drink and go out and do this kind of thing. Thank you. This morning we talked about instances where um, people under oath tell vastly different stories and it's, it's some, a matter that has to be reconciled and I think this next case I'm going to present very briefly is just one of those cases that the subcommittee is going to have to reconcile. Uh, the case involves a CID agent who was assigned to a major narcotics trafficking case in Arkansas. In the opinion of the agent, the, the case proceeded slowly and he was concerned that he wasn't being allowed to pursue the case as aggressively as he would have liked. Um, uh, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime got wind of the progress of this case and scheduled a hearing. The agent was expected to be subpoenaed and was subpoenaed to attend and uh, was sent back to Washington for counseling on how to appear before the subcommittee. There were 6103 and 6103 concerns that disclosure litigation had to review with the agent. Now, according to the agent, while he was counseled on the parameters of 6103 and Rule 6E, um, the disclosure litigation attorneys advised him not to give any opinion, even if asked to do so, on the U.S. Attorney's handling of the case. We don't throw stones at the U.S. Attorney in public. And secondly, that although he would be testifying under oath, that he should deny the existence of an allegation he heard concerning an, a, a bribe, an alleged bribe to a high-ranking government official. He protested about this advice and threatened not to testify. After he threatened not to testify, he was permitted more latitude. In effect, he could say, well, I haven't verified this. It's, it's unsubstantiated information, but I have heard about this, about this alleged bribe. And he was happy about this. The IRS attorneys told us that they told Duncan that he could give an opinion. And um, as long as he provided the basis for it. Now, the, we have a situation where the agent stands by his story that no disclosure litigation attorneys told me that I was not to disclose that I heard anything about this bribe. I, I was supposed to say, quote, I have no information. And he was not supposed to um, uh, give an opinion on the U.S. attorney's handling of the case. He was supposed to say, quote, I would have done it differently. Disclosure litigation attorneys, and they said this under oath, and there's a person who corroborates the CID agent's story. The disclosure litigation attorneys who were on the case say that no, and they said this under oath, they advised him um, that he could render an opinion. However, if he's going to render opinion, just give the, ba the background, the basis of his opinion. Well, the agent says that 
That's all I wanted to do. All I wanted to do is give my opinion, and I would give the basis. We have a situation here where we're going to have to reconcile this. But you can understand the implications of this. Uh, it's relevant to our investigation for a couple of reasons. It represents an allegation of misconduct by a senior IRS official and the failure of IRS to address it. The agent told his assistant regional commissioner for criminal investigation, the executive assistant, his own superior, regional council people, told him about this, and they all said, no, that was improper advice. He didn't know what they did with it, but he, he, he made a full disclosure of this event. It also illustrates uh, an attitude of less than full cooperation with a congressional committee. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, in some instances, we, we believe we found the same sort of an attitude. Um, so I'd just like to close this matter by saying that the, the two special agents who received this advice will be testifying Thursday. They stand by their story. The IRS will be testifying Thursday. We just talked to the agents last night. There's, there's two different accounts here, and I think the subcommittee needs to probe what went on here. It's very important that the Congress get information from people on the front lines when asked to give specific information. Those insights are valuable when you're evaluating federal programs. You didn't sense in this investigation at this point, you didn't sense that there might have been some difficulty in communication, which is... I asked, I asked the agents, in, in fact, after we talked to the disclosure attorneys yesterday, I called both, both agents who witnessed this, who say they were mis... They, they just got bad counseling. They were counseled to lie, is the way they put it. They said, look, we've been in special agents for years, one 15, 16 years, another one uh, is in charge, or he's in charge of the training section down in Glencoe for CID. He's a reputable person. So, look, we know the difference between unsubstantiated fact and, or unsubstantiated allegations and fact. We know, we deal with this all the time. What they said they heard was they were told to lie. They were told to give a less than complete answer because, in their opinion, the IRS attorneys did not want Congress, or not, did not want to throw stones at the U.S. attorney and in front of And because they resisted, what happened? Did they, by the resisting, did they eventually testify as they wanted to testify? Yes, and, and, and in the opinion, or the allegation of the agents is, is that had they not been resistant, had they not said, well, then I'm not testifying, and the testimony was the next day, so it would have been embarrassing. You know, it would have been embarrassing. Had they not dug their heels in, um, nothing would have changed. But because they did dig their heels in, uh, the IRS disclosure attorneys backed away and said, well, then, okay, try this. You can say that you have heard an unsubstantiated allegation, but here's how I got it. That's all they wanted to say. They did not want to affirmatively testify that this high, you know, this high-ranking government official is being bribed by a drug trafficking organization. That wasn't their point. Okay. Okay, the last case I'm going to talk about is, a, is a, I think, a very interesting case. And I may spend just a tad more time. This is a Chicago case. This is a Chicago whistleblower case. It involves information we received about three internal auditors from Chicago who exposed a supervisor who, among other things, improperly provided tax information to and accepted gratuities from a businessman who allegedly owed the government about $400,000 in unpaid employment taxes. After delaying action on this matter for over a year, inspection investigated the incident and the supervisor was suspended without pay for 12 days. Shortly after, senior inspection managers from across the country, now these are people who are charged within IRS to assure employee integrity, took up a collection to make up for the wrongdoers lost pay. About a year later, regional management reorganized the Chicago office, which resulted in one whistleblower being removed from management, another being demoted to a non-management job, and the other being threatened with a downgrade. The reorganization was overturned only after the whistleblower's grievances found their way outside the IRS. All of these actions took place in the very organizational component responsible for maintaining integrity in the IRS. Let me present some facts on this matter. The story begins on May 17, 84, when three GM-14 audit managers from IRS's Midwest region of Chicago, George Ekela, Ron Koperniak, and Stan Welly, referred allegations of misconduct concerning their immediate supervisor, Frank Santella, who was the assistant regional inspector for internal audit. The alleged misconduct involved associating with disreputable persons, which uh, you might call organized crime figures, directing subordinates to conduct uh, non-official tax research for a businessman friend who has 400000 in arrears in employment taxes, accepting gratuities and other wrongdoings. 
Now, these are actions are possible violations of the criminal code and are clearly violations of the employee handbook of employee responsibilities. Now, IRS rules of conduct require these whistleblowers to report these allegations of wrongdoing. The audit managers reported these allegations to the regional inspector, Joe Jeck, who was the assistant regional inspector's boss and the top inspections officer in the region for transmittal to Washington. Now, contrary to the rules of conduct, Jeck proposed to the audit managers that they wait until the assistant regional inspector returned from an out-of-town detail to discuss the allegations. The audit managers agreed to wait until he returned. However, Jeck never forwarded the allegations to Washington as required. He chose to handle the matter internally by counseling Santella that his behavior creates, quote, the appearance, end quote, of impropriety. After nearly a year, the audit manager saw that Jeck had taken no effective action against Santella and that Santella's behavior grew worse. In addition to the allegations cited above, Santella appeared to be accepting gratuities from the people he was having non-official tax research done for and engaging in other misconduct. On April 18, 85, Ecola, Kaperniak, and Welly again discussed the situation with Jeck and brought the allegations of misconduct, two of which the subcommittee staff could not investigate due to IRC 6103 restrictions. Now, Jeck realized that the allegations concerning uh, the gratuities was serious, but he again advised against referring the matter to Washington and he suggested instead that he handle the matter locally, noting that Santella was a friend of his and not a crook. Jeck also told the audit managers, quote, you have to remember, Frank has friends, which the audit managers took to mean the regional inspectors in other regions. The next day, the audit managers told Jeck that because he had failed to take actions on the allegations they brought almost a year before, they decided to forward them themselves directly to the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection in Washington in accordance with the rules of conduct. They did this. Headquarters Inspection Branch opened up a conduct investigation. Three headquarters inspectors were assigned to investigate a total of nine allegations of wrongdoing. The report of investigation substantiated the allegations about associating with disreputable persons, directing improper tax research on six different taxpayers, accepting gratuities, untimely debt payment, but did not substantiate four other allegations. On September 27th, the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection decided that although a 21-day suspension was warranted, he would impose a 12-day suspension without pay on Santella for the wrongdoing, which Santella served. Now, even before the investigation was completed and the punishment was imposed, word spread throughout inspection ranks that the three audit managers brought allegations of misconduct against an assistant regional inspector and that a conduct inspection uh, investigation was underway. Almost immediately after bringing the allegations of misconduct, which they were required to do by the IRS rules of conduct, Ecola, Kaperniak, and Welly felt ostracized by management and began to be harassed for their actions. For example, Ecola, Kaperniak, and Welly received at least five phone calls from co-workers around the country warning them of retaliation by regional inspectors for bringing allegations against the wrongdoers. Specifically, the co-workers warned the whistleblowers that Santella has, quote, friends who were regional inspectors in Chicago, Philadelphia, Dallas, and Cincinnati. Ron Kaperniak was in Philadelphia on official business during May 13 to 23, 1985, while the investigation was ongoing. During this trip, the Assistant Regional Inspector for Internal Audit advised him that his career with this inspection was over because he brought the allegations. On the same trip, he was told that the Philadelphia Regional Inspector wanted to talk to him. In an unfriendly tone, the Regional Inspector told Kaperniak that if he had any questions in the future about the propriety of Santella's trips to Philadelphia, he should ask him. On August 8, 85, during an IRS training class in Atlanta, the Dallas Regional Inspector, who was on temporary detail to the North Atlantic region, entered the classroom and noticed Ecola, Kaperniak, and Welly sitting in the rear of the room. Referring to the whistleblowers, the Regional Inspector said in a loud voice, in the North Atlantic region, they know how to deal with those whores in the back. Shortly after, he walked toward the whistleblowers and twice said, the organization will get you, you whores. Moments before this confrontation, the Philadelphia Regional Inspector had left the room with his audit manager. The witnesses told us it appeared that the in incident had been planned beforehand. Now, two audit managers from the Western Region had lunch with Ecola, Kaperniak, and Welly while they were attending this training class. Upon their return to San Francisco, the Regional Inspector criticized them for having dined with the whistleblowers. The assistant commissioner later confronted 
Commissioner for Inspection, later confronted the Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and Dallas regional inspectors on a possible conspiracy to harass and retaliate against the three whistleblowers. The Cincinnati and Philadelphia regional inspectors denied that any conspiracy existed, and they denied making any threatening remarks. He pursued the matter no further with them. The Dallas regional inspector admitted to making the threatening remarks to the whistleblowers, the horror statement, and apologized to the assistant commissioner. The Dallas regional inspector told us he did not apologize to the whistleblowers for his remarks, nor was he asked to. The assistant commissioner told the treasury inspector general that he administered a, quote, oral admonishment, close quote, to the Dallas regional inspector. Now, an oral admonishment is a form of official disciplinary action that is imposed administratively for wrongdoing. The Dallas regional inspector told us he was admonished, but denied that any official administrative action was taken against him. The assistant commissioner also confronted Joe Jeck in August 85 on why he did not forward the allegations of wrongdoing to Washington the year before, as he was required to do by the rules of conduct. Interestingly, the original affidavit prepared by George Ekela in May 85 that alleged Jeck's inaction disappeared in Inspection's national office and was never found. Jeck explained that he didn't think there was enough to the allegations to warrant a referral to Washington. The assistant commissioner told the Treasury IG that he issued an oral admonishment to Jeck for not referring the misconduct allegation. Jeck recalled his discussion with the assistant commissioner, but told us there was no tenor of admonishment and, and that he was not given an official oral admonishment. Less than one month after these discussions with the regional inspectors, senior inspection managers committed another action which we believe is misconduct. I'm going to ask Len to go to the chart and point out the individuals who participated in this. The, the Atlanta regional inspector and his assistant regional inspector for internal audit took up a collection from senior inspection managers in New York, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Dallas, and San Francisco to offset the pay that Santella would lose through his pending suspension. Now, we were able to identify and we interviewed the nine senior inspection managers who contributed to this collection. There were two regional inspectors, which is the highest ethics officer in a region, and, not, and seven assistant regional inspectors. We identified $820 in contributions, which was given to Santella in October 85 at a restaurant in Atlanta during a meeting of the assistant regional inspectors. Now, although this, thank you, Lynn. Although this collection was well known throughout inspection, it was not investigated by the Office of the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection until after a freelance journalist questioned IRS officials about it in May 1988. And at that time, the investigation was done informally. No senior inspection manager who knew about the collection at the time took an action to stop it. And none of the contributors was officially admonished for this collection. Now, I'd like to point out the subcommittee has obtained from GAO's Office of Special Counsel a legal opinion that this collection was a possible violation of 18 U.S.C. 209, which prohibits private parties from contributing to the salary of a public official. At the conclusion of these hearings, the subcommittee will forward this matter to the Department of Justice for its consideration. Uh, Jack told us, after, after this suspension was served, he advised Santella to put the matter behind him. Let's get on with business. But according to Jack, Santella just couldn't let it go. On several occasions, he made disparaging remarks in his office about Ecola Welly and Copernic. The Chicago auditors told us that Santella was seen going from office to office complaining about the, quote, rats and scumbags. He openly told at least one auditor in his region that he would get even with the whistleblowers for bringing the allegations against him. This threat was relayed to Joe Jack, the regional inspector, but nothing was done. In spring of 86, at the same time these threats were being made, Jack and Santella began to plan a reorganization of the region's internal audit function which would have an adverse impact on the whistleblowers. According to these officials, the objective of this reorganization was to improve the managerial span of control and provide better management direction. The reorganization involved transferring one GM-14 audit manager position to the Kansas City Service Center, eliminating the existing GM-14 audit manager for operations position, and establishing a GS-13 staff assistant position. The reorganization plan was drafted by Santella and was revised and approved by Jack. 
At this time, no names were publicly linked to the Kansas City position or to the non-supervisory staff assistant position. However, in as early as April 1986, Santella had discussed with an internal auditor in the region abolishing Welly's audit manager position and transferring Eccola to Kansas City. Now at this point, it's important to note that there was no compelling reason for this reorganization and that the Chicago region is the only one to propose such a reorganization. Other regions do not require their audit managers who have responsibility for service center work to relocate to the site. Other regions of similar size and with similar responsibilities did not consider downgrading their audit manager for operations. And in fact, the director for internal audit verified that other regions would not have to do this before he recommended his approval of this plan. We asked several assistant regional inspectors whether they would likely give up a GM-14 position in such a matter. These officials told us that rather than voluntarily giving up positions, they always fight for more positions. None would have been willing to organize their regions in such a manner as to lose GM-14 audit manager's positions. One regional inspector told us when he first heard of the Chicago reorganization plan, a retaliation motive crossed his mind. Let me skip over in the interest of time and just note that this, the assistant regional commissioner, or the regional, I'm sorry, let me start again. The assistant commissioner for inspection approved the Chicago reorganization plan on November 7th, 1986. Shortly after, Jack and Santella met with the audit managers to discuss how the reorganization would affect them. Welly was told his position was abolished. He was also told that since he had over 25 years of service, he could either retire or be downgraded. Ecola, who was known to be immobile due to medical problems, was told he must transfer to Kansas City or face a downgrade. Koperniak, who was also known to be immobile for personal reasons, was told he could remain in Chicago. When Ecola advised Jeck that he could not legally be required to transfer to Kansas City, he suggested that they transfer Welly because Welly had expressed an interest in going to Kansas City. But instead, Jeck said he must transfer Koperniak and Koperniak must transfer or face a downgrade. Koperniak did not relocate. He was downgraded, and the position was advertised and filled by an individual from outside the region. Now, at the same time they were downgrading these whistleblowers, Jack and Santella met with the GM-13s, the next level below, in the office, because they were concerned that by eliminating positions, there were going to be fewer promotion opportunities. What they told them was, is we're anticipating staffing increases, which would increase the span of control and would, need, would require us to go in for more GM-14 slots. It would be easy to get approval for more GM-14 positions in the near future, in less than a year. Jack further advised that the first of these positions would be requested in about a year. Now, the pending reorganization with the downgrades and transfers, along with the promised request for additional 14 slots in the near future, brought to their mind the collective, co their collective mind, the threat made by the Dallas Regional Inspector, the organization is going to get you, you whores. Welly filed a formal grievance in February, um, claiming he was uh, removed from management without cause, and he linked the reorganization as a retaliation for his uh, bringing the allegations in 85. Welly said that he had names of individuals who could support this allegation. But he's not going to turn them over to the inspection staff because he distrusted them. It was decided by a meeting with the Treasury Inspector General and uh, the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection to handle these allegations in this way. A Treasury investigator would go out and get the names from Welly of internal auditors who could confirm retaliatory statements by Santella. IRS would then investigate Santella's alleged retaliatory statements and actions. Also, the Treasury Inspector General was to investigate Jeck's failure to promptly report the allegations against Santella. But I'm going to focus the rest of this on the whistleblowers. A Treasury Inspector visited Welly and gave him, Welly gave him the names of seven internal auditors in the Midwest region who could testify on Santella's intent to retaliate. The Treasury Inspector told us twice that he turned the seven names over to the Assistant Director for Internal Security for inspections investigation. 
Inspection opened a conduct investigation on uh, April 24, 87, on alleged retaliatory actions by Santella against the whistleblowers. It's our opinion that this investigation was not designed to thoroughly and comprehensively address the whistleblowers' allegations. The investigation was scoped such that, one, the reorganization was not to be investigated. Two, only Santella's retaliatory comments made during 1985 and actions in that year were to be investigated, nothing after. Three, the IRS inspectors were to interview Jack and Santella, but not the whistleblowers. And four, only three individuals identified by Welly as having knowledge of retaliatory actions by Santella were to be interviewed. The names of the other four individuals with direct knowledge of Santella's retaliatory intentions were not given to the inspectors on the case. Now, one of the witnesses testified that Santella told him he would get even with Welly by making him operations manager, by taking away his staff, by making sure he would never run a nationally coordinated audit, and by never allowing him to act as the assistant regional inspector in his absence. Santella, who was interviewed for this report, denied the, the, making these statements and said, in fact, he did have Welly uh, have had staff assigned to him, did run a nationally coordinated audit, and did act for him in his absence. Jack and Santella both made statements to the inspectors which justified the reorganization, which appeared in the final report of investigation. The investigation cleared Santella of all charges of retaliation. The fact that by reorganizing the office and assigning Welly to a staff manager position, um, that by doing these things, Santella effectively carried out his threats. This was overlooked. As a result of this investigation, the Assistant Commissioner for Inspection said he found no evidence of retaliation against Welly and ruled against his grievance. Welly ap appealed this ruling to the Deputy Commissioner in accordance with IRS procedures. Uh, on July 13th, an independent grievance examiner with no prior knowledge of the individuals or events involved was assigned to review the case. The grievance examiner traveled to Chicago and interviewed the whistleblowers, Jack and Santella, and many others in the office. The grievance report concluded, quote, it's quite evident that retaliation took place and continues to exist. My recommendation is that all retaliation be stopped. Those individuals responsible must be made accountable so that future retaliation does not take place." End quote. The grievance examiner found that Welly lost status by virtue of reassignment to a non-supervisory staff manager position and recommended that IRS restore Welly's GM-14 audit manager position. At this time, the second whistleblower was down, after, after he was downgraded to a non-managerial position, and this gets a little complicated, he filed a grievance because at that time, Jack and Santella told the 13th he was creating new positions. But because the whistleblower was downgraded to a specific type of position, he couldn't apply to be promoted back to his old position. He filed a grievance. Now the long and the short of this was is that the grievance file was forwarded to the senior deputy commissioner on February 1st, senior deputy commissioner being Mike Murphy. About a week later, the senior deputy commissioner met with his staff and expressed his concerns about the potential for bad publicity in the event this situation was made public. He requested information regarding the Merit System Protection Board's Office of Special Counsel process in anticipation of Welly seeking protection under the whistleblower rules and specifically inquired about the possibility of a public hearing of the situation. The senior deputy commissioner then directed his staff to prepare a settlement agreement and to prepare a letter to Welly expressing concern regarding the events that have transpired and an assurance that the new assistant commissioner for inspection would make an inquiry into the matter after he is selected. On February 17, 88, Welly notified IRS manager that he was referring his case to the Office of Special Counsel for their consideration. At this time, he did not know that Mike Murphy feared bad publicity that could result from such an action. One week later, he notified IRS that he had referred the matter to the Office of Senator Paul Simon. After Welly's referrals, an interesting negotiation began. An assistant to the senior deputy commissioner contacted Welly's attorney and proposed settling the grievance by providing Welly with a private office and reimbursing him for his legal fees. However, the reorganization would stay in place. In return for this settlement, Welly had to agree never to dis disclose the settlement, including the reimbursement for his legal fees, and drop his agency grievance 
and his OSC complaint and never disclosed those issues. Welly told us he declined this offer because it would make it appear that management was correct in the office reorganization, and he and the independent grievance examiner believed the reorganization was retaliatory. Welly counterproposed that the grievance be settled in, by IRS reversing the reorganization and restoring his position, removing both Jack and Santella from inspection, and reimbursing his legal fees, which by this time, by the way, had totaled $13,000. IRS declined Welly's counteroffer. In March 88, March 14, 88, the senior deputy commissioner issued his decision, which disagreed with the grievance examiner's conclusion and ruled against Welly. The decision stated that Welly would save pay in his GS-14 as staff assistant position and would be provided an office commensurate with his position. Welly was not satisfied and appealed this decision directly to the IRS commissioner. About a month later, on April 18, 1988, the IRS commissioner appointed a new assistant commissioner for inspection, replacing the individual who retired in December 87. The very next week, the new assistant commissioner flew to Chicago and settled both the Welly and Koperniak grievances as follows. The reorganization was reversed, and Ecola, Koperniak, and Welly were restored to their audit manager positions effective immediately. Jeck was to transfer to Washington to assume the position of Assistant Director of Internal Security, and Santella was to transfer to Washington to assume the position in the internal audit component. IRS agreed to seek reimbursement of the legal fees incurred by Welly in the matter. Welly and Koperniak, the whistleblowers, agreed to this settlement. Now, nearly a year has passed since this matter was settled. Jeck accepted his transfer to Washington and now is the Acting Director for Internal Security in inspection headquarters in Washington, D.C. Santella chose not to transfer and secured employment with another federal agency in Chicago. The matter of reimbursing Welly for his related legal expenses was researched, but was determined that IRS could not reimburse him under the whistleblower provisions because the reorganization did not cause him to lose pay. Consequently, Welly has not received reimbursement for his legal fees, which now total about $20,000 the vast majority of which were expended to fight retaliatory actions. I, uh, I think, just to sum up, I would say that uh, we certainly believe, in our opinion, that this reorganization to, was retaliatory. I think you need to finish your statement at that point. And that uh, it's just disturbing to us that, uh, that this could happen in the very organizational component that is set up to monitor integrity in the organization. I think you did say, Mr. Stanley, in the last paragraph that uh, as of the, the IRS still maintains that the reorganization was made for legitimate reasons and within the bounds of management discretion. Yes. And the reason they, they conclude that is because John Rankin approved it and John Rankin had no retaliatory motive. Um, but John they did, they, did, uh, they did not hold forth to that opinion. They did. They, re they well, uh, for the record, they're saying that the reorganization was not retaliatory and it was done properly. If actions speak louder than words by reversing the reorganization, by seeking Welly's reimbursement, um, it appears that uh, at least by those actions, uh, they wanted to get uh, things back on, on track. Um, has this finished your testimony? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stanna, if um, we, have, we have pretty well handled in detail today eight cases. Um, I will ask both you and Mr. Bernard, if you, if we'd had more time, uh, how much more, uh, how, if, in other words, if the invest, if we had more time for the investigation uh, before this hearing, how many more cases do you think, are there more cases that we could have addressed uh, that would have been of, of equal importance? Let me just preface, uh, Len's got several examples of cases of, uh, where people referred them to us and, and would like to relate them to you. But in our opinion, it's not so much the cases we investigated, although there's serious misconduct here. It's the environment that allowed this to exist that is probably our biggest concern. The fear of retaliation, the inept or inadequate investigations, the, wrong, the wrongdoing that's ignored at the highest levels. These conditions are going to allow this to happen again and again. Um, I want to say again that the vast majority of IRS people are hardworking and conscientious people. However, when you have conditions like this, it's going to happen. 
Mr. Bernard. One last little section here that, that I well, should take no more than three or four minutes. Yeah, briefly go over okay. that. Okay, Mr. Chairman, in addition to the specific cases and situations that we investigated and discussed in great detail here today, there have been dozens of other matters that have been brought to our attention over the last year, which simply have not, which, which we simply have not had the time nor the resources to probe in any depth. Some of the allegations and information appear to be as serious as the cases already presented here today. In all likelihood, these cases would serve to further support the common themes and trends, such as retaliation, and unwillingness to effectively investigate senior management that we found to exist as a result of our work over the last year. What I'm going to do, I've got about 10 or 11 cases here. I'm just going to pick two and just give you a couple of uh, examples just to give a flavor for the other kinds of cases that have been brought to our attention. Widespread charges of nepotism in both the use of one senior position within IRS and in the hiring and promoting of relatives. We have received information alleging that these types of activities have occurred at national office and in, in at least two regional offices. Page 109, a Western Region District Director who, who hired as an examination branch chief a former employee who had previously left the service and opened a private tax practice. The director allowed the branch chief to represent former clients who were being audited by the branch chief subordinates, apparently seeing no conflict of interest or violations of the rules of conduct. When a group manager reported this activity to inspection, inspection contacted the district director, who then labeled the group manager as a troublemaker. We have interviewed dozens of current and former IRS employees from all over the country who have told us there is a widespread mistrust of senior management in IRS. These individuals also explain that there is a general belief that reporting wrongdoing by senior management results in retaliation against those who report the misconduct or cooperate in its investigation. I think the example in the Langone case is a good one. Here is a, there was a person at headquarters in IRS who kept a file on all of Mr. Langone's misconduct, but he never reported to inspection until, some, until somebody else, until the media person went to the inspection assistant commissioner for inspection and said you really should look into this. They then opened an investigation on Mitt Langone. This person goes to his file, he pulls out a file with numerous allegations against Mr. Langone that he had there for months. Why didn't he go himself to inspection? I, I would assume he didn't go because he feared retaliation and ost or ostracism within the organization. There appears to be a long-standing institutional mindset which says protect the image and integrity of IRS at all costs because the image is vital in a voluntary compliance system which relies on taxpayer integrity. I believe the reluctance to investigate or thoroughly investigate the cases we presented today are good examples of this mindset. The mindset, however, does not serve IRS well because it permits misconduct to go unchecked in many instances. When this occurs and the misconduct becomes known outside IRS and is reported to the media, the image of the service is smeared and tarnished. Until actions are taken to assume timely, to assure timely and thorough integrity oversight at IRS, this situation will continue. The number of investigations involving senior officials is not as important as what is not done and the quality of the investigations that are performed. It is going to take some dramatic action to even change the attitude of those who see misconduct by senior officials but are afraid to report it because of the fear of retaliation. These hearings over the next three days will detail some of the cases presented today, as well as present some perspectives on the general attitude that exists among employees and former employees of the service. We obviously cannot al allow every person we have talk talked with about the fear of senior management and retaliation testify, although we have had many volunteers who are so frustrated that they are willing to take the risk. What we will do over the next three days is have a number of individuals with many years of IRS experience and insight share some of their own experiences. And that ends our statement. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, what authority, what authority did the de a senior deputy commissioner have uh, to try and effect a settlement uh, wh which involved uh, paying his legal fees? What, 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 what authority was there for, for that to be done? Well. The payment of legal fees uh, could have happened, might have happened one of two ways. If, if the whistleblower was downgraded 
and thus lost pay in the downgrade, he could seek um, reimbursement through a Title V provision which protects uh, the back pay of whistleblowers. Since uh, Mr. Welly was in a, a save pay situation and was converted from a GM to a GS and thus gained maybe a couple hundred dollars inadvertently uh, as a result of this downgrade, they couldn't go that way. The idea came up uh, along the way that if, if that wasn't going to work, perhaps they could give him a special award of several thousand dollars, which, would, which could be applied to his... Uh, well, I guess the question I'm really asking, is there precedent for this? Uh, is this a common practice within the IRS where there are grievances to settle them in this manner? Or, or is, this, you know, is this a common practice or this is unusual? Well, I don't know how prevalent this practice is, but in reviewing the notes of the people who were involved in this negotiation, it is my impression that this was not the first time that IRS has settled a grievance this way by doing something off the record. Off the record? Well, by not formally uh, of course, I acting think on the grievance. In other words, you drop your grievance, we'll settle this way. In other words, Mr. Uh, Welly, who I understand will be here tomorrow. Yes, he will will testify the fact is that he was encouraged or advised by the senior deputy commissioner to keep this quiet? Well, I, th I would characterize it this way, that uh, in conversations with people in the deputy senior commissioner's office, senior deputy commissioner's office, it became known to those people that Stan Welly was $13,000 in the hole in legal fees and that this could be a wedge to get him to uh, settle his grievance. So they proposed this to him. But in return for this, you say in your statement, in return for this settlement, Welly had to agree to never disclose the settlement. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Do I discern that that's somewhat improper? Why should he want to do that? Wouldn't that be fed to government funds? Uh, I'm not sure if that would be a violation of, uh, of, of a statute in that regard. I, it seems that what they wanted to do here is to uh, offer to pay his legal fees somehow if he would offer not to disclose the terms or to even publicize his grievance. Well, I, I would say under the proper rules of disclosure today, uh, not only under which the IRS should perform, but under which you and me, Mr. Hassett, have to perform, that, that asking that that not be disclosed is somewhat uh, extreme. Well, you might want to ask I will, the we'll commissioner that. about that settlement. Mr. Hassler, do you have further questions? I have no further questions today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, gentlemen, uh, we appreciate your, uh, your efforts in this regard. Um, it's been a long day, and we've got a long two other days. Uh, in my opinion, you've done a good job with this inv information and this investigation. And I think I would, I'm saying that uh, correctly that the next uh, two days, that is, we will be going by and corroborating uh, with witnesses uh, what your testimony has brought us today uh, so that we will or not cannot be accused that we're just making wild uh, unconfirmed uh, accusations and that testimony tomorrow will step will substantiate that uh, to, a, to a further degree well with that the uh, subcommittee is adjourned thank you mr. chair uh, we, uh, before you adjourn, let me say we will convene tomorrow morning in room 2154, the main government ops room, and we will have uh, three panels, four panels tomorrow that will bring testimony. That concludes Tuesday's hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs. For more information, you may contact that panel at B377 Rayburn House Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. And coming up in just a moment on C-SPAN, a brief White House news conference on the federal budget. Good morning from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN. We'd like to pause here for a moment to give you our program schedule for the rest of the evening, but first we'd like to remind